Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, a production of catholicculture.org and under the patronage of St. John Henry Newman. Today's reading, De Doctrina Christiana, by St. Augustine of Hippo, translated by John J. Gavigan, O.S.A., narrated by James T. Majewski. There are several norms for expounding Scripture. These, I am convinced, can be profitably presented to those devoted to the study of this subject so that they may benefit, not only by acquiring knowledge from others who have unveiled the mysteries of sacred writings, but by disclosing these mysteries to others themselves. I am undertaking to transmit these principles to those who are able and willing to grasp them, if only God our Lord will not refuse to supply me as I write with the same help which he usually grants me when I reflect upon this matter. Before I begin this, I think that I should reply to those who will censure these principles, or who would do so if I did not pacify them first. But if some, even after this, find fault, at least they will not influence others whom they could influence unless they were previously fortified and equipped, nor will they entice them from beneficial study to the indolence of ignorance. Some will censure my work because they have failed to comprehend those principles of which I shall treat. Others, when they have desired to employ the principles which they have learned and have endeavored to explain the sacred scriptures according to these principles, but have failed to disclose and elucidate what they want, will think that I have labored uselessly. And because they themselves have not been aided by this work, will think that no one could profit from it. The third category of critics comprises those who either actually interpret Scripture well or seem to in their own estimation. These observe, or think they observe, that they have gained the ability to explain sacred writings, although they have studied none of the regulations of the sort that I have now determined to recommend. Accordingly, they will protest that those principles are essential to no one, but that whatever is convincingly revealed about the obscurities of those writings could be achieved more effectively by divine assistance alone. Briefly answering all those who do not comprehend the matters about which I am writing, I make this statement. I should not be criticized because they do not understand, just as they should not become enraged at me if, wishing to see the waning moon, the new moon, or some barely distinguishable star which I was indicating with my finger, they did not have sufficiently keen vision to see even my finger. In fact, those who cannot discern the obscure points of sacred scripture even after studying and learning these rules would believe that they could indeed see my finger, but could not see the stars which it was extended to indicate. Consequently, these two groups ought to refrain from criticizing me and beg that vision be granted them from heaven. For if I can lift my finger to indicate something, I cannot on the other hand illumine the eyes of individuals to see either my act of indicating or that subject to which I am anxious to direct attention. However, there are some who boast about the grace of God and pride themselves upon the fact that they appreciate and are able to interpret sacred scripture without rules, such as I have undertaken to propose. And for that reason, they consider unnecessary what I have planned to write. These persons should moderate their anxiety so that, although they may well be glad for the wonderful grace of God, they may still keep in mind that they have learned these matters through men or books. They should not be despised by Anthony, the saintly Egyptian hermit, simply because he, without any knowledge of reading, is said to have memorized the sacred scripture by merely hearing it and to have penetrated its meaning by profound reflection. Nor should they be scorned by that foreign Christian slave about whom we learned not long ago from very eminent and reliable persons. Although no one taught him how to read, he acquired proficiency by praying that the secrets might be disclosed to him. After three days' prayer, he received the answer to his petition, with the result that he astounded the spectators by reading at sight the book they handed him. If anyone believe that these accounts are false, I am not going to argue violently about it. Certainly, since my case deals with Christians who rejoice that they understand sacred scripture without human instruction, and, if this is so, they rejoice in a true and by no means insignificant blessing. 
They must concede that any one of us has learned his own language simply from hearing it habitually from childhood, and that we have acquired a knowledge of any other language, Greek, Hebrew, or any of the others similarly, either by hearing them or by some other person's instruction. Now then, are we to admonish all our brethren not to train their children in these subjects, since in a single instant the apostles, filled with grace by the coming of the Holy Ghost, spoke in the tongues of all peoples? Or are we to admonish anyone who has not enjoyed such privileges to think that he is not a Christian, or to doubt that he has received the Holy Ghost? On the contrary, let whatever should be acquired through human means be acquired humbly, and let anyone who is instructing another pass on to him whatever he has received, without haughtiness or grudging. Let us not tempt him whom we have believed, lest, deceived by such cunning of the devil and by our own stubbornness, we may even decline to go to church, to listen to the gospel itself or to learn about it, or to refuse to read a book, or to pay attention to a reader or a preacher. But expect, as the apostle says, to be caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, and there hear secret words that man may not repeat, or there see the Lord Jesus Christ and learn the gospel from him rather than from men. We should guard against such presumptuous and perilous snares. Instead, we should reflect that the Apostle Paul himself, even though he was thrown to the ground and instructed by the divine voice from heaven, was nevertheless sent to a human being to receive the sacraments and be united to the church. We should also consider that the centurion Cornelius, though an angel informed him that his prayers had been heard and his alms regarded with approval, was still sent to Peter to be guided and not only to receive from him the sacraments, but also to learn what he was to believe in, hope for, and love. All these things might well have been accomplished by an angel, but human nature would have been lowered in dignity if God had seemed unwilling to transmit his word to men through human means. Indeed, how would there be truth in the statement, For holy is the temple of God, and this temple you are. If God did not grant replies from a human temple, but announced from heaven through angels all the learning which he desired to have imparted to men, then charity itself, which unites men to one another with the bond of unity, would have no way of joining and almost fusing souls with each other if men learned nothing from other men. Again, the apostle did not send to an angel the eunuch who failed to comprehend what he read in the prophet Isaiah. What he did not understand was not taught him by an angel, nor was it revealed to him by divine inspiration. He sat with him and explained in human terms and language what had been veiled in that passage of Scripture. God spoke to Moses, did he not? Yet Moses, very prudently and humbly, yielded to the advice of his father-in-law, foreigner though he was, with regard to governing and directing such a mighty nation. For he realized that, from whatever intellect right counsel proceeded, it should be attributed not to him who conceived it, but to him who is the truth, the immutable God. Finally, whoever glories in understanding by the grace of God whatever things are obscure in the scriptures, although he has not been guided by any principles, believes correctly indeed, and it is true, that that ability is not his own as if it came into existence from him, but it was committed to him from heaven. For thus he seeks the glory of God and not his own. But when he reads and understands without anyone's explanation, why does he try to explain to others? Instead, why does he not send them to God so that they also may understand not through human agency but by his teaching within their souls. Of course, he is afraid that he may hear from the Lord. Wicked servant, thou shouldst have entrusted my money to the bankers. Therefore, just as these individuals instruct others either orally or by their writings in matters they understand, I certainly should not be criticized by them if I too teach not only the points which they understand, but also the principles they observe in order to come to an understanding. Nevertheless, no one should consider anything his own, except, perhaps, falsehood, since all truth comes from him who has said, I am the truth. For what have we that we have not received? 
But if we have received it, why do we boast as if we had not received it? He who reads written matter to listeners pronounces what he understands. But he who teaches reading does so that others will also learn how to read. Yet both transmit what they have been taught. So also he who explains to his hearers the thoughts which he understands in sacred scripture acts like one who in the office of reader pronounces the words which he understands. On the other hand, he who teaches how to understand is like a person teaching reading. It is his task to teach reading in such a way that the man who knows how to read has no need of another reader when he comes upon a book to tell him what is written in it. Similarly, the person who has accepted the principles which we are trying to propose when he comes upon any obscurity in books, observes certain rules, as he did in reading, and does not require another person as interpreter to lay open for him whatever is obscure. Rather, by following certain instructions, he may arrive at the hidden meaning himself, without any false step, or at least will not fall into the foolishness of misguided thought. Therefore, Although it may be clear enough in this work itself that no one can in justice criticize this undertaking of mine which is intended to be useful, nevertheless, it seemed fitting to answer any objectors in a preface such as this. This, then, presented itself to me as the starting point of the course I propose to follow in this book. Chapter 1 The entire treatment of the scriptures is based upon two factors the method of discovering what we are to understand, and the method of teaching what has been understood. I shall discuss first the method of discovery, and then the method of teaching. This is a worthy and laborious task, and, though it should prove hard to accomplish, I fear that I am rash enough to undertake it. Indeed I should be, if I were relying solely upon myself. However, Since all my confidence of finishing this work depends upon him from whom I have already received much inspiration through meditation, I need not fear that he will cease to grant me further inspiration when I shall have begun to employ that which he has already granted. Everything which is not exhausted by being given away is not yet owned as it ought to be, so long as we hold on to it and do not give it away. For he has said, He that hath to him shall be given. Therefore, he will give to those who already have. That is, he will increase and heap up what he has given when they dispense with generosity what they have received. There were five loaves of bread, and on another occasion seven loaves, before they were distributed to the hungry multitude. Afterwards, although the hunger of so many thousands was satisfied, They filled baskets and baskets. And so, just as that bread increased after it was broken, the Lord has now granted me the thoughts which are necessary for beginning this work, and they will be increased by His inspiration when I have begun to dispense them. As a result, I shall not only suffer no poverty of thought in this ministry of mine, but shall even exult in a remarkable abundance of ideas. Chapter 2 All teaching is concerned with either things or signs. But things are learned by means of signs. I have defined a thing, in the accurate sense of the word, as that which is not used to signify something. For example, wood, stone, animal, or others of this kind. But I do not include that tree which we read that Moses cast into bitter waters to take away their bitterness, nor that stone which Jacob placed under his head nor that ram which Abraham sacrificed instead of his son. These are indeed things, but they are also symbols of other things. There are other signs whose whole usefulness consists in signifying. Words belong to this class, for no one uses words except to signify something. From this is understood what I designate as signs, namely, those things which are employed to signify something. Therefore, every sign is also a thing. For whatever is not a thing is absolutely nothing. But not every thing is also a sign. 
So in this division of things and signs, when I speak of things, I shall do so in such a way that, although some of them can be used to signify, they will not disturb the division according to which I am treating first of things and then of signs. We must keep in mind, in regard to things, that the point to be considered now is what they are, not what other thing aside from themselves they signify. Chapter 3 There are then some things which are to be enjoyed, others which are to be used, others which are enjoyed and used. Those which are to be enjoyed make us happy. Those which are to be used help us as we strive for happiness, and, in a certain sense, sustain us, so that we are able to arrive at and cling to those things which make us happy. But if we who enjoy and use things, living as we do in the midst of both classes of things, strive to enjoy the things which we are supposed to use, we find our progress impeded, and even now and then turned aside. As a result, Fettered by affection for lesser goods, we are either retarded from gaining those things which we are to enjoy, or we are even drawn away entirely from them. Chapter 4 To enjoy anything means to cling to it with affection for its own sake. To use a thing is to employ what we have received for our use to obtain what we want, provided that it is right for us to want it. An unlawfully applied use ought rather to be termed an abuse. Suppose, then, we were travelers in a foreign land, who could not live in contentment except in our own native country, and if, unhappy because of that traveling abroad, and desirous of ending our wretchedness, we planned to return home, it would be necessary to use some means of transportation, either by land or sea, to enable us to reach the land we were to enjoy. But if the pleasantness of the journey and the very movement of the vehicles were to delight us and turn us aside to enjoy the things which we ought instead merely to use, and were to confuse us by false pleasure, we would be unwilling to end our journey quickly, and would be alienated from the land whose pleasantness would make us really happy. Just so, wanderers from God on the road of this mortal life, if we wish to return to our native country where we can be happy, We must use this world and not enjoy it, so that the invisible attributes of God may be clearly seen, being understood through the things that are made. That is, that through what is corporeal and temporal, we may comprehend the eternal and spiritual. Chapter 5 The proper object of our enjoyment, therefore, is the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost the same who are the Trinity, one supreme being, accessible to all who enjoy him, if indeed he is a thing and not rather the cause of all things, or perhaps both thing and cause. It is not easy to find a term which appropriately defines such great excellence, unless it is better to say that this Trinity is one God from whom, through whom, and in whom all things exist. Thus there are Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Each of these three individually is God. At the same time, they are all one God. Each of them individually comprises the fullness of divine substance. At the same time, they are all only one substance. The Father is neither the Son nor the Holy Ghost. The Son is neither the Father nor the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is neither the Father nor the Son. The Father is only the Father, the Son only the Son, the Holy Ghost only the Holy Ghost. All three have the same eternity, the same immutability, the same majesty, the same power. In the Father resides unity, in the Son equality, and in the Holy Ghost the perfect union of unity and equality. These three qualities are all one because of the Father, all equal because of the Son, and all united because of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 6 Have I spoken or given utterance to anything worthy of God? On the contrary, I realize that I have done nothing but wish to speak. 
but if I have spoken anything, it is not what I wanted to say. How am I aware of this unless God is ineffable? What I have said would not have been said if it had been ineffable. For this reason, God should not be spoken of even as ineffable, because when we say this word, we are saying something about him. There is some contradiction of terms, since, if that is ineffable which cannot be spoken of, a thing is not ineffable which can be called ineffable. We should guard against this contradiction of terms by silence, rather than attempt to reconcile them by discussion. Yet God, although we can say nothing worthy of Him, has accepted the tribute of our human voice and has wished us to rejoice in His praise in our own language. This is the reason why He is called Deus. In reality, He is not recognized in the sound of those two syllables, but He causes all those who share the Latin language when this sound reaches their ears to ponder over His most excellent and immortal nature. Chapter 7 When the one God of gods is thought of, even by those who believe in, invoke, and worship other gods, whether in heaven or on earth, he is considered in such a way that the very thought tries to conceive a nature which is more excellent and more sublime than all others. Men are indeed influenced by diverse goods, some by those which are concerned with the senses of the body, others by those which affect the intellectual quality of the mind. Consequently, those who have surrendered to the bodily senses think that the sky, or what they see so radiant in the sky, or the world itself is the god of gods. Or if they attempt to go beyond the world, they visualize something luminous and conceive it as infinite, or of that shape which seems most pleasing in their vague imagining. Or they think of it in the form of the human body, if they prefer that to other things. However, if they do not think there is one god of gods, but rather many or innumerable gods of equal rank, they still attribute to each one the form of body that seems most excellent in their own minds. Those who by means of their intellect strive to visualize what God is, place him above not only all visible and corporeal natures, but even all intellectual and spiritual natures, above all changeable things. All men engage in contest over the excellence of God and no one can be found to believe a being is God if there is any being more excellent. Hence, all men agree that he is God whom they esteem above all other things. Chapter 8 Since all who reflect upon God think of a living being, only those who think of him as life itself can form an opinion of God that is not unworthy and absurd. Whatever bodily shape presents itself to their minds, they determine that it is life which makes it animate or inanimate, and esteem the animate above the inanimate. They realize that the living body itself, however resplendent it may be with brilliance, remarkable in size, or distinguished by its beauty, is one thing, while the life by which it is animated is another. Moreover, because of its incomparable dignity, they esteem that life above the mass which is nourished and animated by it. Then they strive to look upon life itself. If they find it to be vegetative life without feeling, such as trees have, they prefer a sentient life to it, for example that of cattle. And in turn, to this latter they prefer intelligent life, such as that of man. When they have seen that even this life is still changeable, they are compelled to prefer something unchangeable to it. That very life, in fact, which is not sometimes foolish and at other times wise, but is, rather, wisdom itself. For a wise mind, that is, one that has attained wisdom, was not wise before it attained it. But wisdom itself was never unwise, nor can it ever be. If men did not perceive this, they would not, with the utmost trust, esteem an unchangeably wise life above a changeable one. Indeed, they see that the very rule of truth according to which they claim the unchangeable life is better is itself unchangeable. 
They do not perceive this rule anywhere except beyond their own nature, since they perceive that they are changeable beings. Chapter 9 No one is so shamelessly foolish as to say, How do you know that an unchangeably wise life should be preferred to a changeable one? For the very point that he is inquiring about, how I know, is universally and unchangeably evident for all to see. He who does not see this is just like a blind man in the sunlight who derives no benefit at all, even though the brightness of the light, so clear and so close at hand, pours into the very sockets of his eyes. But he who sees the light of truth and flees from it is one who has caused the keenness of his mind to become dulled through association with carnal shadows. So then, men are driven back from their native country by the contrary breezes of bad habits, as it were, and eagerly seek after inferior and less estimable things than the one which they acknowledge is better and more excellent. Chapter 10 Since we are to enjoy to the full that truth which lives without change, and since in that truth God the Trinity the author and founder of the universe, takes counsel for the things which he has created, the mind must be cleansed in order that it may be able to look upon that light and cling to it when it has seen it. Let us consider this cleansing as a sort of traveling or sailing to our own country. We are not brought any closer to him who is everywhere present by moving from place to place, but by a holy desire and lofty morals. Chapter 11 We would not be able to do this unless wisdom himself deigned to share even such great weakness as ours and show us the way to live according to human nature, since we ourselves are human. But because we act wisely when we come to him, he was thought by proud men to have acted foolishly when he came to us. When we come to him, we grow stronger. He was regarded as weak when he came to us. But the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Therefore, although he himself is our native land, he made himself also the way to that native land. Chapter 12 Whereas he is everywhere present to the healthy and pure interior eye, he deigned to appear even to the fleshly eyes of those who have weak and unclean vision. Since, in God's wisdom, the world could not know God by wisdom, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. Therefore, he is said to have come to us not by traveling through space, but by appearing to mortals in human flesh. He came then to that place where he already was, because he was in the world and the world was made by him. But because of their eagerness to enjoy the creature in place of the Creator, men have been conformed to this world, and have been fittingly called the world. Consequently, they did not know wisdom, and therefore the evangelist said, The world knew him not. And so in God's wisdom, the world could not know God by wisdom. Why then did he come, since he was really here, except that it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe? Chapter 13 How did he come, except that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us? Just as in speaking, in order that what we have in our mind may penetrate to the mind of our listener through his ears of flesh, the word which we carry in our heart becomes a sound and is called speech. Nevertheless, our thought is not changed to the same sound. Remaining entire in itself, it takes on the nature of speech, by means of which it may penetrate his ears. Yet it does not incur any deterioration in the change. Just so, the word of God although unchanged, was made flesh in order that he might dwell among us. Chapter 14 Just as medical care is the road to bodily health, so this care has received sinners to heal them and make them strong again. 
and as physicians bind up wounds in an orderly and skillful manner, so that even a certain beauty may join the usefulness of the bandage, so the medicine of wisdom, by assuming humanity, accommodated himself to our wounds, healing some by opposite remedies, and others by like remedies. A physician, in treating an injury to the body, applies certain opposites, as cold to hot, wet to dry. In other cases he applies like remedies, as a round bandage to a circular wound, or an oblong bandage to an oblong wound, not using the same bandage for every limb, but adapting like to like. Likewise, the wisdom of God in healing humanity has employed himself to cure it, since he is both the physician and the medicine. Therefore, because man fell through pride, he has applied humility to cure him. We were deceived by the wisdom of the serpent, but we are freed by the foolishness of God. Furthermore, just as that which was called wisdom was really foolishness in the case of those who despised God, so that which is called foolishness is wisdom for those who vanquish the devil. We abused our immortality, and as a result, died. Christ used his mortality well, and so we live. The disorder began in the corrupted soul of a woman. Salvation came from the untainted body of a woman. There is another example of the use of opposites in the fact that our vices are cured by the example of his virtues. But it was as if he were applying like bandages to our limbs and wounds when, as a man born of a woman, he saved men deceived by a woman. As a mortal, he rescued mortals. By his death he freed the dead. Instruction will unfold many other uses of contrary and like remedies in Christian medicine to those who ponder them more carefully and are not hurried away by the necessity of completing a task they have undertaken. Chapter 15 Indeed, our belief in the resurrection of our Lord from the dead and his ascension into heaven sustains our faith with great hope. For this belief shows us forcibly how willingly he who had the power to take it up again laid down his life for us. What great confidence, then, inspires the hope of the faithful when they consider what great things he who is so great suffered for men who were not yet believers. When he is expected from heaven as the judge of the living and the dead, he strikes great fear into the negligent, with the result that they devote themselves to earnest effort and long for him by leading a saintly life, instead of dreading his coming because of their wicked lives. What words can tell, or what thought can conceive, the reward which he will give at the last day, when he already has given so great a measure of his spirit for our consolation in this journey, in order that, in the midst of the adversities of this life, we may have such great trust in him and love of him whom we do not yet see? Moreover, he has granted to each of us the special graces requisite for the upbuilding of his church, so that we will do what he has indicated should be done, not only without complaint, but even with joy. Chapter 16 For the church is his body, and is also spoken of as his spouse, as apostolic teaching shows us. Therefore, he consolidates his body although it is composed of many members which do not have the same functions, by the bond of unity and charity, its health, so to speak. In addition, he disciplines it now and cleanses it with certain afflictions which act as medicines, so that when it has been drawn forth from this world to eternity, he may join to himself as his spouse, the church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Chapter 17 Besides, we are on a road which is concerned not so much with the traversing of space as with the affections of the heart, a road which was shut off by the malice of our past sins as if by a thorny edge. Then what more generous or more merciful thing could he do who was willing to abase himself for us as the way by which we might return to him then forgive us all our sins after we had transformed our lives, and by being crucified for us, blot out the severely enjoined decrees against our return to him. 
Chapter 18 Therefore he granted these keys to his church, so that whatever it might loose upon earth would be loosed in heaven, and whatever it might bind on earth would be bound also in heaven. That is to say, whoever in his church did not believe that his sins were forgiven him, they were not forgiven. But whoever believed and turned aside from them by repentance, having placed himself in the bosom of the church, would be healed by the same faith and repentance. Whoever does not believe that his sins can be forgiven him becomes worse by his despair when he doubts the fruit of his conversion, as if there remained nothing better to him than to be sinful. Chapter 19 Just as there is a certain death of the soul, a forsaking of one's former life and habits, which comes about through repentance, so the death of the body is also a releasing of the principle that previously animated it. Further, as the soul, after repentance, by which it destroys its former evil habits, is changed for the better, so after that death which we all owe because of the bond of sin, we must believe and hope that the body will be entirely changed for the better at the time of the resurrection. For it cannot happen that flesh and blood can obtain any part in the kingdom of God. But this corruptible body must put on incorruption, and this mortal body must put on immortality. The body will not cause any annoyance, because it will not suffer any want. It will be animated by a happy and perfected spirit in complete peace. Chapter 20 but the soul of one who does not die to this world and begin to be fashioned according to the image of truth is drawn by the death of the body into a more serious death and will be restored to life not in order to change to a heavenly home but to undergo punishment. Chapter 21 Faith maintains this principle and we must believe it. Neither the soul nor the human body suffers complete annihilation. The wicked arise again for punishment beyond imagination, while the good rise again for everlasting life. Chapter 22 Consequently, in all these things the only ones which are to be enjoyed are those which we have mentioned as eternal and unchangeable. The other things are to be used, that we may be able to arrive at a complete enjoyment of the former. We who enjoy and use other things are things ourselves. Man is a noble being, created to the image and likeness of God, not in so far as he is housed in a mortal body, but in that he is superior to brute beasts because of the gift of a rational soul. Hence the great question is whether men ought to enjoy themselves or merely use themselves or whether they may do both. We have been commanded to love one another, but the question is whether man is to be loved by man for his own sake or for another reason. If he is loved for his own sake, we are enjoying him. If he is loved for another reason, we are using him. But it seems to me that he should be loved for another reason. For if a thing is to be loved for itself, we find in it the happiness of life, the hope of which consoles us in the present time, although we do not yet possess the reality. Yet cursed is the man who places his hope in man. No one ought to enjoy himself, if you observe clearly, because he should not love himself for his own sake, but because of him whom we ought to enjoy. For man is most excellent at that time when his whole life tends toward the unchangeable life and clings to him with all its affection. However, if he loves himself for his own sake, he does not refer himself to God. But since he has turned to himself, he is not turned toward something unchangeable. On that account, he does not enjoy himself perfectly because he is better when he clings entirely and is bound to the unchangeable good than when he is inclined from it even toward himself. Therefore. If you ought to love yourself, not for your own sake, but on account of him who is the most fitting object of your love, no other man should be angered if you love him also for the sake of God. 
This has been divinely ordained as the rule of love. For he said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, but God, with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with thy whole mind. Consequently, you direct all your thoughts, your whole life, and all your intellect to him from whom you have these very things which you devote to him. When he said, with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with thy whole mind, he left no part of our life which could be empty and, as it were, give place to the desire to enjoy any other thing. Whatever else comes to our attention to be loved is to be carried along to that place to which the whole torrent of our love rushes. Thus, whoever loves his neighbor rightly ought to stress this point with him, so that he too may love God with his whole heart, his whole soul, and his whole mind. For thus, loving him as himself, he refers all the love of himself and the other to that love of God which suffers no trickle to be let off from itself, by whose diversion its own volume might be lessened. Chapter 23 We are not to love everything which we are to use, but only those things which, either by a certain association with us are accountable to God, as a man or an angel, or which, related to us, require the grace of God through us, as our body. For assuredly, the martyrs did not love the wickedness of those who persecuted them, yet they used it to win God. There are, then, four kinds of things to be loved. First, that which is above us. Second, ourselves. Third, that which is equal to us. Fourth, that which is below us. Concerning the second and fourth, no rules have to be given. For however far a man errs from the truth, there remains in him a love of himself and of his own body. For his soul, fleeing from the unchangeable light, the sovereign of all things, does this in order that it may control itself and its own body. Hence it cannot do anything else except love itself and its own body. Moreover, it thinks it has gained something important if it is able to rule over its fellows also, that is, over other human beings. For it is characteristic of a depraved mind to seek after and claim as its due what is owed properly to God alone. Such love of oneself is better termed hatred. For it is unjust to wish what is below oneself to serve one when one refuses to serve a superior being. And it has been truly said, he that loveth iniquity hateth his own soul. Likewise, the soul becomes weak and is tortured by the mortal body. It loves that mortal body by necessity and is weighed down by its corruption. For immortality and incorruption of the body result from the health of the soul. But the health of the soul consists in cleaving very tenaciously to something better, that is, to the unchangeable God. But when it exerts itself to rule even over those who are naturally on a level with it, that is, even its fellow men, its pride is utterly intolerable. Chapter 24 Consequently, no one hates himself. There has never been any dispute on this point with any sect. Neither does anyone hate his own body. For what the Apostle said is true. No one ever hated his own flesh. Some are entirely deceived because they say that they would rather be without bodies altogether. They do not hate their own body, but rather its corruptions and its weight. So they do not wish to be without a body, but to have an incorrupt and agile body. They think that it is not a body which is incorrupt and agile, because they think something of that sort is a spirit. But even if some seem to persecute their bodies by restraint and labor, those who do this according to reason are striving not to rid themselves of their bodies, but rather to possess them, subjected to reason and ready for all necessary work. They are striving, by a certain laborious warfare on the part of the body itself, to quench those passions which have a bad effect upon the body, that is, those habits and inclinations of the soul which bend it toward the enjoyment of lesser goods. They are not destroying themselves, but are taking care of their own good health. 
But those who do this in the wrong may make war upon their bodies as if they were natural enemies. They are deceived in their understanding of this passage. The flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other. The Apostle said this because of the unsubdued sensual appetite against which the spirit strives, not to destroy the body, but, by thoroughly mastering its concupiscence and its perverse inclinations, to make it subject to the spirit, as the natural order demands. Since after the resurrection the body is to live immortally in perfect peace, completely subject to the spirit, so also in this life we must keep in mind that the carnal appetite is to be changed for the better, and is not to resist the spirit with its inordinate inclinations. Until this is accomplished, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. The spirit does not struggle because of hatred, but for dominion, because it desires that what it loves should be subjugated to something better. The flesh does not resist because of hatred, but because of the bond of habit which has descended to it from its progenitors and has grown deeply rooted by the law of nature. In subduing the flesh, the spirit strives to dissolve the disordered agreements of bad habits and to establish the peace of good ones. Yet not even those who, misled by a false belief, detest their own bodies, would be prepared to lose one eye, even without feeling any pain, and even if just as much sense of sight would remain in the one as there was before in both, unless something which had to be given precedence should compel it. By this example, and also by similar instances, it is satisfactorily pointed out to those who seek the truth with unbiased minds how true was that statement of the Apostle in which he declares, For no one ever hated his own flesh. And he also added, On the contrary, he nourishes and cherishes it, as Christ also does the Church. Chapter 25 Man must be instructed, therefore, about the manner of loving, that is, how he should love himself, so that he may help himself. To doubt that he loves himself and is desirous of doing good to himself is folly. Yet he must be instructed how to love his body, in order that he may take care of it reasonably and wisely. It is an incontestable fact that a man loves his own body and is anxious to preserve it well and unimpaired. Yet a man can love something more than the health and soundness of his own body. Many have been known to undergo suffering, and even loss of some of their limbs, willingly, in order to secure other things which they loved better. It should not be said that a person does not love the health and well-being of his own body, simply because he loves something else more. Even the miser, although he loves money, buys himself bread. When he does this, he gives away the money which he loves so much and wishes to amass, but he does so because he puts a higher value upon the health of his body, which the bread sustains. It is unnecessary to discuss at greater length a matter that is so obvious, yet very often the errors of the wicked compel us to do this. Chapter 26 there is, then, no necessity for commanding us to love ourselves and our own bodies, because we love what we are and also what is below us yet belongs to us by an indisturbed law of nature, which extends even to brute beasts. For even animals love themselves and their own bodies. It remained only to impose commandments upon us concerning God who is above us and our neighbor who is beside us. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, he said, with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with thy whole mind, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now the purpose of this charge is charity, a twofold love of God and our neighbor. But if you consider yourself in your entirety, your soul and body, and your neighbor in his entirety, his soul and body, for man is composed of soul and body. No class of objects to be loved has been omitted in these two commandments. 
Since the love of God has precedence, and since the measure of that love has been so defined that all the others are to fuse in him, it seems that no mention has been made about our love of ourselves. But when it is said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, at once it is clear that our love of ourselves has not been overlooked. Chapter 27 Now he lives a just and holy life who appraises things with an unprejudiced mind. He is a person who has a well-regulated love, and neither loves what he ought not, nor fails to love what he should. He does not love more an object deserving only of lesser love, nor love equally what he should love either more or less, nor love either more or less what he should love equally. Every sinner, insofar as he is a sinner, should not be loved, and every man, insofar as he is a man, should be loved for the sake of God. But God is to be loved for his own sake. And if God is to be loved more than any man, each one ought to love God more than himself. Thus, another man should be loved more than our own bodies, because all those things are to be loved for the sake of God. Another man can enjoy God with us, whereas our bodies cannot because the body lives through the soul by which we enjoy God. Chapter 28 Everyone must be loved equally, but when you cannot be of assistance to all, you must above all have regard for those who are bound to you more closely by some accident, as it were, of location, circumstances, or occasions of any kind. For instance, Suppose you had an abundance of something which you felt obliged to give to someone who did not have it, and were not able to give it to two persons. If two people came to you, neither of whom held precedence over the other, either because of want or any relationship to you, you could do nothing more just than decide by lot to which one you should give what you were unable to give to both. So in the case of your fellow men, since you cannot take care of all of them, you must decide by lot in proportion as each one can claim a closer connection with you at that time. Chapter 29 Of all who can enjoy God with us, we love some whom we help, some by whom we are helped, some whose assistance we stand in need of and whose wants we relieve, some on whom we neither bestow any benefit nor expect that they should bestow any upon us. Nevertheless, we ought to desire that they all love God with us, and all the assistance which we either give them or receive from them must be directed toward that one purpose. In the theaters, places of wickedness, if a man has a fondness for some actor and enjoys his acting as a great or even as the greatest good, he likes all who share this fondness with him, not on their own account, but because of the one whom they like in common. The more ardent he is in his own affection for that actor, the more he strives in every possible way to have more people like him, and is all the more anxious to show him off to more people. When he sees anyone somewhat unenthusiastic, he stirs him up as much as he can by his praise of the actor. If he chances upon someone who opposes him, he is greatly vexed at his dislike for the object of his affections, and strives in every way he can to remove the feeling. How should we act who are united by the love of God, the enjoyment of whom constitutes our happy life, from whom all who love him receive their existence and their love of him, of whom we have no fear at all that, once known, he could fail to satisfy anyone? He wishes to be loved, not for any benefit to himself, but that he may grant to those who love him everlasting reward, that is, himself whom they love. Hence it is that we love even our enemies. We do not fear them, since they are unable to snatch from us that which we love. Instead, we feel compassion for them, because the more they hate us, the farther they sever themselves from him whom we love. If they would be reconciled to him, they would have to love him as the supreme good, and us as sharers of such a great blessing. Chapter 30 
At this point there arises some question concerning the angels. They are happy because they enjoy him whom we desire to enjoy. And, in proportion as we enjoy him in this life, as through a mirror or in an obscure manner, we endure our exile more patiently and are more eager to end it. It is reasonable to ask whether the love of the angels is affected by these two commandments. Now the Lord himself in the Gospel, and St. Paul the Apostle, point out that he who commanded us to love our neighbor accepted no human being. When he to whom he had mentioned these two commandments and said that on them depended the whole law and the prophets, questioned him, saying, And who is my neighbor? The Lord related that a certain man, going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among robbers, and, having been seriously wounded by them, was left beaten and half dead. He explained that no one was his neighbor except the man who had shown himself merciful to him by rescuing and caring for him. And the man who had asked the question acknowledged that this was so when he was asked. The Lord said to him, Go and do thou also in like manner. Evidently that we might understand that he is our neighbor to whom it is our duty to show mercy if he be in need of it, or to whom it would be our duty to show it if he were in need. It follows that he is also our neighbor, who in his turn must perform this same office for us. For the term neighbor connotes a relation to something, and no one can be a neighbor except to someone who is a neighbor to him. Who then does not see that no one has been accepted to whom we may deny the duty of mercy? The rule was extended even to our enemies by the Lord when he said, Love your enemies do good to those who hate you. The Apostle Paul also teaches this when he says, For thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love does no evil to a neighbor. Therefore, Whoever is of the opinion that the Apostle was not enjoining commands concerning every human being is compelled to suggest that it did not seem a sin to the Apostle if someone committed adultery with the wife of either a non-Christian or his enemy, or killed him, or coveted his property. But this idea is very foolish and very wicked. If it is madness to suggest this, then it is clear that every human being must be regarded as our neighbor because we must not do evil to anyone. And so, if he is rightly said to be our neighbor to whom we must show the service of mercy, or by whom it must be shown to us, it is clear that the holy angels are also included in this command by which we are ordered to love our neighbor. Such great services of mercy have been done to us by them, as we easily observe in many places of the sacred scriptures. In accordance with this teaching, God himself, our Lord, wished himself to be called our neighbor. For the Lord Jesus Christ meant that he himself was the one who gave help to the man lying half dead upon the road, beaten and left by the robbers. And the prophet said in prayer, As a neighbor and as an own brother, so did I please. But since the divine nature is far superior and above our human nature, the precept by which we are to love God is distinct from our love of our neighbor. He shows mercy to us because of his own goodness, while we show mercy to one another because of God's goodness. That is, he has compassion on us so that we may enjoy him completely, while we have compassion on another that we may completely enjoy him. Chapter 31 Therefore, it still seems vague to say that we fully enjoy a thing which we love for its own sake, and that we should only enjoy a thing which can make us happy, but should use other things. God loves us, and Holy Scripture often mentions his love for us. How does he love us? To use us, or to enjoy us? If he enjoys us, he needs a benefit that is ours something no sane man would say, because he himself is our every good, or else it comes from him. To whom is it bewildering or doubtful that light has no need of the brightness of those things which it has illuminated? The prophet speaks most clearly. 
I have said to the Lord, Thou art my God, for thou hast no need of my goods. Consequently, he does not enjoy us, but uses us. If he neither enjoys nor uses us, I cannot discover how he loves us. Chapter 32 He does not use anything, however, in the same way that we do. We apply the use we make of creatures to our purpose of completely enjoying the goodness of God. But God applies his use of us to his own goodness. Since he is good, we exist. Inasmuch as we exist, we are good. Besides, since he is also just, we are not evil without fear of punishment. Inasmuch as we are evil, to that extent is our existence diminished. He is the first and greatest existence, who is utterly unchangeable, and who could say most perfectly, I am who am, and thou shalt say to them, He who is hath sent me to you. As a result, the other things which exist could not exist except by him, and these things are good insofar as they have received the ability to be. Therefore, God refers that use which he is said to make of us to our benefit, not to his benefit, but only to his goodness. When we show pity on someone or are mindful of his interests, we do so for, and with an eye to, his benefit. But somehow or other, our own advantage becomes a consequence, since God does not leave without a reward that mercy which we expend upon one who needs it. Our greatest reward is that we may enjoy him perfectly, and that all of us who enjoy him may perfectly enjoy one another in him. Chapter 33 If we find this enjoyment in ourselves, we delay upon the road and place the hope of our happiness in a man or in an angel. The proud man and the proud angel claim this for themselves and rejoice that the hope of others is founded upon them. On the other hand, the holy man and the holy angel refresh us, even when we are exhausted and desirous of resting and remaining in them, with what they have received from God. In this way they compel us, refreshed now, to go to him in the enjoyment of whom we are happy, together with them. Even the apostle proclaims, Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the growth. And the angel instructs the man who is adoring him that he should rather adore God, that master under whom he himself is also a fellow servant. When you enjoy a man in God, you enjoy God rather than the man, for you enjoy him by whom you are made happy, and you will rejoice that you have come to him in whom you place the hope that you may come. Accordingly, Paul said to Philemon, Yes, indeed, brother, may I enjoy thee in the Lord. If he had not added, In the Lord, and had said only, May I enjoy thee, he would have placed in him the hope of his happiness. Yet to enjoy is very close to saying, To use with delight. When that which is loved is close at hand, it is inevitable also that it bring pleasure with it. If you pass beyond this pleasure and refer it to that end where you are to remain forever, you are using it. It would not be correct, but an error to say you are enjoying it. If you cling to it and place the goal of all your joy in it as a permanent abode, then you ought, with truth and correctness, to be said to enjoy it. And this we must not do, except in regard to the Holy Trinity, the greatest and unchangeable good. Chapter 34 Consider how, although truth himself and the word by whom all things were made, was made flesh that he might dwell among us, the apostle still says, And even though we knew Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him so no longer. Since he wished not only to show himself as the reward of those who have arrived at him, but also to those who were only coming to the beginning of their journey, to show himself as the way, he willed to assume human flesh. 
So there is also this verse. The Lord created me in the beginning of his ways, so that those who wish to come might begin from him. Therefore, although the apostle was still walking on the way and following God who was calling him to the crown of a heavenly vocation, still, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is before, he had already passed beyond the beginning of the journey and was no longer in need of it. However, all those who are desirous of arriving at truth and abiding forever in eternal life must begin and advance upon the journey, starting from him. For he has said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And this means, everyone comes through me, arrives at me, and dwells in me forever. When we come to him, therefore, we come also to the Father, for an equal is recognized through a person to whom he is equal. The Holy Ghost unites and, so to speak, cements us, so that we may dwell forever in the highest unchangeable good. Accordingly, we understand how nothing ought to hold us back on the way, since the Lord himself, inasmuch as he deigned to be our way, did not wish to hold us on the way, but wished to have us pass along it, lest we cling feebly to temporal things, even though they were taken up and borne by him for our salvation. Let us, rather, run quickly through them, in order that we may deserve to make progress and attain to him who has freed our nature from the things of time and placed it at the right hand of the Father. Chapter 35 Therefore, the summary of all that has been said since we began our discussion of things is that we are to realize that the plenitude and the end of the law and of all sacred scripture is the love of a thing which is to be enjoyed and the love of another thing which can enjoy that first thing with us, since there is no need for a precept that each one is to love himself. In order that we might know this and be able to do it, there was created by divine providence for our salvation the whole temporal dispensation which we ought to use, but not with any permanent affection and pleasure. Ours should rather be like the transitory pleasure felt toward the road, or conveyances, or any other means to an end. Or, it may be possible to express more fittingly this love we are to have for the things by which we are carried along, for the sake of the end toward which we are carried. Chapter 36 Whoever then appears in his own opinion to have comprehended the sacred scriptures, or even some part of them, yet does not build up with that knowledge the twofold love of God and his neighbor, has not yet known as he ought to know. Yet if anyone has derived from them an idea that may be useful to him in building up this love, but has not expressed by it what the author whom he is reading demonstrably intended in that passage, he is not erring dangerously, nor lying at all. For inherent in lying is the will to speak falsehoods. We find many persons who wish to lie, but no one who wishes to be deceived. Therefore, since a man deceives with knowledge, but is deceived through ignorance, it is sufficiently evident in any one instance that he who is deceived is better than he who lies, since it is better to suffer injustice than to commit it. Everyone who lies acts unjustly, and if lying ever seems useful to anyone, it is possible that injustice sometimes seems useful to him. No liar preserves faith in that about which he lies. He wishes that he to whom he lies may have faith in him, but he does not preserve this faith by lying to him. Every breaker of faith is unjust. Therefore, either injustice is sometimes useful, a thing which is impossible, or lying is always hurtful. Whoever understands in the sacred scriptures something other than the writer had in mind is deceived, although they do not lie. Yet as I began to say, if he is deceived in an interpretation by which, however, he builds up charity, which is the end of the precept, he is deceived in the same way as is someone who leaves the road through error, but makes his way through the field to the place where the road also leads. Nevertheless, he must be corrected, and must be shown how it is more advantageous not to leave the road, 
lest by a habit of deviating he may be drawn into a crossroad or even go the wrong way. Chapter 37 By rashly asserting something which the author did not intend, he frequently runs into other passages which he cannot reconcile to that interpretation. If he agrees that these latter are true and definite, then the opinion which he had formed concerning the former cannot be true. And it happens, in some way or other, that by loving his own opinion, he begins to be more vexed at Scripture than at himself. If he allows this error to creep in, he will be utterly destroyed by it. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith will totter if the authority of sacred scriptures wavers. Indeed, even charity itself grows weak if faith totters. If anyone falls from faith, it is inevitable that he also falls from charity, for he cannot love what he does not believe exists. But if he both believes and loves, by leading a good life and by obeying the commandments of good morals, he gives himself reason to hope that he may arrive at that which he loves. And so there abide faith, hope, and charity, these three, which all knowledge and all prophecy serve. Chapter 38 But the vision which we shall see takes the place of faith, and that blessedness to which we shall attain takes the place of hope. But charity will be all the more increased as those former die away. If by faith we love what we do not yet see, how much more shall we love when we have begun to see? If through hope we love what we have not yet attained, how much more shall we love when we have attained it? There is this difference between temporal goods and eternal goods, that something temporal is loved more before we have it, but becomes worthless when it has come into our possession. It does not content the soul, whose true and appointed abode is eternity. But an eternal good is loved more ardently when we have obtained it than it was when we were seeking it. No one who desires it can value it higher than inherently it is worth, with the result that it would become worthless to him when he discovers that it was less than his valuation of it. But however highly anyone may value it while he was coming to it, he will find it more valuable when he has obtained it. Chapter 39 And so, a man who relies upon faith, hope, and charity, and resolutely holds fast to them, does not need the scriptures except to teach others. And many, by means of these three virtues, live in solitude without the sacred scriptures. It seems to me that in them is already exemplified the saying, Whereas prophecies will disappear, and tongues will cease, and knowledge will be destroyed. Yet by these devices, so to speak, such a great building of faith, hope, and charity has risen in them, that, holding on to something perfect, perfect, of course, insofar as it is possible in this life, they do not seek after those things which are only partially so. For in comparison with the life to come, no just or holy man has a perfect life here. Hence the Apostle says, There abide faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Since even when we have attained to the eternal goods, although the other two die away, charity will remain forever, increased and more firmly established. Chapter 40 Therefore, when anyone recognizes that the end of the precept is charity, from a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned, and proposes to refer his whole comprehension of sacred scriptures to these three virtues, he may approach the interpretation of those books fearlessly. For when he spoke of charity, the apostle added, from a pure heart, so that nothing would be loved except that which ought to be. He joined to it a good conscience for the sake of our hope, because a person upon whom the anxiety of a bad conscience is weighing despairs of attaining that which he has faith in and loves. Third, he said, And faith unfeigned. For if our faith is untainted by falsehood, 
then we do not feel affection for what we ought not to love. By living rightly, we hope that our hope may not be deceived in any way. I have wished to speak of matters concerning faith only, insofar as I considered them of benefit for the time being, because much has been said already in other works, either by other writers or by me. And so, let this be the limit of this book. As for the rest, I shall treat of signs, as far as God gives me inspiration. Part 2 When I was writing about things, I began with a forcible reminder that one should only consider in them what they are in themselves, even when they are signs of something else. But now, when I come to the treatment of signs, one should not consider in them what they are, but rather direct his attention to the fact that they are signs, namely, that they signify something. A sign is a thing which, apart from the impression that it presents to the senses, causes of itself some other thing to enter our thoughts. For example, at the sight of a footprint, we think that the animal whose track it is has passed this way. At the sight of smoke, we learn there is a fire nearby. At the sound of a living voice, we direct our attention to the idea in that person's mind. At the sound of a trumpet, soldiers know whether to advance or retreat, or whether the action requires them to do something else. Some signs are natural, others are conventional. Natural signs are those that, independently of any purpose or desire of being a sign of anything except themselves, cause something else to be recognized. Such is the case when smoke indicates fire. It is not a will to signify that causes this. Rather, through observation and attention to our experiences, we learn that fire is near at hand even when only the smoke is visible. The footprint of a passing animal also belongs to this category. The face of an angry or sad person indicates his state of mind, although this may not be the intention of the person who is angry or sad. Every other operation of the mind is revealed by the testimony of our facial expression, even when we are not endeavoring to betray it. But it is not my aim to treat here of this type of signs. However, since it has a place in my division of the subject, I could not disregard it entirely. It is sufficient to have alluded to it to this extent. Conventional signs are those which living creatures give to one another. They thus indicate, as far as possible, either the operations of their minds or anything perceived by sense or intellect. The only reason we have for indicating by signs is that we may call forth and transfer to another's mind what is on our mind as we give the sign. I intend, therefore, to examine and treat of this type of signs insofar as it pertains to men. This I do because even the signs communicated by inspiration which are included in Holy Scripture were disclosed to us by the men who wrote them. Even beasts have certain signs among themselves by which they reveal the desires they feel. After the cock finds food, he gives a sign with his voice to the hen to hurry to him, and the dove calls his mate, or is called by her, by cooing. We are accustomed to observe many such signs. Whether these such as the expression or outcry of a man in pain, conform to the operation of the mind with no intention of giving a sign, or whether they are given for the specific purpose of signifying, is another issue. It has no reference to the matter under discussion, and I am omitting it from this work as irrelevant. Of the symbols by which men express their ideas to one another, some involve the sense of sight, many the sense of hearing, and a very few the other senses. When we nod, we are giving a sign only to the eyes of the person whom we desire, through this sign, to make a sharer of our will. Some express ever so much by the movements of their hands. Actors, by the motions of all their limbs, give certain signs to those who understand and, in a certain sense, speak to their eyes. Banners and military standards make known through the eyes of the intention of the leaders. All these signs are like visible words. But, as we have said, there are more which have to do with hearing, and these are principally expressed 
in words. The trumpet, the flute, and the harp often produce not only a pleasing sound, but also one full of meaning. All these signs are very infrequent in contrast to words. Words have gained by far a preeminence among men for expressing whatever operations of the mind a person might desire to reveal. The Lord, it is true, gave a sign by means of the perfume of the ointment with which his feet were anointed. He made known through taste what he intended in the sacrament of his body and blood, and when the woman was healed by touching the tassel of his cloak, the act signified something. But an incalculable number of signs by which men convey their ideas are based upon words. I could express in words all those signs of the kinds I have mentioned briefly, but I would not at all be able to make words clear by those signs. Since after words have reverberated upon the air, they pass away and last no longer than the sound they make, signs of words have been provided by means of letters. In this manner, voice sounds are presented to the eye, not through themselves, but through certain characteristic signs. Those signs could not be the same for all nations because of the sin of human dissension in which each one seizes the first place for himself. An evidence of this pride is that tower raised up to heaven where impious men merited the just penalty of having not only their minds, but also their tongues confounded. The result was this. Although sacred scripture, which heals such grave maladies of human hearts, began from one language by which it could be spread abroad through the whole world at the proper time, it was scattered far and wide by the various languages of translators, and only thus became known to the nations for their salvation. In reading it, men are desirous only of discovering the thoughts and intentions of those by whom it was written. Through these in turn, they discover the will of God, according to which we believe such men spoke. Those who read indiscreetly are deceived by numerous and varied instances of obscurity and vagueness, supposing one meaning instead of another. In some passages, they do not find anything to surmise even erroneously, so thoroughly do certain texts draw around them the most impenetrable obscurity. I am convinced that this whole situation was ordained by God in order to overcome pride by work and restrain from haughtiness our minds which usually disdain anything they have learned easily. For instance, there are holy and perfect men by whose lives and example the Church of Christ rids those who come to her of superstition and incorporates them with herself through the imitation of these good men. These good and truly faithful servants of God, ridding themselves of worldly cares, have come to the holy labor of baptism, and arising from it, produce by the infusion of the Holy Ghost the fruit of a twofold charity, a love of God and of their neighbor. Why is it, then, I ask, that when anyone asserts these facts, he affords less charm to his listener than when he explains, with the same interpretation, that text from the Song of Songs where the church is alluded to as a beautiful woman who is being praised? Thy teeth are as flocks of sheep that are shorn, which come up from the washing, all with twins, and there is none barren among them. Does one learn anything more when he hears that same thought phrased in the simplest words, without the aid of this simile? But, somehow or other, I find more delight in considering the saints when I regard them as the teeth of the church. They bite off men from their heresies and carry them over to the body of the church when their hardness of heart has been softened as if by being bitten off and chewed. With very great delight I look upon them also as shorn sheep that have put aside worldly cares as if they were fleece. Coming up from the washing, that is, the baptismal font, all bear twins, that is, the two precepts of love, and I see no one destitute of that holy fruit. But it is hard to explain why I experience more pleasure in this reflection than if no such comparison were derived from the sacred books even though the matter and the knowledge are the same? This is another question. However, no one is uncertain now that everything is learned more willingly through the use of figures, and that we discover it with much more delight when we have experienced some trouble in searching for it. Those who do not find what they are seeking are afflicted with hunger. 
but those who do not seek, because they have it in their possession, often waste away in their pride. Yet in both cases, we must guard against discouragement. The Holy Ghost, therefore, has generously and advantageously planned Holy Scripture in such a way that in the easier passages, He relieves our hunger, in the ones that are harder to understand, He drives away our pride. Practically nothing is dug out from these unintelligible texts which is not discovered to be said very plainly in another place. Primarily, we must be led by the fear of God, that we may recognize His will, what He orders us to seek after, and what we must flee from. It is inevitable that this fear should awaken reflection upon our mortal nature and the death that will be ours. By it, all our emotions of pride are fastened to the wood of the cross, as it were, by kneeling our flesh. Then we must become gentle through piety. We ought not to protest against Holy Scripture, either when we understand it and it is attacking some of our faults, or when we do not understand it and think that we ourselves could be wiser and give better advice. In this latter case, we must rather reflect and believe that what is written there is more beneficial and more reasonable, even if hidden, than what we could know of ourselves. After those two steps of fear and piety, we come to the third step, that of knowledge, which I have now begun to discuss. Everyone devoted to the study of the Holy Scriptures trains himself in this. In them, he will find nothing else except that God must be loved for his own sake and our neighbor for the sake of God, and to love God with his whole heart and with his whole soul and with his whole mind and his neighbor as himself. That is, that our entire love of our neighbor as also of ourselves is to be referred to God. I treated of these two precepts in the previous book when I was discussing things. It is inevitable, then, that at first each one should discover in the Scriptures that he has been enmeshed by the love of this world, that is, of temporal things, and has been far separated from such a great love of God and of his neighbor as Scripture itself prescribes. Then, truly, that fear with which he meditates upon the judgment of God and that piety through which he must needs believe in and yield to the authority of the holy books should force him to mourn over himself. That knowledge of a good hope causes a man to be not boastful, but sorrowful. In this disposition, he begs through unceasing prayers the consolation of divine assistance that he may not be crushed by despair. He thus begins upon the fourth step, that of fortitude, where he hungers and thirsts for justice. In this state he withdraws himself from every deadly pleasure of passing things. In turning aside from these, he turns towards the love of eternal things, namely, the unchangeable trinity in unity. When, as well as he can, he has observed this gleaming from a distance, and has plainly perceived that he cannot bear that light because of the weakness of his vision, he is at the fifth step, that is, in the counsel of mercy. Here he cleanses sordid thoughts from his soul, which is somehow confused and annoying to him because of its craving for inferior things. It is here that he zealously practices the love of his neighbor and perfects himself in it. Now, full of hope and spiritually vigorous, when he has attained even to the love of his enemy, he rises to the sixth step. There he cleanses the sight itself which can see God so far as he can be seen by those who die to this world as far as they can. They see in proportion to the extent that they die to this world, but in so far as they live to it, they do not see. And so, Although the splendor of that light begins to appear more definite now and is not only more endurable but even more pleasant, it is still said to be seen through a mirror in an obscure manner. This is because we walk more by faith than by sight while we are exiled in this life, although our citizenship is in heaven. At this level, however, he so cleanses the eye of his heart that he does not prefer or compare even his neighbor to the truth and therefore not himself either, 
since he does not so exalt the one he loves as himself. Therefore, that holy man will be so sincere and clean of heart that he will not be turned away from truth, either through a desire of gratifying men or through an intention of evading whatever inconveniences disturb this life. Such a child of God mounts to wisdom, which is the last and seventh step, and this he fully enjoys with perfect calm and serenity. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. From that fear until we arrive even at wisdom, it is through these steps that we make our way. Let us now turn our attention to that third step which I have determined to discuss and reflect upon as the Lord may prompt me. The most intelligent investigator of sacred scriptures will be the man who has, in the first place, read them all and obtained a knowledge of them. Perhaps he has not yet acquired the knowledge of understanding, yet he may have some grasp of them through reading, at least with respect to those which are called canonical scriptures. For fortified by the belief of truth, he will read the others more securely, that they may not preoccupy a weak mind, nor, deluding it with dangerous lies and imaginations, prejudice it against a wholesome understanding. In the canonical scriptures, he should follow the authority of the majority of Catholic churches, among which are surely those that have deserved to have apostolic sees and receive epistles. He will keep to this method in canonical scriptures, therefore preferring those which are accepted by all Catholic churches to those which some do not accept. Among those which are not accepted by all, let him favor those which the greater number of more eminent churches accept, rather than those upheld by a minority of churches of less authority. If he discovers that some are accepted by the greater number of churches and others by the more important ones, although he cannot discover this easily, I believe the authority in the two cases should be considered as equal. The whole canon of the scriptures on which I maintain that this consideration should depend is contained in these books. The five of Moses, that is, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, one book of Joshua, one of Judges, a little book which is called Ruth, which seems rather to pertain to the beginning of Kings, then four books of Kings and two of Chronicles, which do not follow them in thought, but, as it were, are collaterally joined and proceed together with them. These are the books of history which contain a connected narrative of the times and have an orderly arrangement. There are others, histories of a different order which are not united to the aforementioned order or to one another, such as the books of Job, Tobit, Esther, Judith, the two books of the Maccabees, and the two of Ezra. These last two follow the orderly history up to its termination in the books of Kings and Chronicles. Then the prophets, in which there are one book of the Psalms of David and three of Solomon, Proverbs, the Song of Songs, and Ecclesiastes. As to the two books, one of which is entitled Wisdom and the other Sirach, these are said to have been Solomon's because of a certain likeness of style, yet Joshua ben Sirach is asserted most consistently to have written them. However, they must be counted among the prophetical books, because they have deserved recognition for their authority. The rest are the books which are properly termed prophets, twelve separate books of the prophets which are connected with one another and are considered as one, since they have never been separated. These are the names of the prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Hagar, Zechariah, and Malachi. Then the four major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. The authority of the Old Testament is contained in these forty-four books. The authority of the New Testament rests in the following. The four books of the Gospel, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The fourteen epistles of Paul the Apostle, to the Romans, two to the Corinthians, to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the Philippians, two to the Thessalonians, to the Colossians, two to Timothy, to Titus, to Philemon, and to the Hebrews, two epistles of Peter, three of John, one of Jude, and one of James, 
the Acts of the Apostles in one book, and one book of the Apocalypse of John. In all these books, those who fear God and are meek in their devotion seek the will of God. The first care of this task and endeavor, as I have said, is to know these books. Although we may not yet understand them, nevertheless, by reading them we can either memorize them or become somewhat acquainted with them. Then, those things which are clearly asserted in them as rules governing either life or belief should be studied more intelligently and more attentively. The more anyone learns about these, the more capable of discernment he is. For among those things which have been clearly expressed in the scriptures, we discover all those which involve faith and the rules of living, namely hope and charity, of which I treated in the previous book. Then, after a certain intimacy with the language of the Holy Scriptures has been achieved, we should begin to uncover and examine thoroughly those passages which are obscure, selecting examples from clearer texts to explain such as are more obscure, and allowing some proofs of incontestable texts to remove the uncertainty from doubtful passages. In this endeavor, the memory is of very great value. If this is wanting, it cannot be imparted by these precepts. Things which have been written fail to be understood for two reasons. They are hidden by either unknown or ambiguous signs. These signs are either literal or figurative. They are literal when they are employed to signify those things for which they were instituted. When we say bos, we mean an ox, because all men call it by this name in the Latin language just as we do. Signs are figurative when the very things which we signify by the literal term are applied to some other meaning. For example, we say bos and recognize by that word an ox to which we usually give that name. But again, under the figure of the ox, we recognize a teacher of the gospel. This is intimated by Holy Scripture, according to the interpretation of the Apostle, in the text, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treads out the grain. A knowledge of languages is an efficacious cure for an ignorance of literal signs. Men who know the Latin language, whom I have now begun to teach, have need of two others in order to understand the sacred scriptures. These are Hebrew and Greek, by which they may turn back to the originals if the infinite variances of Latin translators causes any uncertainty. And yet in these books we may often come upon Hebrew words that have not been translated, such as Amen, Alleluia. Raka, Hosanna, and some others. Some of these, although they could have been translated, have been kept unchanged, like Amen and Alleluia, because of their holier authority. Some, on the other hand, are not considered capable of being translated into another language, such as the other two which I specified. There are some expressions in certain languages which cannot pass over into the usage of another language through translation. This occurs especially with interjections. These words indicate an impulse of the mind rather than any part of reasoned thought. The two last are cited as such, for they maintain that Raka is the expression of an indignant person and Hosanna of a person who is rejoicing. However, an understanding of the languages named is indispensable, not because of these few examples, which are very easy to observe and investigate, but because of the variances of translators, as I mentioned for we can enumerate those who have translated the scriptures from Hebrew to Greek, but the Latin translators are innumerable. In the first ages of the faith, when a Greek text came into the possession of anyone who considered himself slightly capable of both languages, he attempted to translate it. In fact, this diversity has helped rather than impeded understanding, if readers would only be discerning. A close study of a number of texts frequently has clarified some of the more obscure phrases, for instance that of the prophet Isaiah, which one translator expresses, And do not despise the domestics of thy seed, while another interprets it thus, And despise not thy own flesh. Each one confirms the other, for the one is interpreted from the other. Flesh can be understood in its literal sense, and this one could believe that he has been warned not to despise his own body. And figuratively, the domestics of thy seed could be taken to mean Christians, who, together with us, have been given spiritual birth from the same seed. 
the word. However, after we have compared the opinions of the translators, a more probable meaning occurs to us. The precept, literally, is not to despise one's relations, because when we associate domestics of the seed with flesh, relations come particularly to mind. That, I think, is the source of the Apostle's statement, in the hope that I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and may save some of them. By this he means, through zealously imitating those who had believed, they themselves might also believe, for he designates the Jews his own flesh because of his blood relationship to them. Likewise, that text of the prophet Isaiah, If ye will not believe, ye shall not understand, has also been translated, If you will not believe, you shall not continue. It is open to question which one of these conforms to the literal meaning, unless we read the text in the original language. However, something valuable in both is impressed upon those who read with understanding. It is difficult for translators to become so different from one another that they do not converge by some resemblance. Now the essence of knowledge is the eternal vision, while faith nourishes us as babes upon milk in the cradles of earthly things. For now we walk by faith and not by sight. If, however, we do walk by faith, we shall not be able to arrive at sight, which does not vanish, but continues through our intellect once cleansed by our union with the truth. Therefore it is that one translator says, If ye will not believe, ye shall not understand. And the other declares, If you will not believe, you shall not continue. Frequently a translator who does not understand the sense very well is led astray by an obscure expression in the original language. He therefore translates it with a meaning which is utterly foreign to that of the writer. For example, some texts have, Their feet are sharp to shed blood. Oxus in Greek means both sharp and swift. So he who translated as, their feet are swift to shed blood, recognized the true meaning. The other, drawn in the opposite direction by an equivocal term, made a mistake. Such translations are not ambiguous. They are erroneous. And there is a great difference between the two things. For we must be taught not how to understand such texts, but rather how to rectify them. On this account, because in Greek moskos means calf, some did not know that moskumata are transplantings, and they have translated it as calves. This mistake has crept into so many texts that it can hardly be found written otherwise. Yet the sense is very apparent since it is clarified by the words which follow. It is more consistent to say bastard slips shall not take deep root than to speak of calves. Calves walk upon the earth with their feet and do not hold fast to it by roots. Other expressions in this passage defend this interpretation. The meaning which the various translators attempt to give, each in accordance with his own skill and opinion, is not obvious unless it is studied in the language which is being translated. Very often also a translator, unless he is a very learned man, deviates from the sense of the author. Accordingly, we must either strive after a mastery of those languages from which Holy Scripture is translated into Latin, or we must use the translations of those who have adhered unduly to the actual words. It is not that such translations are adequate, but through them we may detect the looseness or error of others who have preferred to conform to the meaning rather than to the actual words in translating. Oftentimes they translate not only individual words, but even whole phrases which cannot be translated at all into a customary Latin expression if we are desirous of preserving the idiom of the ancients who spoke Latin. These expressions sometimes take nothing from our comprehension. However, they do irritate those who find more charm in things when in their signs a certain appropriate correctness is preserved. What is called a solecism is nothing but a combination of words contrary to the rule used by the ancients who spoke with any authority. It does not concern a seeker after truth whether we say inter homines or inter hominibus. Likewise, what else is a barbarism but a word either spelled or pronounced other than was the custom of those who spoke Latin before our time? 
Whether ignoscare is pronounced with a long or a short third syllable is not much of a worry to a man begging God to forgive his sins in whatever way he can utter that word. What is purity of language, therefore, but the preservation of the idiom, supported by the authority of the earlier speakers? The weaker men are, the more they are annoyed by this. And they are weak, in proportion as they wish to appear learned, not in the knowledge of the things by which we may be instructed, but rather in a knowledge of the signs. Mm. Through this knowledge it is very easy to become proud, since even the knowledge of things often raises up our pride, unless it be curbed by the yoke of the master. To one who understands, what harm comes because a passage is written this way? Quae es terra in quaisti insidunt super eam, si bona est an niquam, et quae sunt vitates in quibus ipsi in habitant in ipsis? I consider that this is rather the expression of a foreign language than that it has any more profound significance. There is also that text which we are now unable to take away from the chant of the faithful, Super ipsum autem flori et sanctificatio mea. Assuredly, this detracts nothing from the sense, but a more instructed reader would rather have this corrected so that we would say not floriet, but floribit. Moreover, nothing prevents this revision except the custom of the chanters. These defects, then, can be easily overlooked by anyone who is unwilling completely to avoid them for they do not at all detract from a sound meaning. Then there is that text of the Apostle, Quod stultem est Dei, sapientius est hominibus, et quod infirmum est Dei, fortius est hominibus. Suppose someone had wished to preserve the Greek idiom in this text, and had said, Quod stultem est Dei, sapientius est hominum, et quod infirmum est Dei, fortius est hominum. The attention of a watchful reader would certainly go on to the truth of the passage, but someone rather slow of comprehension would either not understand it at all, or else would interpret it the wrong way. For such a phrase is not only incorrect in the Latin language, but it even tends to obscurity, so that it might seem that the foolishness or the weakness of men is wiser or stronger than God's. And yet, even that phrase, sapientius est hominibus, is not untainted by ambiguity although it is exempt from solecism, It is not clear whether hominibus is dative plural or ablative plural, except through a recognition of its meaning. Accordingly, it would be better expressed, sapientius est quam homines and fortius est quam homines. I shall speak about ambiguous signs later on. Now I am discussing unknown signs of which there are two forms insofar as they apply to words. Obviously, an unknown word or an unknown expression causes the reader to be perplexed. If these come from foreign languages, we must ask about them from men who use those languages, or learn the languages if we have the time and the ability, or study a comparison of the various translators. If we are unfamiliar with some words or expressions of our own language, they become known to us through repeated usage in reading or hearing them. Indeed, the best things for us to memorize are those classes of words or expressions which we do not know. Thus we may be able easily, by the assistance of our memory, to study and acquire a knowledge of them, either when a more educated man whom we may question happens along, or when we come upon a text such that, either by the preceding or the following context, or both, it indicates the import or meaning of that which we did not understand. Yet so powerful is the effect of habit even in learning that those who have in a certain sense been nourished and reared in the Holy Scriptures wonder more at other expressions and consider them less perfect Latin than the ones they have learned in the Scriptures but which are not found in Latin authors. Here also the multitude of translators is a very important aid when they have been considered and debated upon by a comparison of texts. However, avoid all that is positively false. For in correcting texts, the ingenuity of those who desire to know the sacred scriptures should be exercised principally in such a way that uncorrected passages, at least those coming from a single source of translation, yield to those that have been rectified. In the case of translations themselves, however, the etala is to be preferred to the others, since it combines greater precision of wording with clearness of thought. In amending any Latin translations, 
we must consult the Greek texts. Of these, the reputation of the seventy translators is most distinguished in regard to the Old Testament. These translators are now considered by the more learned churches to have translated under such sublime inspiration of the Holy Ghost that from so many men there was only one version. According to tradition and to many deserving of our trust, these men, while translating, were isolated from one another in separate cells. Nevertheless, nothing was discovered in the work of any one of them which was not discovered in the others expressed in the same words and the same arrangement of words. Who then would venture to put anything on a level with this authority, still less esteem anything better? But if they consulted one another so that one version was produced by the united treatment and opinion of all of them, even then it is certainly not reasonable or proper for any one man, regardless of his knowledge, to presume to reform the common opinion of so many older and more learned men. Therefore, even if we discover something in the Hebrew original other than they have interpreted it, it is my opinion that we should yield to the divine direction. This guidance was accomplished through them so that the books which the Jewish nation refused to transmit to other nations, either because of reverence or jealousy, were revealed so far ahead of time with the aid of the authority of King Ptolemy to those nations who would believe through our Lord. It may be that they translated according to the manner in which the Holy Ghost, who directed them and caused them all to speak the same words, decided was adapted to those persons. Yet, as I have said before, a comparison of those translators also who have adhered more persistently to the actual words is often efficacious in interpreting a thought. As I began to say then, the Latin texts of the Old Testament should be corrected if they need correction. They ought to follow the model of the Greek texts, and especially the version of those who, although seventy in number, are declared to have translated with complete agreement. Moreover, there is no doubt that the books of the New Testament, if there is any confusion resulting from the differences in Latin translations, ought to defer to the Greek texts, especially the ones that are found in the churches of greater and more diligent learning. However, in reference to figurative expressions, if by chance the reader is caused perplexity by any unknown signs, he must decipher them partly through a knowledge of languages, partly through a knowledge of things. The pool of Siloe, where the Lord ordered the man whose eyes he had smeared with clay made of spittle to wash his face, is applicable in some degree as an analogy and unquestionably alludes to some mystery. Nevertheless, if the evangelist had not explained that name from an unknown language, such an essential implication would be hidden from us. So also many Hebrew names which have not been interpreted by the authors of those books unquestionably have no small power to help toward explaining the obscurities of the scriptures, if someone is able to translate them. Some men, expert in that language, have rendered a truly valuable service to succeeding ages by having interpreted all these words apart from the scriptures, and by having given the meanings for Adam, Eve, Abraham, and Moses, and also for the interpretation of the name of places like Jerusalem, Zion, Jericho, Sinai, Lebanon, Jordan, or whatever other names in that language are unknown to us. Because these have been revealed and translated, many figurative passages in the scriptures are interpreted. In addition, an imperfect knowledge of things causes figurative passages to be obscure. For example, when we do not recognize the nature of the animals, minerals, plants, or other things which are very often represented in the scriptures for the sake of an analogy. It is well known that a serpent exposes its whole body rather than its head to those attacking it, and how clearly that explains the Lord's meaning when he directed us to be wise as serpents. We should, therefore, expose our body to persecutors rather than our head, which is Christ. Thus, the Christian faith, the head, so to speak, may not be killed in us, as it would be if preserving our body we were to reject God. There is also the belief that, having forced itself through a small opening in disposing of its old skin, the serpent gains renewed vigor. How well this agrees with imitating the wisdom of the serpent and stripping off the old man that we may put on the new, as the apostle expresses it. And we must strip it off passing through narrow places, since the Lord says, Enter by the narrow gate. 
A knowledge of the nature of the serpent, therefore, explains many analogies which Holy Scripture habitually makes from that animal. So, a lack of knowledge about other animals to which Scripture no less frequently alludes for comparisons hinders a reader very much. The same is true of an ignorance of minerals and plants, or whatever is held fast by roots. Knowledge of the carbuncle, which glitters in darkness, also illumines many obscure passages of these books wherever it is proposed for the sake of comparison, and an ignorance of the barrel or the diamond frequently closes the doors to understanding. Is it easy to comprehend that everlasting peace is signified by the olive branch which the dove, returning, brought back to the ark, in no other way than through our knowledge that the smooth surface of oil is not readily marred by a different liquid? and that the olive tree itself is always in leaf. Indeed, many, through an ignorance of hyssop, not knowing its potency, either for purifying the lungs, or, as it is said, for penetrating rocks with its roots, although it is a little unpretentious plant, cannot discover at all why it has been said, Thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. An ignorance of numbers is the reason why many things expressed figuratively and mystically in the scriptures are not understood. Certainly, a sincere nature cannot help being concerned about the significance of the fact that Moses, Elijah, and the Lord himself fasted forty days. The figurative perplexity of this act is solved only by a knowledge and study of this number. It is composed of four times ten. As it were, the knowledge of all things joined together by time. The course of the day and year are accomplished through the number four. The days are carried through in intervals of hours, morning, noon, evening, and night. The years by the spring, summer, autumn, and winter months. But while we are living in time, we must abstain and fast from all pleasure in time because of the eternity in which we hope to live although by the passage of time that very doctrine of despising temporal things and striving for eternal goods is recommended to us. Further, the number ten symbolizes the knowledge of the Creator and the creature, for a trinity is present in the Creator, while the number seven signifies the creature by reason of his life and body. In the case of his life, there are three commandments, to love God with our whole heart, our whole soul, and our whole mind. With regard to the body, there are four very discernible elements of which it is composed. So while the number ten is being impressed upon us in the sense of time, that is, multiplied by four, we are being instructed to live virtuously and temperately, free from the delights of time. In other words, to fast for forty days. This instruction comes from the law, exemplified by Moses from the prophecies, exemplified by Elijah, and from the Lord himself. He, as if claiming the testimony of the law and the prophets, revealed himself on the mount between those two to his three watching and wondering disciples. The next question is, how the number fifty, which is especially sacred in our religion because of Pentecost, proceeds from forty. Also, how this number multiplied by three because of the three periods of time, before the law, under the law, and under grace, or because of the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, eminently increased by the Holy Trinity itself, is applied to the mystery of the Most Holy Church and equals the hundred and fifty-three fishes which were caught in the net cast on the right side after the resurrection of the Lord. And so certain mysteries of comparison are expressed in the sacred books in many other numbers and arrangements of numbers, which are hidden from readers because of their ignorance of numbers. An ignorance of certain elements of music also encloses and conceals many other things. A certain author has beautifully interpreted some figurative passages from the dissimilarity between the psaltery and the harp. It is also reasonable that learned men strive to discover whether the psaltery with its ten chords is dependent upon any musical law requiring only that number of strings, or, if it is not, whether that number itself should be regarded as all the more sacred because of the ten commandments. Just so, if there would be any question about this number, it should be ascribed to the Creator and the creature because of the number ten itself as explained above. 
that number of forty-six years required for the building of the temple, which is related in the gospel, has a certain musical sound, applied to the formation of the Lord's body, because of which he mentioned the temple, it constrains some heretics to acknowledge that the Son of God has clothed himself not with a counterfeit, but with a truly human body. Indeed, in many places in the sacred scriptures we discover both number and music alluded to with respect. We must not approve of the superstitions of the pagans, who taught that the nine muses were the daughters of Jupiter and memory. Varro disproves these errors, and I know of no one among the ancients more learned or diligent in such matters. He says that a certain state, I do not remember the name, made an agreement with three artists, each for three statues of the muses, to present as an offering in the temple of Apollo. There was one condition, however, that it would choose and buy, in preference to all others, the statues of whichever of the artists had fashioned the most beautiful ones. It turned out that the artists all produced works equally beautiful and that all nine satisfied the state. Therefore, all were purchased to be enshrined in the temple of Apollo. He declares that the poet Hesiod later ascribed names to them. Consequently, Jupiter did not produce the nine muses, but three workmen chiseled three statues each. Besides, that state had not arranged for three because it had witnessed them in dreams, or because such a number of muses had shown themselves to any of the inhabitants. It did so because it was easy to observe that all sound which is the material of songs is by nature threefold. It is caused either by the voice, as in the case of those who sing from their throats without an instrument, or by the breath, as in playing trumpets or flutes, or by striking, as is true of harps, drums, or any other instruments which produce tone through percussion. Whether Varro's story is true or not, we should not avoid music because of pagan superstition if we can take from it anything useful for comprehending the sacred scriptures. But let us not maintain that we are attending their theatrical frivolities to see if there is anything about harps and other instruments which would aid in comprehending spiritual things. We should not ignore literature because Mercury is reputed to be its presiding deity, nor because they have consecrated temples to justice and virtue and have chosen to adore in stone what should be carried in the heart, must we therefore shun justice and virtue. On the contrary, every good and true Christian should understand that wherever he discovers truth, it is the Lord's. Considering and discerning this truth, he will repudiate their superstitious fables, even in their religious writings. He will deplore and guard against men who, although they knew God, did not glorify him as God or give thanks, but became vain in their reasonings and their senseless minds have been darkened. For while professing to be wise, they have become fools, and they have changed the glory of the incorruptible God for an image, made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Part 3 In order that we may develop this whole subject more accurately, for it is especially necessary, there are two kinds of learning which affect pagan morals. One is a knowledge of those things which men have set up, the other of those things which they have observed were the work of time or were divinely originated. That which is based upon human institutions is partly superstitious and partly not so. Whatever has been conceived by men for fashioning and worshipping idols is superstitious, since it concerns the worship of a created thing, or some part of it, as God, or else concerns communications and certain arrangements and pacts with demons about portents. Included as such are the works of the magical arts which the poets are wont to mention rather than teach. The books of the soothsayers and diviners are in this class, but, as it were, with more presumptuous falsity. To this category belongs also all amulets and charms, of which the science of medicine also disapproves, whether these involve enchantments or certain signs called characters, 
or the hanging, attaching, or even in a way the dancing of certain objects not in relation to the bodily condition, but according to certain portents either obscure or evident. These are more leniently termed physics, that they may seem as if they were not involved in superstition, but only profiting by nature. Instances of these are earrings hung at the top of each ear, or small rings of ostrich bone worn on the fingers, or telling a person with hiccups to hold the left thumb in the right hand. In addition, there are thousands of the most absurd rules to follow should a limb tremble, or a stone or dog or child come between friends walking arm in arm. That practice which treads upon a stone as if it were a destroyer of friendship is less offensive than the one which strikes a harmless child a box on the ear if he runs between two people walking together. But it is only fitting that sometimes the dogs avenge the children. Some people are often so superstitious that they even dare to strike a dog that has run between them, but not without paying the penalty. Sometimes the dog sends his smiter quickly away from a ridiculous practice to a real physician. Other practices like this are to tread upon the sill when you cross in front of your house, to go back to bed if you sneeze while putting on your shoes, to return home if you stumble on your way to a certain place, to be more disturbed by the premonition of a future calamity than concerned about the present damage if mice gnaw at your clothing. This is the origin of Cato's humorous response when he was consulted by a certain man who told him that his shoes had been gnawed away by mice. Cato answered that that was not a marvel, but that it would certainly have been one if the shoes had eaten the mice. We must not segregate from this class of dangerous superstition those men who used to be called genethliaki, composers of horoscopes, because of their concern with birthdays, but are now commonly called mathematiki, astrologers. These might search after and sometimes even trace out the exact location of the stars at the time of anyone's birth. Yet when they try to foretell from that source either our actions or the effects of them, they stray very far from the truth and offer a wretched slavery to unlearned men. For whenever a free man enters the home of an astrologer like this, he pays money in order that he may leave as the slave of Mars or Venus, or of all the stars. Those who were the first to make this mistake and have transmitted it to succeeding ages have attached to these stars names either of beasts because of resemblances, or of men to pay deference to those men. This is not strange, for even in rather recent times, the Romans tried to dedicate to the glory and name of Caesar the star which we now call Lucifer. Perhaps this would have happened and passed on to posterity, except that his ancestor Venus had previously taken possession of this title. Moreover, she could not transfer to her heirs by any law what she had never owned nor desired to own while alive. Where there was a place vacant, or one not consecrated in honor of some dead ancestor, the usual course of action in such matters was taken. Instead of Quintilis and Sextilis, we have named these months July and August in honor of Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar. So anyone who wishes can easily understand that the stars in former times followed their courses in the sky without these present names of theirs. Since these men were dead, their descendants were either forced by royal authority or influenced by human conceit to honor their memory. By attaching their names to the stars, they thought that they were elevating the dead men themselves to heaven. But whatever men may call them, they are stars which God has created and regulated as he wished. They have an undeviating course which separates and differentiates the seasons. It is easy to notice this motion and its progress at the birth of a person through the directions invented and written down by those whom Holy Scripture denounces in these words. For if they were able to know so much as to make a judgment of the world, how did they not more easily find out the Lord thereof? A desire to foretell from such observation the character, actions, and fortunes of human beings is a grave error and deceitful folly. In fact, those who have learned about such matters that really should be forgotten disprove this superstition. These wretched men observe the location of the stars, which they call constellations, at the time of the birth of the one about whom they are being consulted by persons even more wretched. 
Now it is possible that twins be born in such swift succession that no interval of time between them can be perceived and noted in the movement of the constellations. For this reason, it is inevitable that some twins have the same constellations, although they do not have equal experiences, either in their accomplishments or in their sufferings. Instead, they frequently undergo such unequal fortunes that one has a very happy life and the other a very unhappy one. We have learned that Esau and Jacob were born twins in such a way that Jacob, who was born second, was discovered holding on with his hand to the foot of his brother who preceded him. Certainly the day and hour of the birth of these two could not be noted in any other way except that they would both have the same constellation. Yet Scripture, now well known in the language of every nation, is a witness to the great difference in the characters, deeds, labors, and destinies of these two men. It is irrelevant to say the smallest and shortest moment of time which separates the birth of twins is of very great importance in nature and in the extraordinary swiftness of the heavenly bodies. Even though I concede that it may be very important, yet it cannot be discovered by an astrologer in the constellations by whose contemplation he declares that he foretells destinies. Consequently, he does not find this difference in the constellations, since he must inspect the same ones whether he is consulted about Jacob or about his brother. What good is it to him, then, that there is a difference in the sky which he is rashly and carelessly blaming, if there is not a difference in the chart, which he examines assiduously but to no purpose? Therefore, those beliefs which also result from the arrangement of certain signs of things by human audacity must be placed in the same category as contracts and agreements with demons. It follows from this that by a certain secret judgment of God, men avid for evil things, in just punishment of their own desires, are handed over to be mocked and deceived. Those who mock and deceive them are the fallen angels, to whom, in accordance with the decree of divine providence and God's most excellent disposition of human affairs, the lower part of the world has been subjected. Because of these illusions and deceptions, it happens that many past and future events are revealed by these superstitious and dangerous methods of divination, and come to pass just as they are predicted. Many happen in conformity with the observations of those who honor these superstitions. Enmeshed by them, they become more curious, and entangle themselves more and more in the manifold subtleties of a very dangerous error. For our benefit, Holy Scripture has not silently passed over this kind of fornication of the soul. Neither has it so frightened the soul away from it as to maintain that such practices should not be used because their teachers utter falsehoods. Rather, it says, Even if what they predict to you should come to pass, do not believe them. Simply because the ghost of the dead Samuel predicted truths to King Saul, Sacrileges such as those which called up that apparition should be no less detestable. In the Acts of the Apostles, although the woman with the divining spirit gave true evidence to the Lord's apostles, the Apostle Paul did not show mercy to the evil spirit for that reason. Instead, he cleansed the woman by denouncing and driving out the demon. Therefore, a Christian must completely reject and shun all the arts of a superstition like this. They are either worthless or sinful. Their origin is in some pernicious union of men and demons as the established agreement of a faithless and dishonorable friendship. The Apostle says, Not that an idol is anything, but that what they sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not have you become associates of devils. Moreover, what the Apostle has said concerning idols and the sacrifices which are offered to their honor must be understood in connection with all imaginary signs. It is these that attract us, either to the veneration of idols or to the worship of a created thing and its parts as God, or relate to the use of charms and other observances. They have not been universally ordained by God to develop the love of God and our neighbor. Rather, they destroy the hearts of unhappy creatures through their own individual longing for temporal things. In all these sciences, therefore, we must dread and avoid association with demons who strive, along with the devil their leader, 
solely to block and cut off our way back home. Not only have men resolved upon vain and deceitful omens concerning the stars which God created and set in order, in regard also to things that are born, or to situations originating from some exercises of divine providence, many of them, whenever they happen to notice anything unusual, for example, when a mule bore young, or lightning struck an object, have made conjectures of their own and committed them to writing as if rules. All these omens are effective only to the extent that they have been agreed upon with the demons, through presumption of mind, like some language possessed in common. Yet, they are all laden with a destructive curiosity, tormenting solicitude, and a fatal slavery. They were not noticed because they had any value, but they became significant because they were noticed and marked out as signs. For this reason, they have different meanings for different people, according to their opinions and suppositions. Those evil spirits, wishing to deceive, procure for each such signs as those which they observe have ensnared him through his own suspicions and agreements. For example, the same letter X, which is written in the form of a cross, has one meaning among the Greeks and another among the Latins. This is not because of its nature but because of agreement and common accord as to its meaning. Consequently, anyone who understands both languages would not use this letter in writing to a Greek with the same meaning as he would if he wrote to a Latin. Beta, although it is pronounced the same way, is to the Greeks the name of a letter, but it is a vegetable to the Latins. From the two syllables of lege, a Greek takes one meaning, a Latin another. Consequently, just as all these signs impress men's minds according to the common agreement of each one's own community, and because there is a diversity of agreement, they impress people differently. Therefore, men did not agree upon them because they intrinsically possessed their meaning. They have a meaning because men have agreed upon them. So too those signs which are the basis of an evil alliance with demons are significant according to each person's ideas. The usage of the augurs illustrates this very clearly. Both before and after they observe the omens, they are careful not to observe the flight or listen to the cries of birds, whose actions are insignificant signs unless the opinion of the observer agrees with them. After these superstitions have been severed and eradicated from the mind of a Christian, we must examine human practices that are not superstitious. By this I mean those that have not been arranged with demons, but with men themselves. All practices which have meaning among men, simply because they have decided that they should, are human ordinances. Some of these are unnecessary and excessive, others are useful and indispensable. Suppose the signs made by actors while dancing had a natural meaning, and not one derived from the arrangement and agreement of men. Then, in ancient times, the public crier would not have narrated to the people of Carthage, while the pantomime was dancing, what meaning the dancer intended to convey. Many old men still remember this practice, and I used to listen to their recital of it. Even now, if someone unacquainted with such trifles enters the theater, unless the meaning of these movements is explained to him, he wastes his attention upon them. However, everyone strives for some similarity in making signs, so that the signs themselves may resemble the things they indicate as much as possible. But since one thing may be like another in many ways, such signs are not consistent among men, unless common agreement approves them. In the case of paintings, statues, and other imitative works of this nature, however, especially those of skilled artists, no one seeing the likeness errs in identifying the originals. This entire group must be considered among the unnecessary institutions of men, except when it is important to know in regard to any one of them, why, where, when, or under whose authority it was produced. Finally, the thousands of imagined fables and falsities, whose untruths charm men, are human institutions. Nothing should be judged more characteristic of men and derived from themselves than whatever is deceitful and mendacious. But the useful and indispensable institutions of men with men include all the differences that seemed proper in dress and adornment of the body in order to differentiate sex and dignity, 
the numerable kinds of signs without which human society either is not managed at all or is not managed skillfully. Also, whatever weights and measures, stamping and weighing of coins are proper to each state and nation, and other practices of this kind. If these had not been the arrangements of men, they would not have been different for different nations. They also would not be altered in separate nations themselves, according to the judgment of their own rulers. A Christian, however, is certainly not to shun this whole division of human institutions which are helpful for the necessary intercourse of life. Instead, he should even give a sufficient degree of attention to them and remember them. Some human institutions are imperfect semblances, and in some way likenesses, of real things. Those which concern alliance with demons must be completely cast off and abhorred, as I have said. Those which men use with other men must be adopted, as far as they are not excessive and unnecessary. These are, especially, the forms of letters, without which we cannot read, and a sufficient diversity of languages, of which I treated previously. In this class also are shorthand characters. Those who are familiar with them are now properly called shorthand writers. These are useful forms of knowledge, and they are not learned in a forbidden manner or connected with any superstition. Nor do these forms weaken us through any excess, provided that they engross our attention only to the extent that they are not a hindrance to the nobler things which they ought to help us acquire. But we must not consider as human arrangements, everywhere we learn about them, those things which men have recorded, not because they organized them, but because they recognized them either as the work of time or the dispositions of divine providence. Some of these affect the senses of the body, others the reason. But those which are reached by the senses we either believe after they have been explained to us, or observe after they have been shown to us, or interpret after we have experienced them. Therefore, whatever that science called history teaches us about the order of past events is a very important help to us. Through it we are aided in understanding the sacred books, even though we learn it outside the church through our study as children. We often seek information on many points by using the Olympiads and the names of the consuls. An ignorance of the consulship in which the Lord was born, and of that in which he suffered, has caused some to make the mistake of believing that he suffered his passion when he was forty-six years old. This is because the Jews maintained that the temple, which was a figure of his body, was in the process of being built for that number of years. We know from the authority of the gospel that he was baptized when he was about thirty years old. It is possible for us to compute how many years he lived after that from the sequence of his actions. Yet in order that no shadow of doubt may come from any other source, we determine it more plainly and more accurately by comparing the history of the pagan nations with the gospel. It will then be obvious that there was some reason for the statement that the temple was in building for forty-six years. Since that number cannot be related to the Lord's age, it may be concerned with a more hidden teaching about the human body. For with this body the only Son of God, through whom all things were made, did not disdain to clothe himself for our sake. In connection with the usefulness of history, to pass over the Greeks, what a troublesome controversy our Ambrose has settled for the readers and devout followers of Plato. They slanderously dared to say that all the maxims of the Lord Jesus Christ, which they are forced to respect and acclaim, were learned by him from the works of Plato since it cannot be denied that Plato lived a long time before the human coming of the Lord. When that renowned bishop learned from his study of pagan history that, in the time of Jeremiah, Plato had traveled to Egypt while the prophet was there, did he not prove that it was more probable that Plato had been initiated into our literature through Jeremiah? As a result, he was capable of teaching and writing those things which are justly held in esteem. Not even Pythagoras himself, from whose disciples these men claim that Plato learned theology, lived before the time of the literature of the Hebrew nation. It was in this people that the worship of one God originated, and from it the Lord came according to the flesh. So through a study of dates, it is much more credible that those men obtained from our literature anything they said that was noble and truthful, rather than that the Lord Jesus Christ learned from the works of Plato which it is the utmost madness to suppose.
Further, when the past arrangements of men are recounted in historical narration, we must not consider history itself among those human institutions. For things which have now passed away and cannot be revoked must be considered to be in the order of time, whose creator and administrator is God. It is one thing to relate what has been done, but another to teach what should be done. History reports honestly and profitably what has been accomplished. On the other hand, books of the soothsayers and all similar writings endeavor to teach what should be done or heeded with the presumption of an instructor and not with the reliability of a guide. There is also a kind of narration similar to description, which reveals to the inexperienced not past events, but present circumstances. In this class is included everything that has been written about the location of places and the natures of animals, trees, plants, minerals, and other bodies. I spoke about this class before and taught that this knowledge is valuable in explaining the mysteries of the scriptures, not that they are to be employed according to certain signs like charms or devices of some superstition. That type I have already distinguished from this lawful and unrestricted kind. It is one thing to say, if you drink the juice crushed from this herb, your stomach will not pain you, and quite another to say, if you hang this herb around your neck, your stomach will not pain you. In the first instance, a suitable and salutary mixture is recommended. In the second, a superstitious token deserves censure. And yet, where there are no enchantments, invocations, or characters, we can ask these questions. Is the object which is tied or fastened in any way to the body for the restoration of its health efficacious by virtue of its own nature? If so, we may use this remedy unrestrictedly. Or does it succeed because of some signifying bond? The more effectually this seems to do good, all the more cautiously should the Christian beware of it. But when we do not know the reason for the efficacy of a thing, The intention for which it is used is important, so far as concerns the cure or alleviation of bodies, whether in medicine or in agriculture. However, it is not narration, but rather description, that gives us a knowledge of the stars, of which scripture mentions very few. Where the course of the moon, which is even regularly used in annually commemorating the Lord's Passion, is well known to many people, only a very few know, either well or accurately, the rising, setting, or other movements of the rest of the stars. This knowledge in itself, although it does not imply a connection with the superstition, nevertheless helps our treatment of the sacred scriptures only a little, and practically not at all. It is more of an obstacle because our application to it is useless. Also, since it is allied to the extremely dangerous fallacy of those who utter foolish prediction, it is more profitable and more virtuous to despise it. Besides a description of present circumstances, this science includes something similar to a narration of past events as well, because from the present location and movement of the stars we can, according to rule, trace even their past courses. It also includes consistent inferences about future events that are not suspiciously ominous, but rather accurately calculated. We may not attempt to learn anything from them about our own deeds and their consequences, like the absurdities of the composers of horoscopes, but only what relates to the stars themselves. When anyone who makes calculations about the moon has discovered its size today, he can assert how large it was as many years before as you like, or how large it will be in so many years from now. In the same way, those who are experienced in calculating the stars are accustomed to reply about any of them. I have revealed my opinion about this whole division of knowledge so far as its use is concerned. Of the other arts, some are concerned with fashioning something which endures as an effect of the laborer's work, such as a house, a bench, a dish, or anything else of this nature. Others display a sort of assistance to God in his works, like medicine, agriculture, and government. There are others whose whole purpose is action, as dancing, running, and wrestling. In all these arts, Experience causes us to infer the future from the past. 
For no skilled worker in these arts moves his limbs in any operation without uniting the remembrance of past events to his hope for future ones. In this life we are to apply our knowledge of these arts in a superficial and cursory fashion, so that we do not devote ourselves to them, unless perhaps some obligation requires it, and I am not discussing this point now. We do apply ourselves, however, that we may appreciate them. Thus, we will not be completely unaware of what Scripture wishes to suggest when it introduces figurative expressions from these arts. There are left now those institutions which concern not the senses of the body, but the intellect, where the sciences of reasoning and of numbers have the mastery. The science of reasoning is very valuable in penetrating and answering all kinds of disputed points which are found in the sacred writings. However, there we must beware of an inclination to wrangle and a certain puerile pretension of deluding our opponent. There are many deceitful conclusions of reasoning called sophisms. These so closely resemble true ones that they mislead not only stupid persons, but even those who are quick of apprehension when they are not carefully attentive. For instance, a certain person stated this premise to the man to whom he was talking. You are not what I am. The other agreed, because the statement was partly true or because the one was subtle while the other was guileless. Then the first man continued, I am a man. When the other agreed to this also, he concluded, Therefore you are not a man. As far as I can judge, Holy Scripture abominates this type of deceptive conclusions, according to the passage which says, He that speaketh sophistically is hateful. However, a manner of speaking which is not deceptive, but still strives after verbal embellishments in more abundance than is suitable for seriousness, is also called sophistical. There are also correct modes of reasoning, which result in false ways of thinking because they are the logical consequences of the fallacy of the person with whom one is disputing. These conclusions are drawn by a good and learned man, so that the person of whose error they are the consequence, blushing over them, may abandon that error. For if he wishes to maintain it, he is also inevitably compelled to hold to those conclusions which he censures. For instance, the apostle was not introducing true conclusions when he said, Neither has Christ risen and also, vain then is our preaching, vain too is your faith, and so on with others. These are all entirely false, because Christ has risen, and the preaching of those who announced this truth was not in vain, and neither was the faith of those who believe it vain. Those false conclusions were reasonably linked to that proposition which maintained that there was no resurrection of the dead. Since these conclusions were true on condition that the dead do not rise, when they have been rejected as false, the consequence will be the resurrection of the dead. Therefore, since there are true conclusions not only of truthful but also of false propositions, it is easy to learn the real nature of logical sequence even in those schools which are outside the church. However, the true nature of propositions must be traced out in the sacred books of the church. However, the true nature of logical conclusions has not been arranged by men. Rather, they studied and took notice of it, so that they might be able either to learn or to teach it. It is perpetual in the order of things and divinely ordained. The person who relates the chronological order of events does not arrange it himself. The person who makes known the location of places and the natures of animals, plants, or minerals does not reveal things instituted by men and he who describes the stars in their movement is not describing his own or any other man's creation. So too the man speaks very truthfully who says, When the conclusion is false, it is inevitable that the proposition also is false. But he himself does not cause it to be true, he only shows that it is. The quotation I gave from the Apostle Paul originates from this rule. The proposition was that there was no resurrection of the dead. Those whose error the apostle wished to destroy maintained this. The necessary conclusion of that proposition, which said that there was no resurrection of the dead, was, neither has Christ risen. But this conclusion is false, for Christ has risen. 
Therefore, the proposition is invalid. But the proposition was that there is no resurrection of the dead. Therefore, there is a resurrection of the dead. This whole syllogism is stated briefly as follows. If there is no resurrection of the dead, neither has Christ risen. But Christ has risen. Therefore, there is a resurrection of the dead. Men have not established, but only expressed this principle, that when the consequence is invalidated, the proposition is also necessarily disproved. This rule applies to the logical truth of conclusions, but not to the absolute truth of principles. However, in the discussion about the resurrection, the rule of the conclusion and the judgment reached in the conclusion are true. There is authenticity of conclusion from invalid propositions in this way. We may assume that someone has agreed, if a snail is an animal, it has a voice. Since he concedes this, when it has been demonstrated that the snail has no voice, the conclusion is that the snail is not an animal, because when the conclusion is illogical, the proposition is also illogical. This judgment is unsound but the logical sequence of the conclusion from the false premise is sound. In the same way, the integrity of a proposition is intrinsically valid, but the integrity of the conclusion emanates from the belief or concession of the person with whom one is disputing. Therefore, as I said before, an incorrect conclusion may be inferred by means of a sound logical sequence so that he whose fallacy we are anxious to rectify may regret that he has proposed premises whose logical conclusions he perceives he must reject. Now it is easily recognized that just as there can be logical conclusions from invalid propositions, so also can there be untenable conclusions from valid propositions. Assume that someone has advanced the proposition, if that man is just, he is good. And when this was conceded, he then joined the minor proposition, but he is not just. When this also was conceded, he brought forward the deduction, therefore he is not good. Even though all those assertions are true, the authority of the conclusion is not valid. The invalidation of the premise does not necessarily involve the invalidation of the conclusion, as was the case when the negation of the conclusion unavoidably entailed that of the premise. It is correct to say, if he is an orator, he is a man. But if we negate the proposition and say, but he is not an orator, the logical conclusion will not be, therefore he is not a man. Therefore, it is one thing to know the rules governing logical sequences, another to know the truth of propositions. In regard to sequences, we learn the nature of a logical, an illogical, and an inconsistent sequence. If he is an orator, he is a man, is a logical sequence. If he is a man, he is an orator, is an illogical sequence. And if he is a man, he is a quadruped, is an inconsistent sequence. Here then we form an opinion with regard to the sequence itself. However, in regard to the validity of propositions, we must judge the propositions themselves and not their logical sequence. But when doubtful propositions are joined in a sound sequence to valid and reliable ones, it is inevitable that they themselves become incontestable. When some people have learned the true nature of logical sequences, they boast as much as if it were the true nature of propositions. On the other hand, some who maintain a valid proposition erroneously have a low opinion of themselves because they do not know the principles of consequence. Yet he who knows that there is a resurrection of the dead is a better man than one who knows that it is a consequence that Christ has not risen if there is no resurrection of the dead. The science of definition, division, and partition, although it may often be employed even in fallacies, is not false itself. Neither was it instituted by men but was discovered in the reason of things. Poets have customarily used it for their fables. False philosophers and even heretics, that is, false Christians, for their false beliefs. Nevertheless, 
nothing on that account causes it to be untrue that in definition, division, and partition there is to be included nothing which does not apply to the subject, nor is anything which does apply to be excluded. This principle is true, even though the things being defined or divided may not be true. Even falsehood itself is defined by saying that it is the representation of the thing which actually, in one way or another, is not as it is represented. This definition is true, although falsehood cannot be true. We can also divide falsehood by saying that there are two kinds. The one consists of things that cannot be true at all, the other of things which are not true although they could be. If someone say that seven and three are eleven, what he says cannot be true at all. But if someone declares that it rained, say, on January 1st, even though it actually did not, still, what he says could have happened. Therefore, the definition and division of falsities can be completely true, although falsehoods themselves certainly are not true. There are also certain principles of a more abundant kind of disputation, which is called eloquence. Although they can be employed in convincing us of falsehood, nevertheless they themselves are true. Since they can be employed also in the service of truths, the power itself is not culpable, but the bad faith of those who misuse it is. Men did not ordain that a demonstration of regard would win over a listener, or that a brief and intelligible narration easily makes the impression at which it aims, and that its variety holds its listener's intent without any tedium. There are also other rules of this kind which are still true, whether they are employed with false or true motives. And these rules are true to the extent that they cause something to be either known or believed, or influence men's minds either to seek it or avoid it. Men discovered that these rules existed, rather than ordained that they should exist. When this lesson is learned, we should apply it rather to revealing a matter we have understood than to the actual understanding of it. That science of conclusions, definitions, and divisions is a very important aid to understanding, provided that men do not make the mistake of imagining that they have learned the true nature of a happy life when they have learned those principles. Yet it frequently happens that men more easily understand the matters for which those principles are learned than the very difficult and irritating teachings of those principles. For instance, Someone is desirous of giving rules for walking. He admonishes you not to raise the foot behind you until you have put down the other foot. Then he explains in details how you ought to move the sockets of your knee joints. The facts he is telling you are true, and you cannot walk in any other way. Men walk more easily, however, by doing these things than they notice them as they are doing them, or understand the directions they hear. On the other hand, people who cannot walk trouble themselves much less about rules which they cannot apply through actual experience. So an intelligent man frequently perceives more quickly that a conclusion is not valid than he learns the principles of it, while a stupid person does not perceive the fallacy, but still less does he comprehend the principles governing it. In all these principles, the very semblances of truth often charm us more than they help us either in disputing or in drawing conclusions, except perhaps that they cause our talents to be exercised more, if only they do not also cause those who have learned these principles to be more disposed to evil and pride, so that they either delight in deceiving others through a sophistical manner of speaking and specious questioning, or believe they have obtained something important and therefore set themselves above noble and upright men. Certainly it is clear to even the most stupid person imaginable that the science of numbers was not ordained by men, but rather investigated and learned by them. Virgil wanted the first syllable of Italia long, not short, as the ancients pronounced it, and he made it so. No one can decide, however, merely because he desires it, that three times three are not nine, or do not form a square, or are not the triple of the same number three or are not one and one-half times six, or that they are the double of some number, since odd numbers do not have a half. Therefore, whether numbers are regarded in themselves, or in their application to the principles of figures, sounds, or other movements, they have unchangeable rules.
These were not ordained by man in any way, but were learned through the intelligence of clever men. Yet whoever esteems all these things so highly that he wants to speak boastfully of himself among unlearned men, instead of trying to learn the source of the truth of things which he has seen are true, or the source of the truth and immutability of those which he has learned are immutable, or in advancing from the bodily appearance to the human mind has found out that it is inconstant, sometimes learned, sometimes ignorant, but still established between immutable truth above it and the other changeable things below it. Whoever, I say, acts in this manner and does not refer everything to the praise and love of the one God from whom he knows that everything has come into existence may seem to be erudite, but he can by no means be considered wise. It seems to me, therefore, that it would be advantageous to instruct eager and talented young men who fear God and strive for a happy life that they should not rashly presume to study any sciences taught outside the Church of Christ in order to seize upon a happy life. They should rather decide upon them prudently and cautiously. Some sciences ordained by men are variable because of the diverse purposes of their authors, and obscure because of the notions of those who are in error. Should they find such, they should completely repudiate and abhor them, especially if their authors or those in error have also formed any alliance with demons through certain pacts and agreements about signs. They should also discard the study of the unnecessary and excessive creations of men. However, because of the necessity of this life, they should not disregard those human institutions which are of value for intercourse with their fellow men. Among the other sciences found among the pagans, however, I consider nothing beneficial except the history of either past or present events, the study of matters which concern the bodily senses, to which I would add the experiences and inferences of the useful mechanical arts, and also the sciences of reasoning and of numbers. In all these we must maintain the principle, nothing in excess, but especially in those studies which, since they concern the bodily senses, occur in time and are restricted by localities. Now some scholars have accomplished the task of interpreting, apart from their context, all the words and names in Hebrew, Syriac, Egyptian, or any other language found in the sacred scriptures which had been left there untranslated. Eusebius produced a history of past events because of the disputed points in the sacred books which demand its use. Consequently, just as these men, in matters of this kind, have made it unnecessary for a Christian to exert himself in many studies for a few facts, I believe the same thing could be done now if there were someone capable who could be induced to devote a truly beneficial service to the advantage of his brethren. He could classify whatever unfamiliar places, animals, plants, trees, stones, metals, or other objects to which Scripture alludes. Then, after he has arranged them by classes, he should write down his explanations. He can do the same thing with regard to numbers, so that he would write down the explanation of the system of only those numbers which Holy Scripture mentions. Some of these tasks, or perhaps all of them, have been achieved already. I discovered that many, which I did not surmise, have been elaborated and written down by virtuous and learned Christians, but either because of the multitudes of the indifferent or because of the works of the envious, they lie hidden. I do not know whether this could be done with the science of reasoning, but it seems impossible to me, because this is interwoven like strings through the whole text of the scriptures. For this reason, it is more of a help to readers in solving and explaining ambiguities about which I shall speak later, than in learning about unknown signs, which I am considering now. Furthermore, if those who are called philosophers, especially the Platonists, have said things by chance that are truthful and conformable to our faith, we must not only have no fear of them, but even appropriate them for our own use from those who are, in a sense, their illegal possessors. The Egyptians not only had idols and crushing burdens which the people of Israel detested and from which they fled, but they also had vessels and ornaments of gold and silver and clothing which the Israelites, leaving Egypt, secretly claimed for themselves as if for a better use. Not on their own authority did they make this appropriation, but by the command of God, while the Egyptians themselves, without realizing it, 
were supplying the things which they were not using properly. In the same way, all the teachings of the pagans have counterfeit and superstitious notions and oppressive burdens of useless labor, which any one of us, leaving the association of pagans with Christ as our leader, ought to abominate and shun. However, they also contain liberal instruction more adapted to the service of truth and also very useful principles about morals. Even some truths about the service of the one God himself are discovered among them. These are, in a sense, their gold and silver. They themselves did not create them, but excavated them, as it were, from some mines of divine providence which is everywhere present, but they wickedly and unjustly misuse this treasure for the service of demons. When the Christian severs himself in spirit from the wretched association of these men, he ought to take these from them for the lawful service of preaching the gospel. It is also right for us to receive and possess, in order to convert it to a Christian use, their clothing, that is, those human institutions suited to intercourse with men which we cannot do without in this life. For what else have many noble and loyal members of our faith done? Do we not perceive with what an abundance of gold, silver, and clothing that very eloquent teacher and blessed martyr Cyprian was loaded when he left Egypt? With what an abundance Lactantius was enriched, and Victorinus, Optatus, Hilary, and innumerable Greeks, not to speak of men who are still living? That most obedient servant of God, Moses himself, was the first to do this, and it was written of him that he was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. The superstitious custom of the pagans, especially at that time when, striking at the yoke of Christ, it was persecuting the Christians, would never have bestowed upon all these men sciences which it considered profitable if it had supposed they were going to convert them to the worship of the one God, in order that the false worship of idols might be rooted out. But they gave their gold, silver, and garments to the people of God who were leaving Egypt, not knowing how the things which they were giving would yield to the obedience of Christ. What happened in the Exodus is undoubtedly a figure that signified the present. I assert this without prejudice to another understanding, either equal or better. When the student of the Holy Scriptures, after being instructed in this manner, begins his examination of them, he should not fail to reflect upon that observation of the Apostle. Knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. In that way he will realize that although he leaves Egypt a rich man, still, unless he has observed the Passover, he cannot be saved. Besides, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. The most important lesson this sacrifice teaches Christians is the one that he himself proclaimed to those whom he saw laboring as in Egypt under Pharaoh. Come to me, you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden light. To whom was he speaking, except to the meek and humble heart, whom knowledge does not puff up, but whom charity edifies? Therefore, they are to bear in mind that those who celebrated the Passover at the time through figures and shadows when they were commanded to mark their doorpost with the blood of the Lamb, marked them with hyssop. This is a mild and humble plant, but has very strong and penetrating roots. So, being rooted and grounded in love, we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, that is, the cross of the Lord. Its breadth is signified by the transverse beam on which the hands are extended. The length from the ground to that crossbar is where the whole body from the hands down is fastened. The height from the crossbar up to the top, which is near the head. The depth is that part which is concealed, driven into the earth. In this sign of the cross, the whole Christian life is defined to perform good works in Christ and cling to him perseveringly, to aspire to heavenly goods and not to profane the sacraments. Cleansed by means of this action, we shall be able to know Christ's love, which surpasses knowledge, by which he is equal to the Father, through whom all things were made, in order that we may be filled unto all the fullness of God. 
There is also a cleansing power in hyssop, lest the breast, arrogant because of the knowledge which puffs up, should boast haughtily about the riches carried away from Egypt. So the psalmist says, Thou shalt sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be cleansed. Thou shalt wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. To my hearing thou shalt give joy and gladness. Then he continues in the following words to show that a cleansing from pride is signified by the hyssop. And the bones that have been humbled shall rejoice. Yet all the knowledge gathered from the works of the pagans, however useful it is, when it is compared to the knowledge of sacred scriptures, is as inferior as the abundance of gold, silver, and clothing which the Israelites carried out of Egypt with them is in comparison with the wealth which they afterwards acquired at Jerusalem, especially during the rule of King Solomon. Whatever a man has learned apart from Scripture is censured there if it is harmful. If it is useful, he finds it there. And although everyone may have found there everything which he learned profitably somewhere else, he will discover there, in much greater profusion, things which he can learn nowhere else at all, except in the admirable profundity and surprising simplicity of the Scriptures alone. Therefore, when unfamiliar signs do not ensnare the reader provided with this instruction, meek and humble of heart, easily brought under the yoke of Christ and weighed down by his light burden, grounded, rooted, and built up in love, beyond the power of knowledge to puff him up, let him advance to the study and thorough investigation of the ambiguous signs in the scriptures. In the third book, I shall begin to say about these signs whatever our Lord will deign to grant me to say. Part 4 A man who fears God carefully searches for his will in the Holy Scriptures. Gentle in his piety, so that he has no affection for wrangling, fortified by a knowledge of languages that he may not be perplexed over unknown words and modes of expression, protected also by an appreciation of certain indispensable things that he may not be unaware of the power and nature of those which are employed for the sake of analogy, aided too by the integrity of the texts which an intelligent accuracy and correction has assured. Let him approach, thus trained, to the investigation and explanation of the obscurities of the scriptures. As a consequence, he will not be deceived by ambiguous signs, so far as I can teach him. It is possible, however, that, because of the stature of his genius or the clarity of his greater inspiration, he may laugh at, as being childish, those ways which I intend to show him. However, as I began to say, one who has such a disposition of soul that he is able to learn from me, as far as I can teach him, will understand that the ambiguity of Scripture consists in either literal or figurative use of words. I defined these classes in the second book. When literal words cause Scripture to be ambiguous, our first concern must be to see that we have not punctuated them incorrectly or mispronounced them. Then, when a careful scrutiny reveals that it is doubtful how it should be punctuated or pronounced, we must consult the rule of faith, which we have learned from the clearer passages of the Scriptures and from the authority of the Church. I said enough about this matter when I discussed things in the first book. If both meanings, or even all of them if there should be several, sound obscure after recourse has been had to faith, we must consult the context of both the preceding and the following passage to ascertain which of the several meanings indicated it would consent to and permit to be incorporated with itself. Now consider some examples. Some heretics punctuate a certain passage thus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and God was. So that the next sentence would be, This Word was in the beginning with God. They are unwilling to acknowledge that the Word is God. This, however, must be shown to be false according to the rule of faith, which teaches us to say of the equality of the Holy Trinity, 
and the Word was God. Then to add, He was in the beginning with God. There is an obscurity of punctuation that is not opposed to faith through either interpretation and must therefore be determined from the context itself in this statement of the Apostle. And I do not know which to choose. Indeed, I am hard-pressed from both sides, desiring to depart to be with Christ, a lot by far the better, yet to stay on in the flesh is necessary for your sake. It is doubtful whether we are to understand desiring two things or, indeed I am hard-pressed from both sides, that we may add, desiring to depart and to be with Christ. But since the following words are, a lot by far the better, it is clear that he is saying that he desires what is better, so that, although he is hard-pressed from both sides, he recognizes a desire for one, but a need for the other. That is to say, a desire to be with Christ, and a necessity to stay on in the flesh. This ambiguity is decided by one word which follows and which is translated for. The translators who have taken away that particle have been more influenced by the opinion that he appeared to be not only hard-pressed from both sides, but that he also desired both. Consequently, we must punctuate this way, and I do not know which to choose. Indeed, I am hard-pressed from both sides. There follows this mark of punctuation desiring to depart and to be with Christ. And, as if he were asked why he had more of a desire for this, he says, For this is by far the better lot. Then why is he hard-pressed from two sides? Because there is a necessity for his staying on. So he adds this, To stay on in the flesh is necessary for your sake. But when the ambiguity can be explained neither through a principle of faith nor through the context itself, there is nothing to prevent our punctuating the sentence according to any interpretation that is made known to us. This is a case in the letter to the Corinthians. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Make room for us. We have wronged no one. As a matter of fact, it is uncertain whether we should read, Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and of the spirit, as in the passage, That she may be holy in body and in spirit, or whether we should read, Let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh. In this case, the next sentence would be, And perfecting holiness of spirit in the fear of God, make room for us. Such ambiguities of punctuation, then, are subject to the reader's judgment. The same principles which I proposed for uncertain punctuations must also be followed for undetermined pronunciations. For these also, unless the excessive negligence of the reader prevents it, are corrected either by the rules of faith or by the preceding or succeeding context. Or if neither of these is employed in correcting, they will still remain undetermined, but in such a way that, no matter how the reader pronounces them, he will not be to blame. For if faith, by which we believe that God will not call his elect to account and that Christ will not condemn his elect, did not restrain us, we might pronounce the passage, Who shall make accusation against the elect of God? In such a way that what follows this question is like an answer. It is God who justifies. There would then be another question, Who shall condemn? And the answer would be, it is Christ Jesus who died. Since it is utter folly to believe this, we shall pronounce it in such a way that the first sentence will be a question for information and the second a rhetorical question. The ancients maintained that the difference between an ordinary question and a rhetorical question was that many replies are possible to an ordinary question, but to a rhetorical question the reply is either no or yes. Accordingly, we shall pronounce this passage in such a way that, after the ordinary question, Who shall make accusation against the elect of God? What follows will be pronounced interrogatively. Is it God who justifies? So that the answer no is implied. In the same way, we should inquire, Who shall condemn? And again we reply interrogatively, Is it Christ Jesus who died? 
yes, and rose again, he who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us? So that the answer no is implied in both these questions. However, there is that other passage, What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who were not pursuing justice have secured justice. If after the question, What then shall we say? The following answer were not added, that the Gentiles who were not pursuing justice have secured justice, the following context would not be in harmony. I do not see how it can be determined with what inflection we are to pronounce that question of Nathaniel's, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Should it be said with the tone of one who asserts, so that out of Nazareth is the only thing that involves a question? Or should the whole thing be expressed with the uncertainty of one who questions? However, neither meaning hampers our faith. There is uncertainty also in the doubtful sound of syllables, and this certainly concerns pronunciation. For example, we have this quotation, My bone, osmeum, is not hidden from thee, which thou hast made in secret. It is not apparent to the reader whether he should pronounce os with a short vowel or a long one. If he makes it short, it is the singular of osa, bones. If he makes it long, it is the singular of ora, mouths. Such matters can be decided, however, by an investigation of the original language. In Greek, it was expressed not stoma, mouth, but osteon, bone. As a consequence, the ordinary idiom of speech is often more helpful in expressing a thought than learned diction is. In fact, I would prefer it expressed as a barbarism, non es obsconditum ateosum meum, rather than have it be less intelligible because it is purer Latin. Sometimes the dubious sound of a syllable is determined by a similar word referring to the same meaning. For instance, there is that statement by the Apostle, Concerning these I warn you, predico, as I have warned you, predixi, that they who do such things will not attain the kingdom of God. If he had said only, Que predico vobis, concerning these I warn you, and had not added, Sicud predixi, as I have warned you, we would not know, unless we had resorted to the original text, whether the middle syllable in predico should be long or short. It is evident that it should be pronounced long, however, because he did not say sicud predicavi, but sicud predixi. We must consider in the same way not only difficulties like these, but also obscurities which are not concerned with punctuation or pronunciation. Such an obscurity is found in the epistle to the Thessalonians. Proptorea consolati sumus fratres in vobis. We have accordingly found comfort in you, brethren. It is uncertain whether fratres, brethren, is in the vocative or the accusative case. Neither of these is opposed to faith, but in the Greek language, these cases are not alike in form. So when that text has been examined, the case of fratres is found to be vocative. But if the translator had been willing to say, Propterea consolationem habuimus fratres in vobis, his translation would not have been so literal, but there would have been less uncertainty about the meaning. Or, of course, had he added nostri, practically no one would have doubted that the word was vocative case when he heard Proptorea consolati sumus fratres nostri in vobis. However, it is rather dangerous to venture this. It has been done in that passage to the Corinthians in which the Apostle says, Cotidie morior per vestram gloriam fratres quam habeo in Christo Jesu. I die daily, I affirm it, by the very pride that I take in you, brethren, in Christ Jesus. One translator has said, Quotidie morior per vestram euro gloriam, because in Greek a word of adjuration is evident without any ambiguous sound. Consequently, so far as the books of the sacred scriptures are concerned, it is very seldom and with great difficulty that we can discover an ambiguity in literal words that cannot be explained either by the context from which we discover the purpose of the authors, by a comparison of translators, or by an examination of the original language. The obscurities of figurative words, which I must discuss next, 
require extraordinary attention and persistence. First of all, we must be careful not to take a figurative expression literally. What the Apostle said has reference to this. The letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. When a figurative expression is understood as if it were literal, it is understood carnally. And nothing is more appropriately named the death of the soul than that which causes the quality in the soul which makes it superior to beasts, that is, its intelligence, to be subjected to the flesh by a close conformity to the literal sense. A man who conforms to the literal meaning considers figurative words as if they are literal and does not transfer what is signified by a literal word to its other sense. If he hears about the Sabbath, for example, he thinks only of one day out of the seven which are repeated in continuous sequence. When he hears of sacrifice, his thoughts do not rise above the usual sacrifices of victims of the flocks and the fruits of the earth. It is a wretched slavery of soul, indeed, to be satisfied with signs instead of realities, and not to be able to elevate the eye of the mind above sensible creation to drink in eternal light. Nevertheless, this slavery of the Jewish people was far different from the usual one of other nations, since the Jews were indeed subjected to temporal things, but in such a way that the one God was honored in all these things. And although they observed the symbols of spiritual things instead of the things themselves, unaware of what they represented, they yet considered it a settled fact that by such servitude they were pleasing the one God of all, whom they did not see. The apostle wrote that this subjection is like that of little children under a tutor, and so those who adhered stubbornly to such symbols could not tolerate the Lord's disdain for those things when the time of their revelation had come. For that reason, their leaders stirred up malicious accusations that he healed on the Sabbath, and the people, bound to those signs as if to realities, did not believe that he, who was unwilling to give heed to the signs as they were observed by the Jews, either was God or had come from God. Those who believed and of whom the first church at Jerusalem was composed, however, have clearly shown how great a benefit it was to have been so guarded under a tutor that the symbols which had been imposed temporarily upon those in servitude bound to the worship of the one God who made heaven and earth the belief of those who respected those symbols. In the temporal and carnal sacrifices and symbols, even though they did not know how to interpret them in a spiritual sense, they had learned to worship the one eternal God and were very close to spiritual things. For this reason, they were so docile to the Holy Ghost that they sold all their possessions and laid the price of them at the feet of the apostles to be distributed to the needy, and they dedicated themselves entirely to God as a new temple, of which the old temple they were honoring was an earthly figure. It has not been recorded that any churches of pagan nations did this, because those who had as their gods idols made by hand had not been found so near the truth. If at any time any of them tried to explain those images as symbols, they applied them to the worship and veneration of a created thing. For what good is it to me that the representation of Neptune, for instance, should not be esteemed as a god itself, but only as a signification of the entire ocean, or even all other waters which gush forth from springs? He is represented in this way by one of their poets who says, if I recall correctly, O Father Neptune, whose hoary temples crowned resound with the roaring sea, from whose beard eternally flows the vast ocean, and in whose hair wander the rivers. This pod shakes rattling beans inside an agreeable husk. Yet this is not food for men, but for swine. He who knows the gospel knows what I am maintaining. For what good is it to me that the statue of Neptune is represented with that meaning? except, perhaps, that I should not worship either representation. For no statue, nor even the entire sea, is God to me. Still, I acknowledge that those who regard the creations of men as gods have descended to lower depths than those who deify the creations of God. We, on the contrary, have been taught to love and worship the one God who made all these things, the likeness of which other nations venerate either as gods or as symbols and images of gods. Hence we know that it is carnal slavery to observe a symbol ordained as a benefit instead of the thing itself which it was arranged to symbolize. How much worse is it, then, 
to be satisfied with symbols arranged for unprofitable things instead of with the things themselves. If you correlate these symbols to those things which are indicated by them and devote your mind to the worship of these, you will not be liberated from the oppression and garb of carnal slavery. For this reason, Christian liberty took those whom it discovered subject to useful signs, those who were discovered near it, in a sense, and interpreting the symbols to which they had been subjugated, made them free by elevating them to the realities of which they are but signs. Of such men the churches of the faithful Israelites were composed. For those whom it discovered subject to unprofitable signs, however, it not only repealed their humiliating labor under such signs, but even cancelled those very symbols and set them all aside. In this way the pagans were converted from the debasement of a multitude of false gods, which Holy Scripture often inaccurately terms fornication, to the worship of the one God. They were not now to become subject to useful signs, but rather to train their intellects in the spiritual discernment of them. He who produces or worships any symbol, unaware of what it means, is enslaved to a sign. On the other hand, he who either uses or esteems a beneficial sign, divinely established and whose efficacy and meaning he knows, does not worship this visible and transitory sign. He worships rather that reality to which all such symbols must be ascribed. Besides, such a man is spiritual and free even during the period of his slavery, when it is not yet advisable to unveil to his mind, carnal as it is, those signs by whose yoke it is to be completely subdued. Such spiritual men as these were the patriarchs, prophets, and all those among the people of Israel, through whom the Holy Ghost gave us the remedies and comforts of the Scriptures. At present, since the evidence of our freedom has been made so clearly apparent in the resurrection of the Lord, we are not burdened with the heavy labor of even those signs which we understand now. The Lord himself and apostolic tradition have transmitted a few observances instead of many, and these are very easy to fulfill, very venerable in their meaning, and most sublime in practice. Examples of these are the sacrament of baptism and the celebration of the body and blood of the Lord. When anyone who has been instructed observes these practices, he understands to what they refer, so that he does not venerate them in a carnal slavery, but rather in a spiritual liberty. Besides, as it is a humiliating infirmity to conform to the letter and be satisfied with symbols instead of the realities represented by them, so it is sad delusion on our part to interpret symbols in a useless way. However, a person who does not understand what a symbol means, but still knows that it is a symbol, is not oppressed with slavery. It is preferable even to be subject to unknown but useful signs, rather than, by interpreting them incorrectly, to release one's neck from the yoke of slavery, only to entangle it in the snares of delusion. To this precept, an accord with which we are careful not to consider a figurative or transferred form of speech as if it were literal, we must also add another, that we are not to attempt to interpret a literal expression as if it were figurative. Therefore I must first point out the method of making sure whether a passage is literal or figurative. In general, that method is to understand as figurative anything in Holy Scripture which cannot in a literal sense be attributed either to an upright character or to a pure faith. Uprightness of character pertains to the love of God and of our neighbor, purity of faith to the knowledge of God and our neighbor. Further, everyone's hope is in his own conscience, so far as he knows that he is advancing in the love and knowledge of God and his neighbor. All these things I discussed in the first book. Since human nature is inclined to appraise sins not by the measure of their malice, but instead by the measure of its own customs, it often happens that a man considers as reprehensible only those acts which the men of his own country and age usually protest against and denounce, and he holds as acceptable and commendable only those allowed by the usage of those with whom he lives. The result is that, if Scripture either teaches something that is at variance with the custom of its listeners, or censures what is not at variance, they consider it a figurative expression, provided that the authority of its words has a hold upon their minds. But Scripture commands only charity, and censures only lust, and in that manner molds the character of men. Also, if a belief in some fallacy has impregnated their minds, 
men consider whatever scripture has maintained differently as figurative. But it teaches only the Catholic faith in relation to things past, future, and present. It is a history of the past, a prediction of the future, and a delineation of the present. All these are effective in cultivating and invigorating charity and in vanquishing and destroying lust. I define charity as a motion of the soul whose purpose is to enjoy God for his own sake and oneself and one's neighbor for the sake of God. Lust, on the other hand, is a motion of the soul bent upon enjoying oneself, one's neighbor, and any creature without reference to God. The action of unbridled lust in demoralizing one's own soul and body is called vice. What it does to harm another is called crime. These are the two classes of sin as a whole, but vices are first. When these have weakened the soul and brought it to a kind of destitution, it leaps into crimes in order to eliminate impediments to its vices or procure help for them. Likewise, what charity does for one's own benefit is utility. What it does for our neighbor's good is called kindness. In this case, utility leads the way, for no one can give another a benefit from a supply which he does not have. The more the power of lust is destroyed, the more the power of charity is strengthened. Whatever harshness and apparent cruelty in deed and word we read of in the Holy Scriptures as used by God or His saints is efficacious in destroying the power of lust. If it speaks plainly, we must not refer it to another significance as if it were a figurative expression. This passage from the Apostle is an example. Thou dost treasure up to thyself wrath on the day of wrath and of the revelation of the just judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his works. Life eternal indeed he will give to those who by patience and good works seek glory and honor and immortality, but wrath and indignation to those who are contentious and who do not submit to the truth but assent to iniquity. Tribulation and anguish shall be visited upon the soul of every man who works evil, of Jew first and then of Greek. This is spoken to those who refuse to conquer lust and are being destroyed along with it. However, when the power of lust is destroyed in a man whom it used to dominate, this passage is clear. And they who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified their flesh with its passions and desires. Even in these instances, some figurative words are employed. For instance, the wrath of God and crucified. Yet there are not so many, nor are they used in such a way that they conceal the meaning and create an allegory or an obscurity which I term properly a figurative expression. On the other hand, consider the following, spoken to Jeremiah. Lo, I have set thee this day over the nations and over kingdoms, to root up and to pull down and to waste and to destroy. Undoubtedly, the whole expression is figurative and must be attributed to that purpose which I have mentioned. The things which seem almost wicked to the unenlightened, whether they are only words or whether they are even deeds, either of God or of men whose sanctity is commended to us, these are entirely figurative. Their latent kernels of meaning must be extracted as food for charity. Now anyone who makes use of perishable things with more restraint than is characteristic of those among whom he lives is either temperate or superstitious. On the contrary, Anyone who uses them in such a way that he exceeds the limits customary with the good men among whom he lives is either expressing something by signs or is sinful. For in all such cases, it is not the use of the things, but the lust of the one who is using them that is at fault. Under no circumstances would any reasonable person imagine that the Lord's feet were anointed with precious ointment by the woman for the same reason that was customary for sensual and dissolute men whose banquets were such that we loathe them. In that case, the good odor is the good reputation which each one will possess by the works of good life, as long as he follows the footsteps of Christ, and, as it were, anoints his feet with very precious ointment. Hence, what is frequently sinful in other persons is a symbol of some sublime truth in the person of God or a prophet. Certainly union with an adulteress is one thing in the case of corrupt morals, but it is another in the case of the prophesying of the prophet Hosea, 
If it is shameful to strip the body at banquets of the drunken and lascivious, it is not for that reason sinful to be naked in the baths. Consequently, we must prudently take into account what is proper for places, circumstances, and persons, so that we may not indiscreetly convict them of sin. It is possible for a wise man to eat the most delicious food without any sin of sensuality or gluttony, while a fool is ravenous for the meanest food with a raging hunger that is most unseemly. Any sane man would rather eat fish as the Lord did than eat lentils as did Esau, Abraham's grandson, or barley the way oxen do. The fact that they are fed upon coarser food does not indicate that most animals are more self-restrained than we. For in all cases of this kind, it is not the quality of the things we use, but our motive in using them and our way of striving for them that causes our actions to be either commendable or reprehensible. Upright men of former times represented and foretold the kingdom of heaven under the guise of an earthly kingdom. Since it was in order to provide sufficiently numerous descendants, the practice of one man having several wives at the same time was unobjectionable. But the same reason did not make it virtuous for one woman to have several husbands. A woman is not more fruitful for that reason, but on the contrary, it is gross shamelessness to strive for either profit or children by prostitution. In regard to practices like these, Holy Scripture does not condemn anything the holy men of those ages did that was uninfluenced by lust, even though they did things which could only be done in our times through lust. And anything of such a kind that is there related is understood not only in its historical and literal application, but also in its figurative and prophetic implication, and must always be interpreted toward that purpose of charity, whether it pertains to God, our neighbor, or both. It was a disgrace among the ancient Romans to wear tunics that reached to the ankles and had long sleeves. Now it is unseemly for those of noble birth, when they wear tunics, not to have that kind. Just so we must notice in using other things too, that we must keep aloof from lust. For not only does it wickedly abuse the custom of those among whom we live, but often, even exceeding limits of custom, exposes in a very shameful upheaval its own foulness, which was hidden within the cover of established morality. Further, whatever is in harmony with the usage of those with whom we must spend this life, because it is either necessary or our duty to do so, must be applied by pious and noble men to utility and kindness, either literally, as is our obligation, or figuratively, as is permitted to the prophets. When men, ignorant of any other manner of living, happen to read about these deeds, unless they are deterred by an authority, they consider them sins. They cannot understand that their own entire mode of living, in connection with marriage, banqueting, dress, and the other necessities and refinements of human life, seems sinful to people of other nations and other times. Aroused by this diversity of innumerable customs, some souls, drowsy, so to speak, who were neither settled in the sound sleep of folly nor able to waken fully to the light of wisdom, have thought that justice did not exist of itself, but that each nation regarded as right that which was its own custom. Since this or that custom is different for every nation, while justice must remain immutable, it becomes evident that there is no justice anywhere. They have not understood, not to multiply instances, that the maxim, do not do to another what you do not wish to have done to you, cannot be varied in any way by any national diversity of customs. When this rule is applied to the love of God, all vices die. When it is applied to the love of our neighbor, all crimes vanish. No one wants to despoil his own house, therefore he should not dishonor the house of God, namely himself. Further, no one is willing to be injured by another, then neither should he himself harm anyone. When the tyranny of lust has been brought low, charity rules with its eminently righteous laws of the love of God for his own sake and the love of oneself and one's neighbor for the sake of God. In figurative expressions, therefore, a rule like this is to be heeded. To reflect with careful consideration for a long time upon what is being read until the interpretation is drawn over to the sway of charity. If it now has this meaning literally, it is not to be regarded as a figurative expression. If the passage is didactic, 
either condemning vice or crime, or prescribing utility or kindness, it is not figurative. But if it appears to prescribe vice or crime, or to condemn utility or kindness, it is figurative. The Lord said, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. This seems to prescribe a crime or a vice. Therefore, it is a figure of speech, directing that we are to participate in the Lord's passion and treasure up in grateful and salutary remembrance the fact that his flesh was crucified and wounded for us. Scripture says, If thy enemy is hungry, give him food. If he is thirsty, give him drink. This undoubtedly prescribes a kindness, but the part that follows, for by so doing thou wilt heap coals of fire upon his head, you might suppose was commanding a crime of malevolence. So do not doubt that it is a figurative expression, although it can have a twofold interpretation, by one intending harm, by the other intending a good. Charity should call you away from the former to kindness so that you may understand that the coals of fire are the burning lamentations of repentance by which that man's pride is healed and he grieves that he has been an enemy of the man who relieves his misery. And so, when the Lord said, He who loves his life shall lose it, he must not be interpreted as condemning the utility with which everyone ought to preserve his life. He must be interpreted instead as saying figuratively, let him lose his life, that is, let him cut off and lose the bad and irregular use of his life which he is now making, and by which he is inclined to temporal things and kept from seeking eternal goods. It is written, Give to the merciful and uphold not the sinner. The end of this sentence seems to condemn kindness, for it says, Uphold not the sinner. You should understand that sinner is set down figuratively, instead of sin, so that it is his sin that you are not to uphold. It often happens, further, that someone who is on a higher level of the spiritual life, or thinks he is, considers the things which have been enjoined upon those on lower levels as figurative. For instance, if he has embraced a life of celibacy and made himself a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake, He argues that whatever the sacred books teach about loving and governing a wife should not be accepted literally, but figuratively. And if anyone has decided to keep his virgin unmarried, he attempts to interpret as figurative the passage which says, Marry thy daughter, and thou shalt do a great work. Therefore, among the principles for understanding the scriptures, there will also be this one, that we are to understand that some injunctions are given to everyone in general, but others are given to individuals and certain classes of persons, in order that the medicine may conduce not only to the general state of well-being, but also to the peculiar infirmity of each member. For what cannot be elevated to a higher level must be attended to in its own condition. We must also be careful not to think that what is understood in the Old Testament, because of the circumstances of those times, as neither a vice nor a crime, even though it is interpreted not figuratively but literally, can be applied to these times as a mode of life. No one will do this unless he is dominated by a lust which seeks protection even in the very scriptures by which it should be destroyed. The unhappy man does not realize that those things have been set before his mind for this useful purpose, namely, that men of good hope may understand with profit that a practice which they scorn can have a good use and one which they adopt can lead them to damnation, if charity motivates the use of the first practice and lust the use of the second. Even if it were then possible, because of the circumstances, for anyone to possess many wives chastely, it is now possible for another man to be lustful with only one. I have more regard for a man who makes use of the fruitfulness of many wives for the sake of an ulterior purpose than for the one who indulges in carnal pleasures with only one wife for the sake of that pleasure. In the first case, a benefit in harmony with the circumstances of the times is sought. In the second instance, lust concerned with temporary sensual pleasures is gratified. Those to whom the apostle, by way of concession, allowed carnal intercourse with one wife because of their lack of self-control, are less advanced on the road to God than those who, although they each had several wives, 
looked only towards the begetting of children in this union, just as a wise man looks only to the health of his body in the matter of food and drink. And so, if they had been living at the time of the Lord's coming, when the time had come to gather the stones and not to scatter them, they would at once have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. For there is no difficulty in denying ourselves something, unless there is a lust in enjoying it. In fact, those men knew that, even in the case of married persons themselves, excess and intemperance were abuses. The prayer of Tobias, when he was united to his wife, testifies this. Blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers, and blessed be thy name for ever. May the heavens and all thy creation bless thee. Thou madest Adam, and gavest him Eve for a helper. And now, Lord, thou knowest that not for fleshly lust do I take my sister to wife, but because of truth itself, that thou mayest have mercy on us, O Lord. There are some, however, who in unbridled passion either wander about abandoning themselves to numerous impurities, or, with only one wife, not only exceed the bounds of moderation in regard to the procreation of children, but with the utterly shameless license of a sort of slavish freedom even heap up the uncleanness of a more bestial intemperance. These men do not believe that it was possible for the men of ancient times to possess many wives with moderation, considering in that intercourse only the obligation of propagating their race which was proper to that time. What they, hampered as they are by the chains of passion, do not observe with even one wife, they judge cannot be observed at all with many wives. These men can maintain further that good and saintly men should not be respected and esteemed, because when they are respected, they are puffed up with pride and are more avid for the most worthless praise the oftener and the more extensively a flattering tongue extols them. They become so light-minded because of this flattery that a little breeze of gossip whether it is judged as favorable or unfavorable, drives them into whirlpools of vice or flings them against the reefs of crime. Those then who so maintain may notice how arduous and troublesome it is not to be allured with the bait of praise or pierced by the stings of insults, but they are not to judge others by themselves. They should rather believe that our apostles were neither conceited when they were esteemed by men nor humiliated when they were scorned. Certainly neither trial was wanting to those men, for they were honored by the commendation of believers and dishonored by the curses of their persecutors. They made use of all these things according to circumstances and were not misled. Just so, those men of ancient times, applying the use of their wives to the circumstances of their times, did not submit to that tyranny of passion to which those who do not believe these things are subject. For if any such passion had troubled them, they could in no way have restrained themselves from irreconcilable hatred of their sons, who, they knew, had tempted or seduced their wives and concubines. When King David had endured this affliction from his wicked and treacherous son, he had not only tolerated his uncontrolled passion, but even lamented his death. He was not held ensnared by a carnal jealousy, since it was not the outrages inflicted on him, but rather the sins of his son that troubled him for he had forbidden that his son be killed if he were conquered, in order that opportunity for repentance might be reserved for him after he was vanquished. Since this was impossible, he did not grieve because of his bereavement in the death of his son, but because he realized into what punishment such a wickedly adulterous and murderous soul was precipitated. For on a former occasion, he was distressed because of the sickness of another son who was guiltless, but was able to be cheerful when he died. It is particularly evident from the following incident with what moderation and self-control these men possessed their wives. When the same king, prevailed upon by the ardor of his youth and by prosperity and temporal goods, had illicitly seized upon one woman whose husband he had commanded to be killed, he was denounced by the prophet. When he had come to point out to the king his sin, he related a parable about a poor man who had one ewe lamb. Although this man's neighbor had many, when a guest arrived, he offered him as a feast his poor neighbor's only small lamb. David, incensed at the man, ordered him to be killed and the lamb to be restored fourfold. The result was that he who had sinned intentionally was condemning himself unintentionally. When this had been made clear to him and the punishment of God had been pronounced against him, 
he expiated his sin by repentance. However, in this parable only the adultery was represented by the poor neighbor's ewe lamb. For in the parable, David was not questioned about the murder of the woman's husband, that is, about the killing of the poor man who had the one ewe lamb, so the sentence of condemnation was pronounced only against the adultery. From this it is evident with what restraint he possessed many wives, since he was compelled to punish himself because he exceeded the bounds of moderation in the case of one woman. But, in this man's case, this unbridled passion was not a lasting disposition, but only a passing one. For this reason that illicit passion was called by the prophet, in his accusation, a guest. He did not say that the man had offered the poor man's ewe lamb as a feast to his king, but to his guest. On the other hand, in his son Solomon, this lust did not pass on like a guest, but took possession of his kingdom. Holy Scripture has not kept silence about him, but has condemned him as a lover of women. The beginning of his reign glowed with his desire of wisdom. When he had obtained it through spiritual love, he lost it through carnal love. Although all or nearly all of the deeds which are recorded in the Old Testament must be regarded, therefore, not only in their literal sense, but figuratively as well, the reader should interpret as a symbol even those acts which he has taken literally, if those who have done them are praised, even though their actions differ from the custom of the good men who have kept the divine commands since the coming of our Lord. However, he should not carry that same action over to his own conduct, for there are many deeds which were performed in accordance with duty at that time, which can be performed now only through lust. On the other hand, when he reads of any sins of noble men, even though he can observe and verify in them some figures of future events, he may still apply the proper meaning of the action to this end, namely, that he will by no means venture to boast about his own virtuous deeds, nor because of his own uprightness, look down upon others as if they were sinners, when he sees in such noble men the storms of passions that must be shunned and the shipwrecks that must be lamented. The sins of those men have been written down for a reason, and that is that the following passage of the Apostle might be formidable everywhere. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There is practically no page of the holy books which does not cry out that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Part 5 We must discover first of all whether the expression which we are trying to understand is literal or figurative. When we have made certain that it is figurative, it is easy, by employing the rules concerning things which I explained in the first book, to reflect upon it under all its aspects until we reach the idea of truth, particularly when practice, invigorated by the observance of piety, is added to it. We can discover whether an expression is literal or figurative by considering the principles mentioned above. When the expression is seen to be figurative, the words of which it is composed will be discovered to be derived either from similar things or from those that are related by some affinity. But since things appear similar to each other in many ways, we should not imagine there is any precept that, because a thing has a certain analogical meaning in one place, it always has this meaning. For example, the Lord represented leaven in a condemnatory fashion when he said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And as an object of praise, when he said, The kingdom of heaven is like a woman who hid leaven in three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The rule for this diversity, therefore, has two forms. Anything that is a sign of one thing and then another is such that it signifies either things that are contrary or else things that are only different. They indicate contraries, for instance, when the same thing is expressed by way of analogy at one time in a good sense, and at another in a bad sense, like the leaven mentioned above. Another such instance is this. A lion signifies Christ in this passage. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed, but it signifies the devil in this other. 
Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking someone to devour. The serpent is depicted in a good sense, be wise as serpents, but also in a bad sense. The serpent seduced Eve by his guile. Bread is represented with a good meaning. I am the living bread that has come down from heaven, and with a bad one. Eat with pleasure the hidden bread. There are very many other examples like these. Those which I have mentioned are by no means uncertain in their meaning, for only clear passages ought to be mentioned by way of example. Yet there are some passages where there is uncertainty with respect to the meaning in which they ought to be understood. For example, In the hand of the Lord there is a cup of strong wine, full of mixture. It is doubtful whether this signifies the wrath of God, but not to the extreme penalty, that is, to the dregs, or whether it signifies the grace of the Scriptures passing from the Jews to the Gentiles, because the dregs thereof are not emptied. And we have an instance where the same thing is not expressed in a contrary, but only in a different sense. Water signifies people, as we read in the Apocalypse. It also signifies the Holy Ghost, as in this example. From within him there shall flow rivers of living water. Thus water is understood to signify one thing in one place, and another in another place, according to the passages in which it is mentioned. Similarly, other things are not single in their meaning, but each of them signifies not only two, but sometimes even many different things, according to its relation to the thought of the passage where it is found. Moreover, we must learn from passages in which they are expressed more plainly how we are to interpret them in obscure passages. The best way for us to have a clear understanding of this passage addressed to God, take hold of arms and shield and rise up to help me, is to read from that other passage, O Lord, thou hast crowned us as with a shield of thy good will. Yet we are not to understand that, wherever we read about a shield placed for some defense, we should interpret it only as the good will of God. For there is this passage, the shield of faith, with which you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the most wicked one. Again, for the same reason, we should not attribute faith to the shield alone, in speaking of spiritual armor like this, since in another passage the breastplate of faith is mentioned. Let us put on the breastplate of faith and charity, says the apostle. Besides, not only one, but perhaps two or more interpretations are understood from the same words of Scripture. And so even if the meaning of the writer is unknown, there is no danger, provided that it is possible to show from other passages of the Scriptures that any one of them is in accord with truth. A man who thoroughly examines the Holy Scriptures in an endeavor to find the purpose of the author, through whom the Holy Ghost brought Holy Scripture into being, whether he attains this goal, or whether he elicits from the words another meaning which is not opposed to the true faith, is free from blame if he has proof from some other passage of the Holy Scriptures. In fact, the author perhaps saw that very meaning too, in the same words which we are anxious to interpret. And certainly the Spirit of God who produced these words through him also foresaw that this very meaning would occur to the reader or listener. Further, he took care that it should occur to him because it also is based upon truth. For what could God have provided more generously and more abundantly in the Holy Scriptures than that the same words might be understood in several ways, which other supporting testimonies no less divine endorse? When such a meaning is elicited, that its uncertainty cannot be explained by the unerring testimonies of the Holy Scriptures, however, it remains for us to explain it by the proof of reason, even if the man whose words we are seeking to understand were perhaps unaware of that meaning. This, however, is a dangerous practice. It is much safer to walk by means of the Holy Scriptures. When we are trying to search out those passages that are obscured by figurative words, we may either start out from a passage which is not subject to dispute, or, if it is disputed, we may settle the question by employing the testimonies that have been discovered everywhere in the same Scripture. Furthermore, Learned men should know that our authors have used all the modes of expression which grammarians call by their Greek name tropes, and they have employed them in greater numbers and more eloquently than those who do not know these writers and have learned the figures in other works can suppose or believe. Yet those who know these tropes recognize them in the Holy Scriptures 
and the knowledge of them is a considerable aid in understanding the scriptures. But it is not proper for me at this point to teach them to the inexperienced, lest I should appear to be teaching grammar. To be sure, I suggest that they be learned apart from this work, although I have already given this advice above in the second book, when I discussed the necessary knowledge of languages. The letters from which grammar derives its name, the Greeks call letters grammata, are certainly the signs of sounds that relate to the articulate voice with which we speak. In the holy books there are seen not only examples of these tropes, just as of all figures, but even the names of some of them. For example, allegory, enigma, and parable. And yet almost all of these tropes which are said to be learned in the liberal arts are also discovered in the speech of those who have not studied under any grammarians, but are satisfied with the manner of speech which ordinary people use. For who does not say, So may you flourish? This trope is called a metaphor. Who does not speak of a fish pond even when it contains no fish and was not made for fish, but still it derives its name from fish? This trope is called a catechesis. It would be tedious to describe the others in this fashion. The speech of the common people employs even those which are more unusual because they mean the opposite of what they say. Examples are those called irony and antiphrasis. Irony shows by the inflection of the voice what it intends us to understand, as when we say to a man who is behaving badly, You are doing well. Antiphrasis, on the other hand, is not made to signify contrary meanings by an inflection of the voice, but uses its own words, whose origin is from the contrary, as when a grove is called lucus because it has a very little light, or when we say yes, even though on the contrary it would be no as when we are seeking what is not in a place and we receive the answer, there is plenty. Or, by adding words, we cause what we say to be understood in the contrary sense, as, beware of him, because he is a good man. What unlearned man does not use such expressions, and still is utterly unaware of the nature or the names of these tropes? A knowledge of them is necessary in explaining the obscurities of the scriptures, because, when the meaning is unreasonable, if understood in the literal signification of the words, we must, of course, try to find out whether it has been expressed in some figure or other which we do not know. And so many passages which were obscure have been interpreted. A certain Tychonius, although he was a Donatist, has written most convincingly against the Donatists, and appears in this matter to have had a very illogical mind, since he was unwilling to leave them altogether. He has written what he has called the Book of Rules, because in it he has outlined seven rules by which, as if they were keys, the obscurities of the Holy Scriptures may be unlocked. The first of these is about the Lord and his body. The second, about the two divisions of the Lord's body. The third, about the promises and the law. The fourth, about species and genus. The fifth, about times. The sixth, about recapitulation and the seventh about the devil and his body. Indeed, when these rules have been carefully examined as they are explained by him, they help greatly in penetrating the hidden meanings of the sacred scriptures. It is not possible, however, to learn by these rules all the things which have been written in such a way that they are not easy to understand. We must employ several other methods also. These he has been so far from including in this group of seven that he himself explains many obscurities and applies to them none of these rules of his, because there was no need of them, for nothing covered by them occurs there or is brought into question. For example, when he inquires how we are to interpret, in the Apocalypse of St. John, the seven angels of the churches to whom John is commanded to write, he reasons in various ways and reaches the conclusion that we are to understand that the angels themselves are the churches. In this very lengthy consideration he applies none of his rules, and, certainly, the matter investigated there is very obscure. Enough has been said by way of example. It would be too tedious and too difficult to assemble all the obscure passages in the canonical scriptures that do not demand any of these seven rules. Yet Tychonius, when he was recommending these as rules, assigned as much importance to them as if, 
By knowing them fully and applying them, we would be capable of understanding all the things which we have discovered expressed figuratively in the law, that is, in the holy books. He began this book with these words, In preference to all the subjects which recommend themselves to me, I considered it necessary to write a little book of rules, and, in a certain sense, to fashion keys and windows for the hidden places of the law. For there are certain mystical rules which gain access to the secret recesses of the whole law and make visible those treasures of truth which are invisible to many. If the theory of these rules is received as I have imparted it, without jealousy, every closed place will be opened, and everything obscure will be made clear, so that anyone traversing the boundless forest of prophecy will be prevented from going astray, if he is guided by these rules as by pathways of light. If he had said, For there are certain mystical rules which give access to some of the secret recesses of the law, or even which give access to the great secret recesses of the law, instead of saying, as he did, the secret recesses of the whole law, and if he had not said, Every closed place will be opened, but instead, many closed places will be opened, he would have spoken the truth without giving more importance than the facts required to such an elaborate and beneficial work as his, and would not have guided his reader and judge into a false hope. I thought that I ought to say this in order that the book may be read by students, because it is a very important aid toward understanding the scriptures, yet without hoping for more from it than it possesses. To be sure, we must read it prudently, not only because of certain human mistakes he has made in it, but especially because of the things he has said as a Donatist heretic. I shall now explain briefly what those seven rules teach or suggest. The first rule is about the Lord and his body. In this rule, we know that the title of head and body, that is, of Christ and the church, is sometimes made known to us as of one person. For the apostle did not tell the faithful without a purpose, then you are the offspring of Abraham, since there is but one offspring of Abraham, who is Christ. We are not to be at a loss when there is a change from head to body or from body to head, yet the subject is not changed from one and the same person. In the following, a single person is speaking. He hath placed a crown upon me as upon a bridegroom, and he hath adorned me as a bride with an ornament. Yet we must surely interpret which of these refers to the head and which to the body, that is, which to Christ and which to the church. The second rule is about the two divisions of the Lord's body. However, it should not have been designated this way, because what will not be with him forever is not in reality the body of the Lord. Tychonius should have said about the true and the mixed body of our Lord or the true and the pretended, or something else, because hypocrites should not be said to be with him even now, not to mention in eternity, even though they seem to be in his church. For this reason, that rule could have been entitled in such a way as to read, about the mixed church. The rule demands a watchful reader, when scripture, although it is at this moment speaking to or about other persons, seems as if it were speaking to or about those very persons to whom or about whom it was just now speaking, just as if both of them were one body because of their temporary mingling and participation in the sacraments. There is a passage in the Canticle of Canticles to which this observation applies. I am black but beautiful, as the tents of cedar, as the curtains of Solomon. The spouse did not say, I was black as the tents of cedar, and I am beautiful as the curtain of Solomon. She said she is both, because of the temporal union of the good and the bad fish within one net. The tents of cedar refer to Ishmael, who will not be heir with the son of the free woman. And so when God proclaimed concerning the good part, I will lead the blind into the way which they know not, and the paths which they know not they will tread, and I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight, these words I will carry out and I will not forsake them. He immediately says about the other part, which was mixed with evil. They are turned back. Others are meant by these words, yet, since they are now united in one body, 
he speaks as though referring to the very ones of whom he was speaking just before. They will not always be one body. Indeed, one of them is that servant mentioned in the gospel, whose master, when he comes, will cut him asunder and make him share the lot of the hypocrites. The third rule is about the promises and the law. It can otherwise be called On the Spirit and the Letter, the title I used when I wrote a book dealing with this subject. It can also be called About Grace and the Law. In my opinion, this is an important question in itself rather than a rule which should be used in solving questions. Because they did not understand this question, the Pelagians either established their heresy or at least strengthened it. Tychonius did good work in his discussion of this subject, but his treatment is incomplete. For in reference to faith and works, he said that works were given to us by God because of our faith which merited them, but that faith itself is so inherent in us that it is not a gift from God. He did not pay attention to the apostle, who said, Peace be to the brethren, and love and faith, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He had not become acquainted with this heresy which has originated in our times, and which has given us a great deal of trouble in defending against it the grace of God, which is through our Lord Jesus Christ. According to the Apostle, there must be factions so that those who are approved may be made manifest among you. This heresy has made us much more vigilant and painstaking in observing in the Holy Scriptures what was overlooked by Tychonius, who, since he had no enemy, was less observant and less troubled about the fact that even faith itself is the gift of him who has appointed to each one the measure of faith. In accordance with this thought, the Philippians were taught, For you have been given the favor on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Accordingly, who can doubt that both of these graces are the gift of God, if with faith and understanding he here learns that both have been given? There are many other evidences, too, which make this clear. I am not discussing this matter now, yet I have discussed it very often in one place or another. The fourth rule of Tychonius is about species and genus. So he designates it, intending that species be understood as the part and genus as the whole, of which what he terms species is a part. For example, each individual city is a part of the community of nations. He calls the city the species, and all the nations he terms the genus. In this discussion we do not have to make use of that exactness of distinction between these two which is insisted upon by the logicians, who discuss very profoundly the difference between a part and a species. The same reasoning applies when we find in the sacred scriptures anything of this kind that concerns not a single city, but a single province, tribe, or territory. For example, it is not only about Jerusalem or some city of the Gentiles, either Tyre, Babylon, or any one at all, that things are said in the Holy Scriptures which go beyond the boundary of that city and are more applicable to all the nations. Something may be said also about Judea, Egypt, Assyria, or some other nation in which there are very many cities, although the nation is still not the whole world but only part of it, which goes beyond the boundary of that nation and is more applicable to the whole world, of which it is a part or, as Tychonius puts it, to the genus of which it is a species. These words have come even to the attention of the common people, with the result that even the uneducated understand the particular and general regulations enunciated in any imperial edict. This also happens in regard to men. Thus, the things which are recorded of Solomon transcend his limitations, but become clear when they are applied instead to Christ or his church, of which Solomon is a part. We do not always go beyond the species. We often say things of such a nature that they are manifestly consistent with it as well as with something else, or perhaps apply only to it. When scripture, however, although it has been speaking uninterruptedly of species, changes from species to genus, the attention of the reader should be so directed as not to see in the species what he can find better and more accurately in the genus. Certainly, what the prophet Ezekiel said is easily understood. The house of Israel dwelt in the land, and defiled it by their own way and with their idols and with their sins. Their way was before my face like the uncleanness of a menstruous woman, and I poured out my wrath upon them 
and I scattered them among the nations and dispersed them through the countries. I have judged them according to their ways and according to their sins. It is easy, I repeat, to understand this of that house of Israel of which the apostle says, Behold Israel according to the flesh, because the carnal-minded people of Israel did and suffered all these things. The other passages which follow are also understood as referring to the same people. But when the prophet begins to say, And I will sanctify my great and holy name, which was profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in the midst of them, and the Gentiles will know that I am the Lord. The reader ought to be observant of the way in which he passes over the species and applies himself to the genus. For he goes on to say, When I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes, and I will take you from among the Gentiles, and will gather you together out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land, and I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be cleansed from all your idols, and I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in the midst of you, and I will cause you to walk in my commandments and to keep my judgments and to do them and you shall dwell in the land which I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I shall be your God, and I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness. We know that this was a prophecy of the New Testament, to which pertain not only the remains of that one nation of which the Apostle writes in another place, Though the number of the children of Israel is as the sands of the sea, the remnant shall be saved but also the other nations which were promised to their fathers, who are likewise our fathers. No one who contemplates it has any doubt that the bath of regeneration, which we now see given to all nations, is here promised. And the Apostle says, when he is praising the grace of the New Testament and its eminence compared with the Old, You are our letter, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but in the fleshy tablets of the heart. He looks back and sees that this has been derived from the passage in which the prophet says, And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. The prophet intended that the heart of flesh, which caused the apostle to say, the fleshy tablets of the heart, be distinguished from the stony heart by a sentient life, and by a sentient life he meant an intelligent life. So the spiritual Israel is composed not of one nation, but of all which were promised to our fathers in their offspring, who is Christ. Therefore this spiritual Israel is distinguished from that carnal Israel which consisted of one nation, by newness of grace and not by noble origin, by disposition of heart and not by nationality. However, The prophet's profound inspiration, while he is speaking of or to the carnal Israel, passes over to, without warning, the spiritual Israel. And although he is now speaking of or to the spiritual Israel, he still seems to be referring to the other, not because he grudges us an understanding of the scriptures as if he were our enemy, but because he disciplines our understanding as our physician. We should not take carnally as relating to the carnal Israel, but spiritually as relating to the spiritual Israel, that passage of the prophet, and I will bring you into your own land. And what he says a little later, as if repeating the same thing, and you shall dwell in the land which I gave to your fathers. Indeed, the church, without spot or wrinkle, gathered from all nations and destined to rule forever with Christ, is herself the land of the blessed, the land of the living, We should understand that it was given to our fathers when it was promised to them by the fixed and unchangeable will of God. What our fathers believed was to be given in its own time was already granted because of the steadfastness of the promise and intention. Just so, the apostle, in writing to Timothy of that grace which is granted to the saints, says, Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and the grace which was granted to us in Jesus Christ before this world existed, but is now manifested by the coming of our Savior. He speaks of the grace as given when those to whom it was to be given were not yet in existence, 
because, in the disposition and predestination of God, that which was to be given in its own time had already been accomplished, and he says that it is now manifested. It is quite possible that these words may be understood of the land of the world to come, when there will be a new heaven and a new earth, in which the wicked will not be able to live. The mink are rightly told that the land is theirs, because no part of it will belong to the wicked, for it was really given when the promise that it was to be given was made. A fifth rule was proposed by Tychonius, which he entitled, About Times. With this rule, intervals of time which are obscure in the Holy Scriptures may frequently be elucidated or surmised. Moreover, he remarks that this rule is observed in two ways, either by the figure called synecdoche or by legitimate numbers. By the figure of synecdoche, he wants us to discern the whole from a part or a part from the whole. For example, one evangelist says, after eight days, and another, after six days. In speaking of the occasion when on the mountain in the presence of only three disciples, the Lord's face shone as the sun and his garments became white as snow. What was said about the number of days could not be true for both, unless the one who said after eight days is interpreted as having counted as two whole days the last part of the day on which Christ foretold what would happen and the first part of the day on which he showed the consummation of the prophecy, while the evangelist who said after six days counted only the whole and completed days between. This mode of expression, which puts the part for the whole, also explains that disputed point about the resurrection of Christ. For unless the last part of the day on which he suffered is augmented by the preceding night and considered as a whole day, and unless the night in the last part of which he rose is augmented by the dawn of the Lord's day and counted as a whole day, we cannot account for the three days and three nights during which he foretold he would be in the heart of the earth. Now he terms as legitimate numbers those which Holy Scripture especially favors, such as seven, ten, twelve, or any others which those who are careful in reading learn readily. Now numbers of this kind frequently are placed for time as a whole. For example, seven times a day I will praise thee is only another way of saying, his praise shall be always in my mouth. They have just the same value when they are multiplied by ten as seventy and seven hundred. This is the reason why the seventy years mentioned in Jeremiah can be interpreted spiritually as the whole time during which the church is among strangers or they can be multiplied by themselves, as ten multiplied by ten equals one hundred, and twelve multiplied by twelve equals one hundred and forty-four. This last number signifies in the Apocalypse the entire multitude of saints. It is clear from this that it is not questions of time alone that are to be explained by these numbers, but that their meanings can be applied rather extensively and can touch upon many matters, for that number in the Apocalypse relates not to times, but to men. Tychonius calls his sixth rule the recapitulation, found by diligent research in the obscurity of the scriptures. Some things are related in such a way that they seem to be following the order of time or occurring in chronological succession, when actually the narrative, without mentioning it, refers to previous events which had been left unmentioned. Unless we come to this understanding from this rule, we shall fall into error. For example, we find in Genesis, And the Lord God had planted a paradise of pleasure in Eden toward the east, wherein he placed man whom he had formed. And God brought forth of the ground all manner of trees fair to behold and pleasant to eat of. This last mentioned event would seem to have occurred after God had made man and placed him in paradise, although after both of these facts have been mentioned briefly, that is, that God planted a paradise and there placed man whom he had formed, the narrative turns back by means of recapitulation and relates what had been previously omitted, namely, how paradise had been planted and that God brought forth of the ground all manner of trees fair to behold and pleasant to eat of. Then the following passage is added, the tree of life also in the midst of paradise and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then is mentioned the river by which paradise is watered, and which is divided into four heads of four streams, all of which relates to the arrangement of paradise. When the writer had finished this, 
he repeated the statement he had already made, of what in reality followed the events just related, saying, And the Lord God took man whom he had made, and put him in paradise, and so forth. For man, as the order of the narrative itself now indicates, was placed there after these things had been done, those things not having been done after man had been created, as what was first said could be understood to mean if the recapitulation, by which we are referred to what had been omitted, were not carefully understood. In the same book, too, when the generations of the sons of Noah are recalled to our minds, we read, These are the children of Ham, in their tribes according to their tongues, in their lands and nations. Also, in enumerating the sons of Shem, it is said, These are the children of Shem in their tribes according to their tongues, in their lands and nations. And this is added in reference to all of them. These are the tribes of the sons of Noah, according to their generations and according to their nations. From these were the islands of the nations scattered over the earth after the flood, and the whole earth was one tongue, and there was one speech for all. And so, because this sentence was added, and the earth was one tongue and there was one speech for all, that is, one language for them all, it could be inferred that at that time, when men had been scattered according to the islands of the nations over the earth, there was one language common to all of them. Without a doubt, this contradicts the words used above, according to their tribes and tongues. For each single tribe which had formed individual nations would not be said to have had its own tongue, when there was a common one for all. So it is by way of recapitulation that there is added, And the earth was one tongue, and there was one speech for all. The narrative, without mentioning it, goes back to tell how it came about that the one language common to all men was broken up into many tongues. And immediately we are told about the building of the tower, when this punishment for their pride was inflicted upon them by the divine judgment. After this event, they were scattered over the earth according to their languages. Such recapitulation may become even more obscure, as when the Lord says in the Gospel, On the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire from heaven and destroyed them all. The day on which the Son of Man is revealed will be like this day. In that hour, let him who is on the housetop and his goods in the house not go down to take them away. And likewise let him who is in the field not turn back, let him remember Lot's wife. Is it after the Lord has been revealed that we are to observe these commands that no one is to look back, that is, seek after the past life which he has renounced? Should we not rather observe them at this time, so that, when the Lord has been revealed, we may each find a recompense for the commands we have kept and the prohibitions we have obeyed? But because it is written, In that hour, it might be thought that those commandments are to be kept when the Lord has been revealed, unless the reader's mind is intent on understanding the recapitulation with the aid of another passage of Scripture. This, spoken even at the time of the apostles themselves, declares, Children, it is the last hour. Therefore, the very time at which the gospel is preached, until the time when the Lord will be revealed, is the hour in which we must observe these commandments, because the Lord's revelation itself pertains to that same hour which will be ended by the day of judgment. The seventh and last rule of Tychonius is about the devil and his body. He himself is the head of the wicked, who are, in a certain sense, his body, and who are to go with him into the punishment of eternal fire. Just as Christ is the head of the church, which is his body, and will be with him in his kingdom and everlasting glory. In the first rule, which he calls, About our Lord and his body, when scripture speaks of one and the same person, we must be alert to understand what pertains to the head and what to the body. Just so, in this last rule, what is said about the devil can be observed in his body rather than in him. This body consists not only of those who are very plainly outside, but even of those who, although they belong to him, are still mingled with the church for the time being, until they depart individually from this life, or until the chaff is separated from the wheat by the final winnowing fan. This was written in Isaiah. How is he fallen from heaven? 
Lucifer who did rise in the morning. And the other passages which, under the figure of the king of Babylon, were spoken in the same context about the same person or to the same person and are certainly to be understood of the devil. Yet the statement in the passage, He is crushed upon the earth who sends to all nations, does not entirely apply to the head. Although the devil sends his angels to all nations, yet it is his body and not himself that is crushed upon the earth, except that he himself is in his body which is crushed, like dust which the wind driveth from the face of the earth. Now all these rules, except the one which is called about the promises and the law, cause one thing to be understood from another, which is characteristic of the figurative mode of expression. This subject, in my opinion, is too extensive to be understood completely by anyone. Wherever we say one thing, intending another to be understood, we have a figurative expression, even though the name of that trope is not discovered in a textbook of rhetoric. When this occurs in a customary place, the intellect perceives it without any trouble, but when it occurs in an unusual place, we must exert ourselves to understand it, either more or less, according to the greater or less gifts of God, in the matter of human talents or the helps that are given. Accordingly, in literal words, which I discussed above, things are to be understood as they are said. But in figurative words, which cause figurative expressions, one thing is to be understood from another, and I have dealt with these matters as far as seemed sufficient. Students of these revered writings should be advised not only to learn the kinds of expressions in the Holy Scriptures, to notice carefully how they are customarily expressed there, and to remember them, but also to pray that they may understand them. And this is chiefly and especially necessary. Indeed, in these books which they are studying earnestly, they read that the Lord giveth wisdom, and out of his mouth cometh prudence and knowledge. It is from him that they have received that zeal for study, if it is endowed with piety. But these things are enough to say about signs, so far as words are concerned. It remains for me to discuss in the following book, whatever the Lord vouchsafes to me about the methods of making known our thoughts. Part 6 According to the plan adopted at the outset, I divided this work of mine, which is entitled Christian Instruction, into two parts. After the introduction, in which I replied to those who would have censured it, I said, The entire treatment of the scriptures is based upon two factors, the method of discovering what we are to understand, and the method of teaching what has been understood. I shall discuss first the method of discovery, and then the method of teaching. Therefore, since the method of ascertaining the meaning has been discussed at length in the first three books, with the help of the Lord I shall confine what I have to say about the method of teaching to one book, if possible, thus completing this entire work in four books. And so, at the outset, in this preamble, I am restraining the hope of such readers as, perhaps, believe that I intend to present the rhetorical rules which I learned and taught in the secular schools. I admonish them not to expect these from me, not because they have no utility, but because, should they have any, they must be learned somewhere else, if perhaps some good man has leisure to learn them. However, they should neither in this work nor in any other be demanded of me. Since persuasion both to truths and falsehoods is urged by means of the art of rhetoric, who would venture to say that truth, in the person of its defenders, ought to stand its ground unarmed against falsehood, so that those who are trying to convince us of falsehoods should know how to induce their listeners to be favorably inclined, attentive, and docile by means of their preface, while the defenders of truth do not know how to do this? Should the former proclaim their falsehoods briefly, explicitly, and plausibly, while the latter tell the truth in such a way that it is tedious to listen to, difficult to understand, and, finally, disagreeable to believe? Should the former attack truth and defend falsehood with specious arguments, and the latter be unable either to vindicate truth or disprove falsehood? Should the former, 
influencing and urging the minds of their listeners to error by their eloquence, terrify, sadden, gladden, and passionately encourage them, while the latter, indifferent and cold in behalf of truth, sleep on? Who is so foolish as to claim this? The power of eloquence, so very effective in convincing us of either wrong or right, lies open to all. Why then do not the good zealously procure it, that it may serve truth, if the wicked, in order to gain unjustifiable and groundless cases, apply it to the advantages of injustice and error? The skillful use of language, rich in vocabulary and rhetorical ornament, is guided by the rules and principles of eloquence and oratory. Those who can learn quickly should master those rules apart from these writings of mine at a proper and fitting age when a suitable time has been set apart for this purpose. For even the masters of Roman eloquence themselves did not hesitate to say that, unless a person could master this art quickly, he could never master it at all. Why question the truth of this statement? Even if these principles could finally be learned sometime by those who are rather slow of apprehension, I do not regard them as being so important that I would be willing to have men devote their adult or even their advanced years to learning them. It is sufficient for them to claim the attention of young men, and not even of all those whom we wish trained for the service of the church, but only of those who have not yet become engrossed in a more pressing interest, which undoubtedly should be preferred to this study. Eloquence grows upon those who read and listen eagerly and intelligently to the eloquent more easily than upon those who strive merely to imitate the rules for eloquence. Even outside the canon, which is established for our benefit on the rock of authority, there is no lack of ecclesiastical writings. By reading these, a talented man in the course of his reflections is imbued with the eloquence with which they are expressed, even though he does not strive for this, but is intent only upon the subjects there described. This is especially true if he joins to his reading a practice in writing, dictating, and finally even in expressing what he thinks, according to the rule of piety and faith. However, if such natural ability is lacking, those principles of rhetoric are either not understood, or if, after being inculcated with great pains, they are understood to some small degree, they are of no benefit. Even those who have learned these rules and speak fluently and elegantly cannot all reflect upon them when they are speaking in order to express themselves according to those rules, if they are not speaking about the rules themselves. On the contrary, it is my opinion that there are hardly any of them who could do both things, speak well and, in order to do this, reflect upon the rules of rhetoric while they are speaking. For we must be careful that what we ought to say does not escape our minds while we are intent upon saying it according to theory. Yet in the speeches and utterances of eloquent men, the rules of eloquence are found to have been fulfilled, although those men did not think of them in order to speak well or while they were speaking, whether they had learned them or whether they had not even come in contact with them. In fact, they observe them because they are eloquent. They do not employ them in order to be eloquent. Therefore, since the infant learns to talk only by learning the expressions of those who can talk, why can they not become eloquent without being taught rules of oratory, but simply by reading and listening to the eloquence of orators and imitating them as much as possible? Do we not find this happening in actual cases? I know of many men who are more eloquent without the rules of rhetoric than many who have learned them but I know of no one who has become eloquent without reading and listening to the speeches and discourses of eloquent speakers. Children would not need the art of grammar from which they learn to speak correctly if they were permitted to grow up and live among men who spoke correctly. In fact, without knowing any of the names of errors, they would hear whatever was incorrect in the discourse of any speaker and, in accordance with their own correct usage, would criticize and avoid it just as city people, even those who are illiterate, criticize country people. Therefore it is an obligation of the commentator and teacher of the sacred scriptures, the defender of the true faith and the conqueror of error, both to teach right and to correct wrong. Accordingly, this work of speaking obliges him to win over opponents, to arouse the negligent, and to inform the ignorant of what is happening now and of what they should look for, 
But when he has found his listeners favorably inclined, attentive, and docile, or has himself caused them to be so, he must proceed with the other points as the case requires. If those who listen to him are in need of instruction, the subject under discussion must be made clear by exposition, on condition, however, that there is need of it. However, to settle doubtful points, he must reason them out through the use of proofs. On the other hand, if his listeners need to be roused rather than instructed, that they may not be careless in observing what they already know and may give their consent to the things which they admit are true, there is need for greater powers of oratory. In that case, entreaty and reproof, exhortation and rebuke, and all other means designed to arouse hearts are indispensable. In fact, very few men, when they employ eloquence, fail to observe all these things I have mentioned. Since some use these principles bluntly, dully, and with poor taste, and others employ them intelligently, gracefully, and forcibly, this work about which I am speaking should be undertaken by a man who can argue and speak with wisdom, even though he cannot speak eloquently. It is his wisdom which benefits his hearers, although he himself is less useful than he would be if he were an eloquent speaker also. But the one to guard against is the man whose eloquence is no more than an abundant flow of empty words. His listener is more easily charmed by him in matters that are unprofitable to hear about, and all too frequently such eloquence is mistaken for truth. Moreover, this opinion did not escape the notice of those who believed that the art of rhetoric should be taught. They acknowledged that wisdom without eloquence is of small benefit to states, but eloquence without wisdom is frequently very prejudicial and never beneficial. Those who have propounded the rules of eloquence have been compelled by the force of truth to admit this in the very books in which they treat of eloquence, unaware as they were of the true, that is, of the heavenly wisdom which has come down from the Father of lights. How much more, consequently, ought we, who are the children and ministers of this wisdom, to be influenced by no other view? Furthermore, a man speaks more or less wisely in proportion as he has made more or less progress in the Holy Scriptures. I do not mean in the extensive reading and memorizing of them, but in a thorough understanding and careful searching into their meanings. Some men there are who read them, but pay no attention to them. They read in order to remember, but they are indifferent about understanding. Undoubtedly, we must greatly prefer to these men those who have less grasp of their words, but see with the eyes of their heart the soul of Scripture. But better than either of these is the man who, when he wishes, both cites Scripture and understands it as he should. Therefore, it is particularly essential for the man who should say with wisdom even what he cannot say eloquently to remember the words of the Scriptures. For the poorer he sees himself to be in his own speech, the more he should enrich himself with that of the Scriptures, so that he may prove from them what he says in his own words, and, although inferior in his own words, he may rise in distinction, as it were, by the testimony of the great. His proofs give pleasure where his manner of speaking does not. Besides, if anyone is desirous of speaking not only wisely, but also eloquently, since he will be of much more use if he can do both, he ought to be advised to read and hear eloquent men and to imitate them through practice, rather than to devote himself to the teachers of the art of rhetoric. Those whom he reads and listens to, of course, are to be such as have been justly recommended as having spoken, or as now speaking, not only with eloquence but also with wisdom. Those who speak eloquently are listened to with delight. Those who speak wisely are listened to with profit. For this reason, Scripture does not say, the multitude of the eloquent, but the multitude of the wise is the welfare of the whole world. Just as we must often take bitter things that are conducive to health, so we must always avoid a sweetness that is harmful. What is better than a wholesome sweetness or a sweet wholesomeness? The more sweetness is desired, the more easily is the wholesomeness beneficial. Accordingly, there are ecclesiastical writers who have handled Holy Scripture not only with wisdom, but also with eloquence. For the reading of these, 
There is not sufficient time for students and those at leisure to be able to exhaust them. At this point, perhaps, someone may ask whether our authors, whose divinely inspired writings have formed the canon with an authority that is very beneficial for us, are only wise, or whether they should be designated as eloquent also. Certainly for myself and for those who agree with me in what I maintain, this question is very readily answered. For when I understand them, it seems to me that not only could no one be wiser, but also that no one could be more eloquent than they are. And I venture to maintain that all who understand correctly what those writers are saying understand at the same time that they should not have said it any other way. A certain kind of eloquence is more fitting for youth, and another is more becoming for old age. So much so, that we should not call it eloquence if it is not appropriate for the person of the speaker. There is a kind of eloquence, then, which is becoming for men eminently worthy of the highest authority and manifestly inspired by God. Biblical writers have spoken with this kind of eloquence. No other kind becomes them, nor is that kind suitable for other writers. It is appropriate for them, and the more humble it seems to be, the higher it rises above others, not because of its conceit, but because of its solidity. On the other hand, when I do not understand them, to be sure their eloquence is less evident to me, yet I do not doubt that it is of the same quality as it is when I do understand. Further, the obscurity of the sacred and saving utterances had to be a component of that kind of eloquence whose purpose was to benefit our intellects, not only through their discovery of truth, but also through their own application. Still, if there were time, I could point out to those who set their own language ahead of that of our writers, not because of its greatness but because of its extravagance, that all the qualities and oratorical ornaments they boast about are found in the sacred writings of those whom divine providence has provided to instruct us and lead us from this wicked world to the blessed one. It is not what these men have in common with pagan orators and poets that gives me more pleasure in that eloquence than I can say. I feel greater admiration and surprise because they have used our eloquence in a way which is all their own, so that it is neither lacking nor ostentatious in them. It was not right for them either to condemn eloquence nor to make a display of it. The former would have happened if they had avoided it, and the latter could have been believed of them if they had made their eloquence easily recognizable. And in those places where it happens to be recognized by the learned, such matters are being discussed that the words by which they are expressed seem not to have been sought after by the speaker, but to have been associated naturally with those very matters, as if you were to understand wisdom as going out of her home, that is, the heart of the wise man, and eloquence like an inseparable servant following her even though unbidden. Who would not see what the apostle was trying to say, and how wisely he spoke, when he said, we exult in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works out endurance, and endurance, tried virtue, and tried virtue, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the charity of God is poured forth in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Here, if anyone unlearnedly learned, if I may use the expression, were to argue that the apostle had followed the rules of the art of rhetoric, would he not be laughed at by both learned and unlearned Christians? Nevertheless, we recognize in this passage the figure which is called climax in Greek, and gradatio in Latin by some, when words or thoughts are joined together, one proceeding from another. Here, for example, we see endurance proceeding from tribulation, tried virtue from endurance, and hope from tried virtue. Here, too, we perceive another ornament of style. After certain statements completed in a single tone of expression, which our writers call membra and kaisa, clauses and phrases, while the Greeks call them kola and komata, there follows a rounded sentence, or period, which the Greeks call periodos, whose membra are held suspended by the voice of the speaker until it is completed by the last one. The first membrum of those preceding the period is, since tribulation works out endurance. The second is, 
and endurance tried virtue, and the third is, and tried virtue, hope. Then follows the period itself, which is completed in three membra. The first of these is, and hope does not disappoint. The second is, because the charity of God is poured forth in our hearts. And the third is, by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. These things and others like them are taught in the art of rhetoric. Therefore, just as I do not maintain that the apostle followed the rules of rhetoric, so I do not deny that eloquence followed his wisdom. Writing in his second epistle to the Corinthians, he contradicts certain false apostles among the Jews who were disparaging him, since he is forced to speak of himself, as if attributing this folly to himself how wisely and how eloquently he speaks. He is the companion of wisdom and the leader of eloquence. The former he follows, for the latter he leads the way, not spurning it, however, when it chooses to follow him. He says, I repeat, let no one think me foolish. But if so, then regard me as such, that I also may boast a little. What I am saying in this confidence of boasting, I am not speaking according to the Lord, but, as it were, in foolishness. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. For you gladly put up with fools, because you are wise yourselves. For you suffer it if a man enslaves you, if a man devours you, if a man takes from you, if a man is arrogant, if a man slaps your face. I speak to my own shame, as though we had been weak. But wherein any man is bold, I am speaking foolishly. I also am bold. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I, to speak as a fool, am more. In many more labors, in prisons more frequently, in lashes above measure, often exposed to death. From the Jews five times I received forty lashes less one. Thrice I was scourged, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I was adrift on the sea. In journeyings often, in perils from floods, in perils from robbers, in perils from my own nation, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils from false brethren, in labor and hardships, in many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those outer things, there is my daily pressing anxiety, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I am not inflamed? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that concern my weakness. Attentive souls can see how much wisdom is in these words. Even one who is deep in sleep can observe also with what a noble flow of eloquence they rush on. Further, anyone who has learned about them observes that, inserted with the most suitable variety, those kaisa, called komata by the Greeks, and the membra and periods of which I spoke a little while ago, created the whole figure and expression, so to speak, of a style which charms and arouses even the unlearned. From the place where I began to introduce this passage, there are periods. The first is the smallest, that is, it has two membra. Periods cannot have less than two membra, although they may have more. The first, then, is, I repeat, let no one think me foolish. The second follows with three membra. But if so, then regard me as such, that I also may boast a little. The third, which comes next, has four membra. What I am saying, in this confidence of boasting, I am not speaking according to the Lord, but, as it were, in foolishness. The fourth has two. Since many boast according to the flesh, I too will boast. The fifth has two. For you gladly put up with fools, because you are wise yourselves. The sixth also has two. For you suffer it if a man enslaves you. 
Three kaisa follow. If a man devours you, if a man takes from you, if a man is arrogant, then come three membra. If a man slaps your face, I speak to my own shame, as though we had been weak. A period of three membra follows. But wherein any man is bold, I am speaking foolishly. I also am bold. From this point on, after several kaisa have been proposed as questions, so separate kaisa are given back in answer. Three answers to three questions. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Although the fourth kaisum has been expressed with the same interrogation, he does not reply with the balance of another kaisum, but of a membrum. Are they ministers of Christ? I, to speak as a fool, am more. Then after the form of interrogation has been properly set aside, the four following kaisa are poured forth. In many more labors, in prisons more frequently, in lashes above measure often exposed to death. A short period is then inserted, because by the elevation of our voice we must distinguish from the Jews five times, making it one membrum to which is joined the other, I received forty lashes less one. Then he returns to Kaisa and uses three. Thrice I was scourged, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A membrum follows, a night and a day I was adrift on the sea. Then fourteen Kaisa flow forth with appropriate vigor, in journeyings often, in perils from floods, in perils from robbers, in perils from my own nation, in perils from the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils from false brethren, in labor and hardships, in many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. After these he inserts a period of three membra. Besides those outer things, there is my daily pressing anxiety, the care of all the churches. And to this we join two membra as a question. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to stumble, and I am not inflamed? Finally, this whole passage, as if panting for breath, is completed by a period of two membra. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that concern my weakness. After this outburst, because he rests, as it were, and makes his hearer rest by inserting a little narrative, it is impossible to describe adequately what beauty and what charm he produces. For he continues by saying, The God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who is blessed forevermore, knows that I do not lie. And then he tells briefly how he has been exposed to danger and how he escaped. It would be tedious to recount other examples or to indicate these in other passages of the Holy Scriptures. What if I had tried to point out also the figures of speech which are taught in the art of rhetoric and are present in those passages at least which I have quoted from the Apostle's eloquence? Is it not true that thoughtful men would more readily have believed that I am going to excess rather than any students who have felt that I was meeting their needs? When all these principles are taught by masters, they are considered of great value, are purchased at a high price, and are sold with considerable display. I myself have a dread of being tainted by that ostentation while I am discussing these matters in this way. However, I must give an answer to the ill-informed men who believe that our authors should be despised not because they do not possess, but because they do not make a display of the eloquence which those others value too highly. Someone might think that I have selected the Apostle Paul as if he were our one eloquent speaker. For when he said, Even though rude in speech, but not in knowledge, it seems as if he spoke by way of concession to his detractors, not as if he were recognizing it as true by acknowledging it. On the other hand, if he had said, Indeed rude in speech, but not in knowledge, nothing else could possibly be understood. He did not hesitate to declare his knowledge openly, because without it he would not have been able to be the teacher of the Gentiles. Surely, if we quote any utterance of his as a model of eloquence, 
we certainly quote from those epistles which even his detractors, who were anxious that his spoken word be considered of no consequence, had to acknowledge were weighty in telling. Consequently, I see that I must say something about the eloquence of the prophets, where many points are kept hidden through a figurative manner of speaking. The more these seem to be concealed by figurative words, the more delightful they become when they have been explained. At this point I should quote something of such a nature that I shall not be compelled to explain what has been said, but only to praise the manner in which it was said. In preference to all others I shall select this from the book of the prophet who says that he was a shepherd or herdsman, and was withdrawn from that occupation by divine providence and sent to prophesy to the people of God. Nor shall my example be according to the Septuagint translators, who, translating also under the guidance of the Holy Ghost, seem to have altered some passages so that the attention of the reader might be more encouraged to investigate thoroughly the spiritual meaning. For this reason, several passages of theirs are even more obscure because they are more figurative. I shall use instead these passages as they have been translated from Hebrew to the Latin language by the priest Jerome, a skilled interpreter of both languages. When, then, he was reproving the wicked, the proud, the voluptuous, and those who were very careless about fraternal charity, this peasant, or this one-time peasant turned prophet, exclaimed, Woe to you that are wealthy in Zion, and to you that have confidence in the mountain of Samaria, ye great men, heads of the people, that go in with state into the house of Israel. Pass ye over to Calneh, and see, and go from thence into Hamath the great, and go down into Gath of the Philistines, and to all the best kingdoms of these, if their border be larger than your border. You that are separated unto the evil day, and that approach to the throne of iniquity, you that sleep upon beds of ivory, and are wanton on your couches, that eat the lamb out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the herd, you that sing to the sound of the psaltery, they have thought themselves to have instruments of music like David, that drink wine in bulls and anoint themselves with the best ointment, and they were not concerned for the affliction of Joseph. Would those men who, as if they themselves were learned and eloquent, despise our prophets as illiterate and unskilled in speaking, would they have wished to express themselves otherwise if they had been obliged to say something like this to such people, those of them at least who would not have wanted to act like madmen? What more could discriminating listeners desire from this eloquence? At first, with what a roar the invective itself is hurled as against senses steeped in sleep in order to arouse them. Woe to you that are wealthy in Zion, and to you that have confidence in the mountain of Samaria, ye great men, heads of the people, that go in with state into the house of Israel. In order to show that they are ungrateful for the gifts of God, who has given them the spacious expanses of their kingdom, in that they put their trust in the mountain of Samaria, where idols are worshipped, the prophet then says, Pass ye over to Calneh, and see, and go from thence into Hamath the great, and go down into Gath of the Philistines, and to all the best kingdoms of these, if their border be larger than your border. Even at the same time that he says these words, his discourse is adorned as if by lights with the names of such places as Zion, Samaria, Calneh, Hamath the Great, and Gath of the Philistines. Then the words used in these places are very appropriately varied. You are wealthy, you have confidence, pass ye over, go, and go down. Next he announces that a future captivity under a hostile king is approaching when he adds, you that are separated unto the evil day, and that approach to the throne of iniquity. Then the evils of luxury are brought to mind. You that sleep upon beds of ivory and are wanton on your couches, that eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the herd. Those six membra formed three periods of two membra each. He does not say, You that are separated unto the evil day, that approach to the throne of iniquity, that sleep upon beds of ivory, that are wanton on your couches, that eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the herd. 
If he had expressed it this way, so that each of the six membra began with the same pronoun repeated each time, and so that each one was ended by the tone of the voice, it would certainly have been beautiful. But it has become more beautiful because the membra were joined in pairs to the same pronoun, and these developed three sentences. One, a prediction of the captivity. You that are separated unto the evil day, and that approach to the throne of iniquity. The second, pertaining to lust. You that sleep upon beds of ivory, and are wanton on your couches. And the third, concerning gluttony. That eat the lamb out of the flock, and the calves out of the midst of the herd. The result is that it is left to the inclination of the speaker whether he will finish each one separately and make six membra, or whether he will raise his voice at the first, third, and fifth, and by linking the second to the first, the fourth to the third, and the sixth to the fifth, very properly create three periods of two membra each, one to tell of impending disaster, the other to denounce impurity, and the third to censure intemperance. Next he rebukes their immoderate pleasure in the sense of hearing. When he had said, You that sing to the sound of the psaltery, since music can be used with wisdom by those who are wise, he checks the vehemence of his invective with admirable beauty of style, speaking now not to them, but about them, to impress upon us that we should discriminate between the music of the wise man and the music of the voluptuous man. He does not say, You that sing to the sound of the psaltery and think you have instruments of music like David. But when he had said to the licentious what they should hear, You that sing to the sound of the psaltery, he pointed out their ignorance to others, adding, They have thought themselves to have instruments of music like David that drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the best ointment. These three are pronounced more correctly if the voice is kept raised for the first two membra and the period is completed with the third. The following is now added to all the former passages, and they were not concerned for the affliction of Joseph. Whether it is pronounced continuously to form one membrum, or it is more appropriate to keep the voice raised for and they were not concerned, and, after this separation, say, for the affliction of Joseph, to form a period of two membra. In any case, he did not say, they were not concerned for the affliction of their brother, but with wondrous beauty used the word Joseph instead of brother. In this way, every brother is signified by the proper name of the man whose renown among his brothers is celebrated both for the wrongs which he suffered and for the benefits which he paid in return. In fact, I do not know whether that figure by which Joseph is taken to mean every possible brother is taught by the art of rhetoric which I have learned and taught, but it is pointless to tell anyone who does not realize it himself how beautiful it is and how it influences those who read with understanding. Indeed, many points which apply to the rules of eloquence can be discovered in this very passage which I have used as an example. A sincere reader is not so much instructed when he carefully analyzes it, as he is set on fire when he recites it with glowing feeling. For not by human effort were these words devised. They have been poured forth from the mind of God, both wisely and eloquently, so that wisdom was not bent upon eloquence, nor did eloquence separate itself from wisdom. As some very eloquent and intelligent men could observe and maintain, if those principles which are learned in the art of oratory could not be respected, observed, and brought to these teachings, unless they were first discovered in the natural ability of orators, is it any wonder that they are discovered in those men sent by him who creates natural abilities? Therefore let us admit that our canonical writers and teachers were not only wise, but truly eloquent, with such an eloquence as was appropriate for persons of this kind. Although we take several examples of expression from their writings which are understood without difficulty, we should by no means imagine that we should imitate them entirely. They have uttered some passages with a beneficial and salutary obscurity, to exercise and, in a sense, to polish the minds of their readers, to break down aversions and spur on the zeal of those who are anxious to learn, as well as to conceal the meaning from the minds of the wicked, either that they may be converted to righteousness or excluded from its secrets. In fact, they spoke in such a way that their followers who understood and interpreted them correctly found another mark of favor in the church of God, 
unequal to theirs to be sure, but still closely approaching it. Their interpreters, then, should not speak with the similar authority, as if they are proposing themselves for interpretation, but in all their words their first and greatest endeavor should be to make themselves understood as much as possible by clearness of style. In this way, either the person who does not understand is very stupid, or the reason why what we say is not understood, or is understood rather slowly, lies not in our manner of speaking, but in the difficulty and subtlety of the matters which we are trying to explain and make clear. There are some passages which are not understood in their proper force, or are understood with difficulty, no matter how great, how comprehensive, or how clear the eloquence with which they are handled by the speaker. These should be spoken to a public audience only rarely, if there is some urgent reason, or never at all. However, some books are written in such a way that, when understood, they bind the reader to themselves, as it were, but, when not understood, they are annoying to those who do not care to read them. In familiar conversations with any person, we must not neglect this duty of bringing the truths which we have now perceived, although they are very hard to understand, to the knowledge of others. We should do this, no matter how much labor of reasoning is entailed, provided that our listener or partner in conversation has a desire to learn and does not lack the comprehension which can grasp the truth in whatever way it is made known. As for the teacher, he is not to be anxious about how much eloquence he employs in teaching, but about how clear he is. Sometimes an assiduous striving after this clearness disregards the more elegant expressions and is not concerned about what sounds well, but only about what reveals and makes known satisfactorily what one is endeavoring to express. For this reason, a certain author, discussing this type of speaking, says that there is a kind of careful negligence in it. This takes away ornaments, but does not produce vulgarities of speech. However, good teachers have, or ought to have, such great care in teaching that, where a word cannot be pure Latin without being obscure or ambiguous, they should use it according to the idiomatic usage, if it avoids ambiguity and obscurity. They should employ it not as it is used by the learned, but rather as the unlearned usually express it. Our translators were not reluctant to say, Non congregabo conventicula eorum de sanguinibus, I will not gather together their meetings for blood offerings, since they felt that it aided the thought to use here in the plural this noun, sanguinibus, which is used only in the singular in the Latin language. Why then should a teacher of religion, speaking to ignorant people, be reluctant to say osum instead of os, if he fears that os might be understood not as the singular of osa, bones, but as the singular of aura, mouths, African ears not distinguishing between the long and short sound of vowels? What benefit is a purity of speech, which the understanding of the hearer does not follow, since there is no reason at all for speaking if those for whose enlightenment we are speaking do not understand what we are saying? Therefore the teacher will avoid all expressions which do not instruct. If he can employ other correct and intelligible words instead of them, he will do better to choose them. If he cannot do this, either because they do not exist or because they do not occur to him at the time, he will even use words that are less correct, provided that the subject itself is taught and learned correctly. Certainly, in order that we may be understood, this point must be insisted upon, not only in familiar conversations, whether with one person or with several, but even much more when a sermon is being delivered before throngs of people. In familiar conversations, each one has the opportunity to ask questions, but when all are silent to hear one person and are looking at him attentively, it is neither customary nor fitting for anyone to ask a question about what he does not understand. The speaker should be especially watchful, therefore, to assist those who are silent, for a crowd that is eager to learn usually indicates by its movement whether it understands, and, until it shows this, he must keep going over what he is discussing with a manifold diversity of expression. Those who are delivering what they have previously prepared and memorized word for word cannot do this. However, as soon as the speaker makes himself understood, he should either end his discussion or pass over to other matters. 
For just as a speaker is pleasing when he makes clear things that should be learned, so he is irksome when he keeps emphasizing facts that are already known, at least to those whose whole expectation was depending upon the explanation of the obscurity of those passages which are being discussed. In order to give pleasure, even things that are known are discussed when attention is centered not on the things themselves, but on the manner in which they are handled. Yet if even this manner is already known, but still pleases its hearers, it makes almost no difference whether the man who is talking is a speaker or a reader. Things that have been attractively written are usually not only read with pleasure by those who are learning about them for the first time, but are even re-read with pleasure by those who know them very well already and from whose memory forgetfulness has not yet defaced them. At any rate, both of these classes listen to them willingly. Further, a person is taught whatever he has forgotten when he is reminded of it. I am not speaking now about the manner of pleasing. I am speaking about the way in which those who are anxious to learn should be taught. And the best way is the one that causes the listener to hear the truth and to understand what he hears. When the discussion has attained this end, no further effort has to be spent on the matter itself, as if it required further explanation, but perhaps we may have to take pains about praising it so that it may become firmly implanted in the heart. If this seems the right thing to do, it should be done so discreetly that it does not lead to tedium. This eloquence in teaching consists, certainly, not in having our speaking cause a person to like what was distasteful or to do what he was reluctant to do, but in causing what was obscure to become clear. Yet if this is accomplished without elegance, its benefit certainly reaches a few very zealous students who are anxious to know what they should learn, although it is being expressed improperly and crudely. When they have obtained this, they feast upon truth itself with delight. It is an outstanding quality of noble minds to love the truth in words and not the words themselves. Of what use is a golden key if it is unable to open what we desire? Or what objection is there to a wooden one if it can? We are asking only that what is closed be opened. But since eating and learning have some similarity to each other, even the very food without which we cannot live must be seasoned to satisfy the tastes of the majority. Accordingly, a certain orator has said, and said truly, that an eloquent man should speak in such a way that he teaches, pleases, and persuades. Then he added, To teach is a necessity, to please is a satisfaction, and to persuade is a triumph. Of these three, the one mentioned first, that is, the necessity of teaching, depends upon what we say. The other two depend upon the manner in which we say it. Therefore, a man who speaks with the intention of teaching should not think that he has said what he intended to the person he is trying to instruct so long as he is not understood. Although he has said what he himself understands, he thus is not to be regarded as having yet spoken to the man who has not understood him. However, if he has been understood, he has spoken, no matter how he expressed himself. But if he is also trying to please or persuade the person to whom he is speaking, he will not succeed by speaking in any way whatsoever, for the manner in which he speaks is important in order that he may produce this effect. Just as the listener must be pleased in order that he may be kept listening, so he must be persuaded in order that he may be influenced to act. And just as he is pleased if you speak attractively, so he is moved if he finds pleasure in what you promise, dreads what you threaten, hates what you condemn, embraces what you praise, grieves over what you emphasize as deplorable, rejoices when you say something he should rejoice at, pities those whom in your discourse you set before his eyes as objects of pity, avoids those whom you by awakening fear point out should be avoided. Whatever else can be accomplished through grand eloquence to influence the hearts of one's listeners, they must be persuaded not that they may know what should be done, but to do what they already know they should do. However, if they do not yet know this, they must certainly be taught before they are persuaded. And perhaps when they have learned these very things, they will be influenced to such an extent that there will be no necessity for persuading them by greater powers of eloquence. Yet when this is necessary, it should be done, and there is a necessity when, although persons know what should be done, they do not do it. 
Therefore, teaching is a necessity. Men can either do or refrain from doing what they know about. But who would say that they ought to do what they do not know about? Therefore, persuasion is not a necessity, because there is not always a need of it, provided that the listener agrees with the one who is teaching or even pleasing him. But to persuade is a triumph, because it is possible for a man to be taught and pleased and still not agree. Besides, what good are those first two if this third effect is wanting? Neither is there any necessity here for pleasing, since, when truths are pointed out in speaking, and this is the duty of teaching, this is not done by means of eloquence, nor is it intended that either the subject or the eloquence should give pleasure. The truths made clear give pleasure of themselves because they are true. Consequently, even falsehoods frequently give pleasure when they are detected and refuted. They are not pleasing because they are falsehoods, but, because it is a truth that they are falsehoods, the very mode of expression which demonstrates that this is true is pleasing. To the art of pleasing those whose pampered tastes truth does not satisfy, if it is presented in any way other than an agreeable one, no small place has been assigned in eloquence. Yet when this art has been added, it does not satisfy the obstinate, who have benefited neither from having understood nor from having been pleased by the teacher's style. What use are these two to a man who both acknowledges the truth and praises the eloquence, but does not yield his consent, although it is only for this consent that the speaker gives careful attention to the matters which he is discussing when he is urging something? If the things being taught are of such a nature that belief in them and knowledge of them is sufficient, yielding consent to them is nothing else than acknowledging that they are true. But when what is being taught must be carried out, and when the teaching occurs for that very reason, we are uselessly persuaded of the truth of what is said, and uselessly pleased by the very manner in which it is said, if we do not learn it in such a way that we practice it. Therefore, the Christian orator, when he is urging something that must be put into practice, must not only teach in order to instruct, and please in order to hold attention, but also persuade in order that he may be victorious. Indeed, it now remains for that man to be persuaded to consent through sublime eloquence, since this was not effected in him by a demonstration of truth that gained his own admission and was accompanied, moreover, by attractiveness of style. Men have devoted so much attention to this matter of attractiveness that numerous very wicked and shameful things, which we should not only not commit, but should even avoid and loathe, are now cloaked in a pleasant style. The eloquent works of wicked and dishonorable men are read not for instruction, but merely for pleasure. May God avert from his church what the prophet Jeremiah relates about the synagogue of the Jews when he says, Dread and horrible things have been done upon the land. The prophets prophesied wickedness, and the priests clapped their hands. And my people loved such things. And what will you do in the future? O oh, eloquence! so much the more terrifying because it is plain, and so much the more forceful because it is genuine. O oh, truly an axe that breaketh the rocks in pieces! God himself has said through this same prophet that his word, spoken through the holy prophets, is like this axe. Hence may it never happen that our priests applaud those who speak wickedness, or that the people of God love such things. May it never happen, I repeat, that such great madness be ours. What shall we do in the future? Let what we say be less intelligible, less pleasing, less persuasive, but still by all means let it be said, and let truths, not falsehoods, be listened to with pleasure. But this, of course, would be impossible unless they were expressed attractively. In the case of a strong people, such as God has spoken about, I will praise thee in a strong people. There is no pleasure in that attractiveness of style, which certainly does not teach falsehoods, but ornaments trifling and perishable truths with a frothy showiness of style such as would not be a fitting or dignified adornment for noble and enduring truths. There is something like this in a letter of the blessed Cyprian, which I believe either happened accidentally or was done designedly, that succeeding ages might perceive how the soundness of Christian teaching has restrained his style from that redundancy and restricted it to a more dignified and more moderate eloquence, such as in his later writings is safely admired and anxiously sought after, 
but imitated only with very great difficulty. He says, for example, in a certain place, Let us seek this abode. The neighboring solitudes offer a place of retirement where, while the wandering tendrils of the vines creep through the trellis supports with overhanging interlacings, the leafy covering has formed a colonnade of vines. This is expressed with a wonderful fluency and luxuriance of style, but, because of its immoderate profuseness, it is displeasing to the serious reader. Those who like this style think that those who do not use it, but express themselves with greater restraint, cannot speak in that style, not realizing that they avoid it deliberately. This holy man shows both that he can speak in that way, because he has done so here, and that he does not prefer to do so, since he never does so afterward. And so an orator, in speaking of justice, sanctity, and virtue, for he should not preach on other topics, tries as far as possible when he is speaking of these matters to make his words understandable, pleasing, and persuasive. And he should not doubt that he can do this, if it is possible and as far as it is possible, more through the piety of his prayers than through the power of his oratory. Thus, in praying for himself and for those whom he is about to address, he should be a suppliant before he is a speaker. As the hour when he is to speak is at hand, before he uses his tongue in preaching, he should raise his parched soul to God, that he may utter only that with which he has become imbued and manifest what has inspired him. For in regard to every subject to be discussed according to faith and love, although there are many things to be said and many ways in which they may be said by those who know about them, who knows what is either fitting for us to say or proper to be heard through us for the present, except him who sees the hearts of all? Who can make us say what we should and say it in the way we should, except him in whose hand are both we and our words? Therefore any one who is anxious to know and teach should indeed learn all the things that must be taught and acquire a skill in speaking becoming to an ecclesiastic. Yet at the time of his discourse, he should consider what the Lord says as more suitable for a well-disposed mind. Do not be anxious how or what you are to speak, for what you are to speak will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who are speaking, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks through you. Therefore, if the Holy Ghost speaks in those who are delivered to their persecutors for the sake of Christ, why will he not speak in those who are transmitting Christ to their disciples? Further, anyone who says that men do not have to be given rules about what or how they should teach, if it is the Holy Ghost that forms teachers, can maintain that we do not have to pray either because our Lord says, Your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Or he can maintain that the Apostle Paul should not have given rules to Timothy and Titus about the matter and manner of their instruction of others. A man who has been assigned the position of teacher in the church should keep before his eyes these three epistles of the Apostle. Do we not read in the first epistle to Timothy, Announce and teach these things? What these things are I explained above. Is not the following admonition also found there? Do not rebuke an elderly man, but exhort him as you would a father. In the second epistle did not the apostle say to Timothy, Hold to the form of sound teaching which thou hast heard from me. In the same place does he not also say, Use all care to present thyself to God as a man approved, a worker that cannot be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. There is also found this passage, Preach the word, be urgent in season, out of season. Reprove, entreat, rebuke with all patience and teaching. And likewise does he not say to Titus that a bishop ought to be holding fast in accordance with the teaching of the faithful word, that he may be powerful in sound doctrine and able to confute opponents. He also says in the same epistle, But do thou speak what befits the sound doctrine, that elderly men be reserved, and so on. There is also this passage, Thus speak, and exhort, and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise thee. Admonish them to be subject to princes and authorities, and so on. Consequently, what are we to think? Does the apostle contradict himself, declaring that teachers are formed by the operation of the Holy Ghost, 
while he himself gives them directions about what and how they are to teach? Or are we to understand that, although the Holy Ghost gives himself abundantly, the functions of men in instructing even the teachers themselves must not remain unused, and yet, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the growth. For this reason, although the preachers themselves are holy men, and although the holy angels themselves are active, no one correctly learns the things which concern our life with God unless God makes him docile to himself, to whom this passage in the Psalms is addressed. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God. And so the apostle, speaking as a teacher to a pupil, says the same thing to Timothy himself. But do thou continue in the things that thou hast learned and that have been entrusted to thee, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Bodily medicines which men apply to men are a help only to those for whom God ordains health, since he can cure even without them. Although they are powerless without him, still they are applied, and if this is done obligingly, it is numbered among the works of mercy or kindness. In the same way, the benefits of teaching applied by a human being are a help to the soul when this benefit is ordained by God who could have transmitted the gospel to man, even not from men nor by men. Part 7 Consequently, a man who is endeavoring through speech to convince of what is good rejects none of these three aims, namely to teach, to please, and to persuade, but should also pray and strive, as I said previously, that his words may be intelligible, pleasing, and persuasive. When he does this properly and suitably, he can justly be called eloquent, even though he does not obtain the agreement of his listener. To these three aims, that is, teaching, pleasing, and persuading, the author of Roman eloquence himself seems to have intended to relate the three styles, when he maintained in the same way, He will be eloquent, then, who can speak about trivial subjects in a subdued style, ordinary subjects in a moderate style, and noble subjects in a grand style. It is as if he were adding the three ends mentioned above, developing one and the same thought in this way. He will be eloquent, then, who, in order to teach, can speak about trivial subjects in a subdued style, in order to please, can discuss ordinary subjects in a moderate style, and in order to persuade, can treat of noble subjects in a grand style. That author could have exemplified in legal cases those three styles as they have been defined by him, but he could not have done so in ecclesiastical questions, which depend upon a mode of expression of the kind which I intend to describe. In legal questions, matters are considered trivial when the case involves financial matters. They are considered important when they concern human welfare or life. But where neither of these cases is involved, and he is not striving to have the hearer act or pronounce a decision, but merely to please him, the subject matter is midway between the two, as it were, and for this reason is called middling, that is, moderate. For modus, measure, gives us the word moderate, and we are not speaking correctly when we misuse moderate for small. However, in our questions, we should refer everything, especially what we say to the people from the pulpit, not to man's temporal, but to his eternal welfare. Since we must also warn there against eternal damnation, everything we say is important. So true is this, that whatever the Christian teacher says about financial matters, either in regard to gain or loss, or whether the amount be large or small, should not seem unimportant. For justice is not unimportant, and we should certainly protect it even in regard to small amounts of money, because the Lord says, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. Therefore, what is a very little thing is a little thing, but to be faithful in a very little thing is a great thing. Just as the nature of a circle namely that all lines drawn from a point in the center to the circumference are equal, is the same in a large disc as it is in a little coin. So, where unimportant matters are transacted with justice, the dignity of justice is not lessened. 
Finally, when the apostle was speaking about worldly trials, and what did these concern if not financial matters, he said, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, bring your case to be judged before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more worldly things! If, therefore, you have cases about worldly matters to be judged, appoint those who are rated as nothing in the church to judge. To shame you, I say it. Can it be that there is not one wise man among you competent to settle a case in his brother's matter? But brother goes to law with brother, and that before unbelievers. Nay, to begin with, it is altogether a defect in you that you have lawsuits one with another. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves do wrong and defraud, and that to your brethren. Or do you not know that the unjust will not possess the kingdom of God? Why is it that the apostle is so angry that he reproves, censures, rebukes, and threatens in this way? Why is it that he gives evidence of the state of his feelings by such numerous and harsh alterations of his voice? Why is it, finally, that he speaks in such a grand style about very unimportant matters? Did worldly affairs deserve so much attention from him? Far from it. He does this for the sake of justice and charity and godliness, which no reasonable mind doubts are noble subjects even in regard to the most trifling matters. Of course, if I were advising men how to plead worldly cases, either for themselves or for their friends, before ecclesiastical judges, I would properly urge them to plead them in a subdued manner, as if they were trifling matters. But since I am discussing the eloquence of the man whom we wish to be a teacher of those things which deliver us from eternal evils and lead us to eternal blessings, these matters are important wherever they are mentioned, whether in public or in private, to one person or to several, to friends or to enemies, in uninterrupted discourse or in familiar conversation, in treatises or in books, in long letters or in short. Unless, perhaps, since a cup of cold water is a very little and a very cheap thing, we are to regard as also very little and very cheap the Lord's promise that he who gives a cup of cold water to his disciple shall not lose his reward. Or perhaps when a teacher delivers a sermon in church upon this text, he should think that he is saying something unimportant and for that reason should not say it in the moderate or grand style, but in the subdued style. When we happened to speak about this subject in public, and God inspired us so that we did not speak inappropriately, did not a kind of flame blaze up, as if from that cold water, which kindled even the cold hearts of men to accomplish the works of mercy for the hope of a heavenly reward? Although our teacher should be one who speaks of noble subjects, he should not always express them in the grand style, but use the subdued style when he is teaching and the moderate style when he is condemning or praising. Yet when something should be done, and we are addressing those who should do it, but are unwilling, then unimportant things must be expressed in the grand style as the one suitable for the persuasion of their wills. Sometimes we handle the same important theme in a subdued manner when we are teaching, in a moderate manner when we are praising it, and in a grand manner when we are persuading a mind alienated from truth to be converted to it. For what is greater than God himself? Is that a reason why we should not learn about him? Or should one who is teaching the unity of the Trinity handle it only in the subdued style of speaking, in order that a subject so hard to distinguish may be understood as far as possible? Are ornaments of style to be sought here instead of proofs? Is the listener to be persuaded to do something, instead of being instructed that he may learn? Besides, when we are praising God either for himself or for his works, what beauty of noble and brilliant eloquence reveals itself to the man who can praise as far as is possible him whom no one praises fittingly, but whom everyone praises in some way? If he is not worshipped, or if idols, whether they are demons or any creature at all, are worshipped with him or even in preference to him, we certainly should proclaim in the grand style how great this evil is and how men should be turned away from it. To speak more definitely, there is an example of subdued style in the Apostle Paul when he says, 
Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, have you not heard the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a slave girl and the other by a free woman. And the son of the slave girl was born according to the flesh, but the son of the free woman in virtue of the promise. This is said by way of allegory. For these are the two covenants, one indeed from Mount Sinai, bringing forth children unto bondage, which is Hagar. For Sinai is a mountain in Arabia, which corresponds to the present Jerusalem, and is in slavery with her children. But that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother, and so on. And likewise where he reasons, saying, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Yet even a man's will, once it has been ratified, no one annuls or alters. The promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. He does not say, and to his offsprings, as of many, but as of one, and to thy offspring, who is Christ. Now I mean this. The law which was made four hundred and thirty years later does not annul the covenant which was ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the right to inherit be from the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Because it could occur to the mind of his listener to ask, Why then was the law given if there is no inheritance from it? He cast this up to himself and said as if he were inquiring, What then was the law? Then he answered, It was enacted on account of transgressions, being delivered by angels through a mediator, until the offspring should come to whom the promise was made. Now there is no intermediary where there is only one, but God is one. And here an objection occurred which he proposed to himself. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? And he answered, By no means. And giving his reason, said, For if a law had been given that could give life, justice would truly be from the law. But the scripture shut up all things under sin, that by the faith of Jesus Christ the promise might be given to those who believe, and so on. And similar examples could be cited. Therefore it is the business of teaching, not only to explain obscurities and settle the difficult points of questions, but also, while this is being done, to meet other questions which might possibly occur, so that they may not make void or disprove what we are saying. Care must be taken, however, that the answer to these difficulties occurs at the same time as the question, so that we may not stir up what we are unable to remove. Further, it happens that, when other questions arising from one question, and others again arising from these are investigated and answered, the effort of reasoning is drawn out to such a length that, unless the disputant has a very powerful and vigorous memory, he cannot return to the original question. However, it is very beneficial to refute whatever objection can be made if it occurs to the mind, so that it may not present itself at a place where there will not be anyone to answer it, or that it may not occur to someone who is indeed present, but who keeps silent about it and would go away uncorrected. However, In the words of the apostle which follow, the style is moderate. Do not rebuke an elderly man, but exhort him as you would a father, and young men as brothers, elderly women as mothers, younger women as sisters. As it is also in these words, I exhort you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, pleasing to God. Almost the entire passage in which this exhortation occurs employs the moderate style of eloquence. There is more beauty in those portions where, as if in payment of a just debt, things that belong together proceed fittingly from one another. For example, But we have gifts differing according to the grace that has been given us, such as prophecy to be used according to the proportion of faith, or ministry in ministering, or he who teaches in teaching or he who exhorts in exhorting, he who gives in simplicity, he who presides with carefulness, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without pretense. Hate what is evil, hold to what is good. Love one another with fraternal charity, anticipating one another with honor. Be not slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord.
rejoicing in hope. Be patient in tribulation, persevering in prayer. Share the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Be of one mind towards one another. And how beautifully all these outpourings are brought to a close in a period of two membra. Do not set your mind on high things, but condescend to the lowly. And a little further on he says, Persevering unto this very end, render to all men whatever is their due, tribute to whom tribute is due, taxes to whom taxes are due, fear to whom fear is due, honor to whom honor is due. After these have been poured forth as membra, they are also concluded in a period formed from two membra. Owe no man anything except to love one another. And a little later he says, The night is far advanced, the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk becomingly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in debauchery and wantonness, not in strife and jealousy. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and as for the flesh, take no thought for its lusts. But if someone were to express the last phrase this way, et carnis providentiam ne in concupiscentis feceritis, instead of et carnis providentiam ne feceritis in concupiscentis, unquestionably he would delight the ear with a more rhythmical ending, but the stricter translator has preferred to keep even the order of the words. How this would sound in the Greek language in which the apostle spoke, those whose skill in that language is adequate for such questions would know. However, it seems to me that what has been translated for us in the same word order does not run on melodiously even in that language. Indeed, we must admit that our writers lack this adornment of style which is produced by rhythmical endings. Whether this was done by the translators or whether, as I consider more likely, the authors themselves intentionally shunned such ostentation, I do not venture to assert, since I confess I do not know. However, I do know that if someone skilled in this rhythm should arrange the sentence endings of those writers according to the law of harmony, which is very easily accomplished by changing certain words which have the same meanings, or by changing the order of those he finds there, he would see that these divinely inspired men lacked none of those qualities which he learned to regard as important in the schools of the grammarians and rhetoricians. Furthermore, he will find many examples of great beauty of style, which are elegant in our language, to be sure, but are especially so in the original, although we discover none of these in the writings of which they are so proud. We must be careful, however, not to detract from the authority of inspired and serious thoughts while we are adding rhythm. Our prophets were so far from lacking that musical training in which this harmony of prose is learned in its entirety, that Jerome, a very learned man, mentions even the meters of some of them, at least in the Hebrew language. In order to preserve the integrity of this language in regard to words, he did not transfer these meters from the original language. I, however, to offer my own opinion, which is naturally better known to me than to others, and than the opinion of others is to me, while I do not neglect these rhythmical endings in my own speech within the limits of moderation, still I am more pleased that among our own writers I find them used very seldom. Now the grand style of eloquence differs from this moderate style, principally in the fact that it is not so much embellished with fine expressions as it is forceful because of the passionate feelings of the heart. It adopts nearly all those ornaments of style, but it does not search for them if it does not have them at hand. In fact, it is driven on by its own ardor, and, if it chances upon any beauty of style, carries it off and claims it, not through a concern for beauty, but because of the force of the subject matter. It is sufficient for the purpose that appropriate words conform to the ardent affection of the heart. They need not be chosen by carefulness of speech. For if a brave man, eagerly bent upon battle, is armed with a golden and jewel-studded sword, he certainly achieves whatever he does with these weapons, not because they are costly, but because they are weapons. Yet he is the same man and is very powerful, even when anger provides a weapon for him as he cast about for one. The apostle is endeavoring to persuade us, for the sake of the preaching of the gospel, 
to endure patiently all the misfortunes of this life with the consoling help to the gifts of God. It is a noble subject delivered in the grand style, and it does not lack the ornaments of eloquence. Behold, he says, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, giving no offense to anyone that our ministry may not be blamed. On the contrary, conducting ourselves in all circumstances as God's ministers, in much patience, in tribulations, in hardships, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleepless nights, in fastings, in innocence, in knowledge, in long-suffering, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in unaffected love, in the word of truth, in the power of God, with the armor of justice on the right hand and on the left, in honor and dishonor, in evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet truthful, as unknown and yet we are well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastised but not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet enriching many, as having nothing yet possessing all things. In the same way, he urges the Romans to overcome the persecutions of this world by charity with a sure hope in the help of God. He pleads in the grand style, and also with polish, as he says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together unto good, for those who, according to his purpose, have been called. For those whom he has foreknown, he has also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he should be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he has predestined, them he has also called. And those whom he has called, them he has also justified. And those whom he has justified, them he has also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who has not spared even his own Son, but has delivered him for us all, how can he fail to grant us also all things with him? Who shall make accusations against the elect of God? Is it God who justifies? Who shall condemn? Is it Christ Jesus who died? Yes, and rose again, he who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or hunger, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword? Even as it is written, For thy sake we are put to death all the day long. We are regarded as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things we overcome, because of him who has loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Although the whole epistle to the Galatians was written in the subdued style of eloquence, except in the concluding passages where the eloquence is moderate, he inserts one passage of such passionate feeling that, although it lacks any ornaments of style such as are found in those I have cited as examples, it could only be expressed in the grand style. He says, You are observing days and months and years and seasons. I fear for you, lest perhaps I have labored among you in vain. Become like me, because I also have become like you, brethren. I beseech you. You have done me no wrong. And you know that on account of a physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you formerly. And though I was a trial to you in my flesh, you did not reject or despise me. But you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where then is your self-congratulation? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your very eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy, because I tell you the truth? They court you from no good motive, but they would estrange you, that you may court them. But court the good from a good motive always, and not only when I am present with you, my dear children, with whom I am in labor again, until Christ is formed in you. But I wish I could be with you now, and change my tone, because I do not know what to make of you. In this passage, have antithetical words balanced each other? Have any words been joined to one another in a climax, or did Kaiser, Membra, or periods ring in our ears? 
Nevertheless, not on that account is there any diminution in the stirring emotion with which we feel it vibrate. Although these words of the Apostle are so intelligible, they are also profound. They are so written and commended to posterity that they demand not only a reader or a listener, but even an interpreter, if anyone not satisfied with the outer shell would search into their depths. Therefore, let us consider the styles of eloquence in those who, through their reading of the writers of Scripture, have made progress toward the knowledge of divine and salutary truths and have presented this knowledge to the Church. The Blessed Cyprian uses the subdued style of speaking in that book where he discusses the sacrament of the chalice. In fact, in that book he answers the question about whether the chalice of the Lord should contain water only or water mixed with wine. I should quote something from this work as an example. After the introduction of his letter, then, as he is beginning to answer the proposed question, he says, Now you know that we have been admonished to preserve the Lord's instruction in offering the chalice and do nothing different from what the Lord did first for us. Consequently, the chalice which is offered in commemoration of him is to be offered mixed with wine. For since Christ says, I am the true vine, the blood of Christ is certainly not water, but wine. And his blood, by which we have been redeemed and vivified, cannot be seen in the chalice, when the chalice is empty of the wine which signifies Christ's blood, which is foretold by the revelation and testimony of all the scriptures. We find in Genesis, in regard to this sacrament, that Noah has prefigured it and presented a type of the Lord's passion. He drank wine, became intoxicated, was uncovered in his tent, and lay naked with limbs exposed, and the nakedness of the father was pointed out by his second son, but covered by his eldest and youngest sons. It is not necessary to describe the other circumstances, since it is sufficient to understand this one fact, that Noah, signifying a type of the truth to come, drank not water, but wine, and thus represented an image of the Lord's passion. We see the sacrament of the Lord prefigured also in the priest Melchizedek, according to what the Holy Scripture testifies and declares, But Melchizedek the king of Salem brought forth bread and wine, for he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed Abraham. Furthermore, in the Psalms the Holy Ghost declares that Melchizedek signifies a type of Christ, when in the person of the Father speaking to the Son, he says, Before the day star I begot thee, Thou art a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. These words in the following ones of this letter preserve the subdued style of speaking, as it is easy for readers to discover. St. Ambrose, too, although he is discussing the noble subject of the Holy Ghost in order to prove that he is equal to the Father and the Son, uses the subdued style of speaking. The subject he has taken for discussion does not demand elegance of expression or a feeling of emotion to move hearts, but the evidences of truth. In the prologue of this work, then, he says, among other things, When Gideon was disturbed because of the divine announcement by which he had heard that, although thousands of people were wasting away, the Lord in the person of one man would free his people from their enemies, he offered the kid of goats, and according to the direction of the angel, placed its flesh and unleavened bread upon a rock and poured the broth over them. As soon as the angel of God touched them with the tip of the rod which he was carrying, fire arose from the rock and consumed the sacrifice which was being offered. It seems evident from this sign that the rock was a symbol of the body of Christ, because it is written, For they drank from the rock which followed them, but the rock was Christ. Certainly this referred not to his divinity, but to his flesh, which has flooded the hearts of his thirsty people with the everlasting stream of his blood. Therefore it was then made evident in a mystery that the Lord Jesus, crucified in his flesh, would efface the sins of the whole world, and not only the transgressions of their deeds, but also the lusts of their hearts. For the flesh of the kid refers to sinfulness of deed, the broth to the allurements of passions, as it is written, for the people strove for the worst lust and said, Who will feed us with flesh? Therefore this incident, where the angel extended his rod and touched the rock from which fire came forth, shows that the flesh of our Lord, animated by the Spirit of God, would consume all the sins of humanity. For this reason the Lord says, I have come to cast fire upon the earth. In the moderate style, there is the famous enconium of virginity from Cyprian. 
I am now speaking to virgins, whose loftier renown is likewise our greater concern. They are the flower of the fruit of the church, the beauty and adornment of spiritual grace, a joyful nature of praise and honor, a spotless and uncorrupted work, an image of God reflecting the sanctity of the Lord, the more illustrious part of the flock of Christ. The glorious fruitfulness of our mother the church takes pleasure in them and flourishes abundantly in them, and the more illustrious virginity increases her ranks, the more the joy of our mother increases. And in another place, at the end of the letter, he says, As we have borne the likeness of the earthy, let us bear also the likeness of the heavenly. This image virginity bears, and so do integrity, sanctity, and truth. Those mindful of the teaching of God bear it, so do those who hold to justice with conscientiousness, who are steadfast in faith, humble in fear, brave in enduring everything, meek in bearing injustices, willing to show mercy, of one mind and one heart in fraternal peace. Each of these things you should observe, love, and fulfill, O good virgins, who, free for God and Christ, lead the way by reason of your nobler and better lot to the Lord to whom you have vowed yourselves. You who are advanced in years, be instructors for the younger ones. You who are younger, be a help to the older ones and an incentive to your equals. Animate yourselves by mutual encouragement. Provoke one another to glory by emulous examples of virtue. Endure bravely, proceed spiritually, attain your object successfully. Only remember us, then, when your virginity begins to be honored. In a style moderate yet ornate, Ambrose also describes to virgins who have made religious profession, as if by way of example, what they are to copy in their conduct, when he says, She was a virgin not only in body, but also in mind, since she did not defile her pure heart by any contact with deceit. Humble of heart, dignified in language, discreet in mind, rather moderate in speaking and quite attentive to study. Placing her confidence not in the uncertainty of riches, but in the prayer of the poor man, attentive to her work, modest in speech, accustomed to seek as the judge of her conscience not man, but God, hurting no one, wishing well to all, yielding to her elders, not envious of her equals, avoiding boastfulness, following reason, loving virtue. When did she wound her parents even by a glance? When did she disagree with her relatives? When did she shrink from the humble? When did she laugh at the weak? When did she shun the needy? She was accustomed to visit only those gatherings of men at which mercy would not blush and which modesty would not disregard. There was no arrogance in her glance, no boldness in her words, no immodesty in her actions. Her bearing was not sensual, her gait was not too free, nor her voice querulous, so that her very physical appearance was an image of her mind and a portrayal of modesty. Certainly a good home should be recognized at its very entrance and assert at the first step within that there is no darkness hiding inside, as if the light of a lamp placed within were lighting up the exterior. Why, then, do I describe her temperance in regard to food, her excess in the matter of kindnesses, the one excessive beyond nature, the other almost neglecting nature itself? In the one there were no periods of intermission, in the other days were doubled in fasting and when the desire of refreshment had arisen, the food offered was often of a kind that would prevent death, not furnish pleasure. And so on. But I have presented these words as an example of the moderate style, not because he is encouraging those who had not yet vowed virginity to do so, but because he is discussing what sort of people those who have already consecrated themselves should be. For in order that the mind may undertake such an important resolution, it must certainly be roused and inflamed by the grand style of speaking. On the other hand, the martyr Cyprian wrote about the dress of virgins, not about embracing the life of virginity. However, that bishop arouses them even to this with noble eloquence. I shall now quote examples of the grand style from a subject which both of these men have discussed. Both have assailed those women who color, or rather discolor, their faces with paint. Cyprian, in treating of this subject, says, among other things, If some artist had depicted in a painting the features, form, and bodily appearance of a man in colors that rival nature's, and another, as if he were more skilled, were to apply his hand to the manifestly finished likeness to improve what has already been fashioned and painted, 
the affront to the first artist would be considered grave, and his indignation would be regarded as righteous. Do you think that you can manifest such shamelessly rash insolence and indignity to God the artist with impunity? Even if you may not be unchaste about men, or defiled by rouges intended to be alluring, yet by corrupting and profaning the things of God you are known as worse than an adulteress. The fact that you think that you are adorned and embellished thereby is an attack upon the work of God. It is a falsification of truth. The word of the apostle is a warning. Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new dough, as you really are, without leaven. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Therefore let us keep festival, not with the old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Do sincerity and truth survive when the things that are sincere are contaminated, and those that are true are changed into falsehood by the adulterations of coloring, and the artifices of cosmetics. Your Lord says, Thou canst not make one hair white or black, and you are trying to be stronger so that you may refute the word of your Lord. With brazen effort and sacrilegious contempt you dye hair. With an ominous foreboding of the future, you already begin to have hair of the color of flames. All that follows would be too long to include. Ambrose, on the other hand, in speaking against such women, said, Temptations to sin proceed from this that, inasmuch as they dread being unattractive to men, they paint their faces with affected coloring, and from defilement of their faces they reflect upon defilement of their chastity. What great foolishness this is, to change the likeness of nature and search for a picture of it, and, in dreading their husband's disapproval, to reveal their own. The woman who is anxious to alter what has been designed by nature is the first to pronounce sentence on herself. So while she is striving to please another, she is first unattractive to herself. What more equitable judge of your ugliness do we need, woman, than you yourself, since you are afraid to be seen? If you are beautiful, why do you conceal yourself? If you are ugly, why do you pretend that you are beautiful, since you will not possess the esteem of your own conscience nor the recompense of deluding a stranger? If he loves another woman, you wish to be attractive to another man. And you are angry if he loves another woman, but he is taught to commit adultery through you. You are the evil teacher of your own wrong. Even one who has suffered from the pander's art shrinks from playing the part of a pander, and, although she is an abandoned woman, still she sins not against another, but against herself. Crimes of adultery are almost more endurable. For there chastity is defiled. Here nature is violated. It is sufficiently clear, I think, that women are earnestly urged by this eloquence not to defile their faces with cosmetics, but to practice modesty and fear. Thus we notice that the style of speaking is neither subdued nor moderate, but certainly grand. And in these two, whom of all writers I chose to quote, and in other ecclesiastical writers who speak the truth and speak it well, that is, intelligently, artistically, and passionately as the subject requires, these three styles can be discovered throughout their numerous writings and discourses. By constant reading and listening, combined with practice, they will become fixed in the mind of students. No one should think that it is contrary to our teaching to blend these styles. On the contrary, delivery should certainly be varied with every kind of style insofar as this can be accomplished gracefully. When a speech is long drawn out in one style, it does not hold the listener. When a change is made from one style to another, the speech proceeds more effectively, even though it continues longer. Yet in the speech of eloquent men, each style has its own diversities, which do not permit the feelings of the listeners to grow cool or decrease in ardor. However, the unrelieved subdued style can be more easily tolerated for a longer time than the unvaried grand style. Indeed, the more agitation of soul that must be incited to cause our listener to agree with us, the less time he can be maintained in that emotion when it has been sufficiently aroused. For this reason, we must be careful, while we are trying to arouse to a higher pitch what is already high, that it does not fall from the emotional height to which it had been carried. But after inserting subjects which we must deliver in the more subdued style, we return effectively to those which must be delivered in the grand style, so that the vehemence of our speech ebbs and flows like the waves of the sea. Consequently, 
If the grand style of eloquence must be maintained for a rather long time, it should be varied by introducing the other styles. Yet the composition as a whole is assigned to that division of style which predominates. Now, it is important what style is to be joined with another style or should be employed in certain essential places. For even in the grand style, it is proper that the introduction always, or almost always, be moderate. It is in the power of the speaker to use the subdued style even for some things which could be delivered in the grand style, so that the thoughts which are expressed in the grand style may become more majestic through a comparison with the others, and may be made, as it were, to appear more brilliant because of their shadows. But in whatever style any naughty questions must be answered, there is a need for keenness of intellect which the subdued style especially appropriates for itself. Therefore, this style must be employed even in the other two styles, when such questions occur in them. Similarly, we must employ and insert the moderate style, no matter with what other style it occurs, to praise or condemn anything where there is no question of anyone's condemnation or acquittal, or his agreement to any course of action. So, in the grand style and also in the subdued, the other two find their proper places. However, the moderate style, not always to be sure, but sometimes, needs the subdued style, if, as I said, a naughty question occurs which must be solved, or when things that could be adorned are left unadorned and are expressed in the subdued style, that they may grant a more prominent place to certain extravagances, as it were, of ornament. The moderate style does not require the grand style. It is employed to please minds, not to persuade them. However, if a speaker is applauded repeatedly and eagerly, we should not for that reason believe that he is speaking in the grand style. It is the keenness of intellect in the subdued style and the ornaments of the moderate style which also have this effect. The grand style usually restrains voices by its own weight, yet it elicits tears. Indeed, at Caesarea and Mauritania, when I was dissuading the people from civil war, or worse than civil war, which they called cadaver, for not only fellow citizens, but even relatives, brothers, yes, parents and children, divided into two factions, and, according to custom, fought one another with stones for several successive days at a certain time of the year, and each one killed whomever he could. I pleaded in the grand style, as powerfully as I could, that I might extirpate and banish by my speech such a barbarous and deep-rooted evil from their hearts and customs. However, it was not when I heard them applauding, but when I saw them weeping that I realized I had accomplished anything. By their applause they signified that they were instructed and pleased, but by their tears they showed they were persuaded. When I saw these, I believed, before they demonstrated it by fact, that the frightful custom handed down from their fathers and grandfathers and from their far-off ancestors, which was besieging their hearts like an enemy, or rather was in possession of them, had been completely conquered. As soon as my speech was finished, I directed their hearts and lips to thank God. And behold, for nearly eight years or more, by the grace of Christ, nothing like that has been attempted there. There are numerous other experiences also from which I have learned the effects that the grand style of a wise speaker can produce in men. It is not their acclamation, but rather their groans, and sometimes even their tears, and ultimately, a transformation of life. Many have been transformed even by the subdued style of eloquence, but with the result that they learned what they did not know or believed what formerly seemed incredible to them, not with the result that they did what they knew should be done but were unwilling to do, for the grand style must be employed to prevail upon insensibility of this kind. When praises and reproaches are delivered eloquently, even though they are in the moderate style, they have such an effect on some people that they are not only charmed by the eloquence of the eulogies and denunciations, but they themselves also strive to live in a praiseworthy manner and avoid living in a manner deserving of blame. But is it true that all who are charmed are transformed, just as all who are persuaded in the grand style act accordingly, and as all who are instructed in the subdued style learn or believe what they do not know is true? Consequently, we conclude that the purpose which those two styles endeavor to accomplish is one that is particularly indispensable for those who are trying to speak wisely and eloquently. The object of the moderate style, however, is to give pleasure by its very eloquence. It must not be exercised for its own sake, but in order that, because of the pleasantness of the style, agreement may be given a little more readily or may adhere more persistently to the matters which are being beneficially and nobly discussed.
This is presuming, of course, that instructive or persuasive eloquence is not needed because the listeners are both informed and sympathetic. Since it is the universal responsibility of eloquence in any of the three styles to speak properly in order to persuade, and since the end at which you are aiming is to persuade by your eloquence, the eloquent man certainly speaks properly to persuade in any of these three styles. But unless he persuades, he does not reach the goal of his eloquence. Now in the subdued style, he persuades us that what he says is true. In the grand style, he persuades us to do what we know should be done but are not doing. In the moderate style, he persuades us that he is speaking beautifully and elegantly. What use have we for this end? Let those seek this end who are honored for their eloquence and who make a display in eulogies and utterances of such a nature that the listener does not have to be instructed or persuaded to do something, but needs only to be charmed. Let us refer this end to another purpose, that we strive for the same result that we wish to effect when we speak in the grand style, that is, that good morals may be loved or evil ones avoided. If men are not so hostile to this action that they appear to need urging to it by the grand style of speaking, or if they are already practicing it, our purpose is that they may do so more zealously and persevere in it steadfastly. So it happens that we use even the adornment of the moderate style, not ostentatiously, but discreetly, not satisfied with merely pleasing the listener, but laboring rather for this end, that by reason of his being pleased, he may be helped even to the good of which we are anxious to persuade him. Consequently, those three ends for which, as I explained previously, a man who is anxious to speak wisely and also eloquently should strive, namely that he may be listened to with understanding, pleasure, and persuasion, here may have need for further clarification. They are not to be understood as if each is to be attributed to one of the three styles of eloquence in such a way that being understood pertains to the subdued style, giving pleasure to the moderate style, and being heard with persuasion to the grand style. Rather, they are to be applied in such a way that the speaker always keeps in mind and uses these three as much as possible, even when he is concerned with each one of them separately. We do not wish even what we say in the subdued style to be boring, and therefore we are anxious not only to be listened to with understanding, but also with pleasure. Besides, why do we urge what we are teaching by means of divinely inspired proofs, except that we may be listened to with compliance, that is, that our hearers may believe, with the assistance of him to whom it was said, Thy testimonies are become exceedingly credible. If someone narrates a story to those who are learning, even in the subdued style, what does he desire except to be believed? And who would care to listen to him unless he could hold his listener with some attractiveness of style? Who is unaware of the fact that he cannot be heard with pleasure or persuasion if he is not understood? The subdued style has its own proper functions. It answers very difficult questions and proves them with an unexpected explanation. It elicits and displays very acute opinions from sources from which nothing was expected. It clearly proves the error of its opponent and teaches that what seems to be irrefutable is false, especially when it is attended by a certain unsought but somehow natural beauty, and by unostentatious but almost essential rhythmical sentence endings drawn from the subject itself. Yet very often it occasions such thunderous applause that it is recognized with difficulty as the subdued style. It advances unadorned and unarmed, and enters the contest, as it were, stripped bare, and yet that fact does not prevent it from shattering its opponent by its vigor and strength, and with its very strong arms from breaking down and destroying the falsehood that resists it. Why are those who speak in this way applauded repeatedly and enthusiastically, except that when truth has been proved, defended, and invincibly maintained in such a manner, it affords pleasure? Therefore, in this subdued style, our teacher and speaker should strive to make his words not only understandable, but also pleasing and persuasive. Eloquence of the moderate style, too, in the case of the ecclesiastical orator, is not left unornamented, nor is adorned unbecomingly. Neither does it seek only to please, which is the only thing it professes to do in the case of other orators. Rather, in the subjects which it praises or condemns, it naturally desires to be heard with a persuasion that will lead its hearers to seek or more firmly hold to the objects of its praise and avoid or reject the objects of its condemnation. However, if it is not heard with understanding, it cannot be pleasing. 
Accordingly, even in this style where attractiveness holds preeminence, we must strive for these three ends, namely, that those who are listening may understand, be pleased, and be persuaded. Now when it is necessary to influence and persuade the listener by means of the grand style, this is necessary when he acknowledges the truth and attractiveness of what has been said, but is still unwilling to act upon it. Without doubt, you must speak in this grand style. Yet who is persuaded if he is unaware of what is being said, or who is prevailed upon to listen if he is not pleased? Therefore, even in this style, when a stubborn heart is to be persuaded to obedience by the grand style of eloquence, unless the speaker is listened to with understanding and pleasure, his words cannot be persuasive. However, in causing his words to be persuasive, the life of a speaker has greater influence than any sublimity of eloquence, no matter how great it may be. A man who speaks wisely and eloquently, but leads a wicked life, does indeed teach many who are desirous of learning, yet as it is written, he is unprofitable to his own soul. Hence the apostle also says, Whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is being proclaimed. However, Christ is truth, and truth can still be preached even though not with truth, that is, that what is virtuous and true may be preached from a vicious and deceitful heart. So Jesus Christ is truly preached by those who seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. However, good Christians do not obey any man at all, but the Lord himself, who said, The things they command do, but do not do the things they do, for they talk, but do nothing. For that reason, even those who do not lead useful lives are heard with profit. They are diligent about seeking their own ends, but naturally they do not dare to teach their own doctrines from the pulpit of ecclesiastical authority, which sound teaching has established. For this reason the Lord himself, before he said what I have related about such men, declared, They have sat on the chair of Moses. That chair, then, which was not theirs but Moses's, compelled them to speak what was good, even though they were not doing good. They accomplished their own purposes in their own lives, but the chair which belonged to another did not permit them to teach their own doctrines. And so they benefit many by preaching what they do not practice but they would benefit far greater numbers by practicing what they preach. For there are many who seek a defense of their own evil lives in their directors and teachers, replying in their hearts, or even with their lips, if they give vent to this extent, and saying, Why do you not practice yourself what you are preaching to me? The result is that they do not listen with submission to a man who does not listen to himself. They despise the word of God which is being preached to them and at the same time they despise the preacher himself. In fact, when the apostle writing to Timothy had said, Let no man despise thy youth, and added how he was to avoid being despised, he said, But be thou an example to the faithful in speech, in conduct, in charity, in faith, in chastity. A teacher like this, in order to make his words persuasive, expresses himself without shame, not only in the subdued and moderate style, but even in the grand style, because he lives uprightly. He chooses a good life in such a way that he does not disregard a good reputation, but as far as possible takes forethought for what is honorable in the sight of God and men, by fearing God and taking care of men. Even in his very speech he should choose to please by his subjects rather than by his words, and not believe that a thing is better expressed unless it is expressed more truthfully. The teacher should not be a slave to words, but the words should be subject to the teacher. This is what the apostle says, Not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made void. What he says to Timothy has this meaning too. Do not dispute with words, for that is useless, leading to the ruin of the listeners. This was not said so that we would not say anything in defense of truth when our enemies are attacking it, where shall we place what he said when he was explaining, among other things, what kind of a man a bishop should be? That he may be able in sound doctrine also to confute opponents. Disputing with words is not being solicitous how error may be overcome by truth, but how your eloquence may be preferred to another's. A man who does not dispute with words, whether he speaks in the subdued, the moderate, or the grand style, strives by means of his words to make truth clear, pleasing, and persuasive. Even charity itself, 
which is the end and fulfillment of the law, cannot be right in any way if the things which are loved are not true but false. Moreover, just as one whose body is handsome but whose mind is deranged is more to be pitied than if his body also were misshapen, so those who say eloquently things that are false are more to be pitied than if they said such things inelegantly. Therefore, in what does speaking, not only eloquently but also wisely, consist, except in employing adequate words in the subdued style, brilliant ones in the moderate style, and forceful ones in the grand style, yet always on a subject which deserves to be heard. Whoever cannot do both should speak wisely what he does not say eloquently, rather than speak eloquently what he says foolishly. However, if he cannot even do this, let him live in such a way that he will not only prepare a reward for himself, but will also furnish an example to others, and let his beauty of life be, as it were, a powerful sermon. Of course there are some who can preach well, but they are unable to think of anything to preach. If they take what has been written eloquently and wisely by others, memorize it, and deliver it to the people, they are not acting dishonestly as long as they cling to their part. In this way, and it is certainly beneficial, there arise many preachers of the truth, but not many teachers, provided that they all speak the same words of the one true teacher, and there are no dissensions among them. They are not to be frightened by that utterance of the prophet Jeremiah, through whom God reproves those who steal his words, every one from his neighbor. Those who steal take what belongs to another. The word of God is not another's for those who obey it. On the contrary, he delivers another's words who, although he speaks well, lives badly. For whatever he says that is good seems to be devised by his own genius, but it is really foreign to his character. And so God said that those men are stealing his words who are anxious to appear good by speaking the words of God, although they are wicked in putting their own doctrines into practice. And, in fact, if you consider the matter carefully, they themselves are not saying the good words which they proclaim. For how can they proclaim by their words what they reject by their deeds? Indeed, it is no idle remark that the apostle has made about such persons. They profess to know God, but by their works they disown him. In a certain way they are speaking, but again in another way they are not speaking, since each of the two statements is true because truth has uttered it. In speaking about such men, he said, The things they command do, but do not do the things they do. That is, do whatever you hear from their lips, do not do what you see in their actions. For they talk, he said, but do nothing. Therefore, although they do nothing, they still talk. In another place, reproving such men, he said, You hypocrites, how can you speak good things when you are evil? Accordingly, even what they say, when they speak good things, they do not say of themselves, because they are certainly rejecting and desire indeed what they are saying. Consequently, it can happen that an eloquent but evil man may himself write a sermon through which truth is to be preached by another man who is good but not eloquent. When this happens, the wicked man surrenders from himself what belongs to another, while the good man receives from another what is his own. On the other hand, when good Christians bestow this service upon good Christians, both say what is their own, because God is theirs and his are the words they speak. They make their own even those things which they could not compose themselves when they live properly in accordance with those words. Whether he is just about to speak before the people or before some smaller group, or whether he is going to compose something to be spoken before the people or read by those who are willing and able to do so, he should pray that God will put a good sermon into his mouth. For if Queen Esther, who was about to speak before the king in behalf of the temporal well-being of her nation, prayed that God would put a well-ordered speech in her mouth, how much more should he pray to obtain such a gift who is laboring in the word and in teaching for the eternal well-being of men? Those who are going to preach what they have obtained from others, even before they receive it, should pray for those from whom they are obtaining it, that they may be granted what they wish to receive themselves. And when they have received it, 
they should pray that they may preach it profitably, and that those to whom they preach may accept it. They should give thanks for a favorable outcome of their speech to him from whom they are aware they have received it, that he who takes pride may take pride in him in whose hand are both we and our words. This book has turned out to be longer than I desired and intended, but it is not tedious for a reader or listener who finds it agreeable. However, anyone who finds it tedious, but wishes to learn about it, should read it in parts. On the contrary, a person who is reluctant to learn about it should not complain about its length. However, I thank God that, with whatever small ability I possess, I have discussed in these four books not the kind of man I am, because I have many failings, but the kind of man he should be who strives to labor in sound teaching. That is, in Christian teaching. Not only for himself, but also for others. This has been De Doctrina Christiana by St. Augustine of Hippo, translated by John J. Gavigan, OSA, narrated by James T. Majewski, copyright 1947 by the Catholic University of America Press, production copyright 2021 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is brought to you by catholicculture.org and made possible by listener support. To donate, please visit catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. That's catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio.